prior to the International Conference on Regional Climate Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment 2023. We will now begin the inaugural ceremony for the IITM hub of the ICRC Codex 2023. I request the dignitaries who have arrived today for the today's program to please take their seat on the dais. The chief guest of the today's program, Dr. M. Ravi Chandran, Honorable Secretary, Ministry of Earth Science, Government of India, is available with us on the virtual dais. I welcome Dr. M. Mohapatra, Director General of Meteorology, India Meteorological Department, who is also available on the virtual dais with us today. It is my pleasure to invite the guest of honor of the program, Dr. Kamal Jeet Ray, Advisor, Ministry of Earth Science. Ma'am, please, you're welcome on the stage. Now I invite Dr. R. Krishnan, Director, Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology, Pune, on the stage. I also welcome Dr. J. Sanjay, Project Director, Center for Climate Change Research, IITM, and Coordinator of this conference on the stage. We welcome the dignitaries by presenting a sapling. I request Dr. Krishnan, Director IITM, to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Kamal Ji Tre. I invite Dr. Milan Majumdar, Senior Scientist and Co-Chair of the Local Organizing Committee of ICRC Codex to welcome Dr. Krishnan. I invite Dr. Bhupendra Singh, Senior Scientist and Convener of the Local Organizing Committee, ICRC Codex 2023 to welcome Dr. Sanjay. Light symbolizes knowledge and knowledge eliminates the darkness of ignorance. As per our tradition, we will light the lamp to go before the most incredible knowledge uh, power known to us, that is knowledge. I invite the distinguished guest on the stage to please light the lamp. Thank you, ma'am and sir. We begin all our endeavors by seeking the blessings of God. So, as for this conference, Mr. Krishna Suradkar will present a Saraswati Vandana in his melodious voice. Hello. Ah, 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 
हे शार दे मा हे शार दे मा हे शार दे मा हे शार दे मा अज्ञानता से हमें तार दे मा तू स्वर की देवी ये संगीत तुझसे तू स्वर की देवी ये संगीत तुझसे हर शब्द तेरा है हर गीत तुझसे हर शब्द तेरा है हर गीत तुझसे हम है अकेले हम है अधूरे हम है अकेले हम है अधूरे तेरी शरण हमें हमें प्यार दे मा हे शार दे मा हे शार दे मा अज्ञानता से हमें तार दे मा मुनियों ने समझी गुनियों ने जानी मुनियों ने समझी गुनियों ने जानी वेदों की भाषा कुरानों की बानी वेदों की भाषा पुरानों की बानी हम भी तो समझे हम भी तो जाने हम भी तो समझे हम भी तो जाने विद्या का हमको अधिकार दे मा हे शार दे मा हे शार दे मा अज्ञानता से हमें तार दे मा तू श्वेत वर्णी कमल पे विराजे तू श्वेत वर्णी कमल पे विराजे हाथों में वीना मुकुट सर पे साजे हाथों में वीना मुकुट सर पे साजे मन से हमारे मिटा दे अंधेरे मन से हमारे मिटा दे अंधेरे हमको उजालो का संसार दे मा हे शार 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 दे मा अज्ञानता से हमें तार दे मा Thank you, Krishna, for the pleasant start of the morning. I now request Dr. R. Krishnan to please welcome the gathering. Good morning, Namaskar, dear esteemed dignitaries of the ICRC International uh, Conference on Regional Climate, CODEX 2023 inaugural function. Our today's chief guest, uh, Dr. M. Ravichandran, Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, who has sent his video recorded messages. Message. Our guests of honor, Dr. Murtunjay Mahapatra, DGM. IMD who will be joining online and uh, Dr. Kamal Jitre, advisor MOES, also our guest of honor and uh, all the uh, senior uh, dignitaries, uh, Professor A.K. Kamra, Dr. Dr. Mandira Sreshta, Dr. Rupa Kumar Poli, Dr. Hosalika, Dr. Uh, Rajagopal, Dr. Sahai, Dr. Somnath Dattaji, Dr. Patla and colleagues from Japan, Daira Koko, Koji and all the eminent participants, Dr. 
prakash tiwari and uh, and dr sanjay uh, head center for climate change uh, research the galaxy of distinguished delegates and participants friends and colleagues i extend a very warm welcome to all of you to the international conference on regional climate icrc cardex 2023 which is being held at a, in our beautiful campus iitm pune during 25 to 29 september 2023 uh, this conference is jointly organized by iitm the ministry of earth sciences new delhi the abdul salam international center for theoretical physics ictp in trieste italy uh, the international project office for cardex ipoc and the swedish meteorological and hydrological institute smhi and the world climate research program wcrp this conference is conducted in hybrid format with joint sessions at two physical hubs the main venue at ictp trieste and the south asia regional hub which is being hosted by the center for climate change research at iitm pune the joint sessions at the two physical hubs in hybrid format Uh, is indeed a great platform for interaction of a large number of participants between the two hubs the uh, the cardex the, uh, the coordinated regional downscaling experiment or cardex is a key scientific pillar of a new core project of the wcrp called rifs regional information for society the vision of cardex is to advance and coordinate the science and application of regional climate downscaling through global partnership thus cardex icrc cardex is a very important international conference for not only improving the scientific understanding of the regional climate change uh, issues but also transforming this knowledge to develop reliable regional climate information to respond to societal and policy needs i am delighted to know that there are more than 110 participants Uh, with nearly 70 in person participants and young scholars attending the iitm hub and uh, in both the hubs i think the number is more than it's close to 400 with several experts from abroad from india and abroad who are giving keynote and invited talks in icrc 2023 some of you have tra- traveled from far off places to iitm pune i express my sincere thanks to all of you for coming to uh, our institute and for participating in this very important conference it's my great pleasure to wholeheartedly thank dr sanjay and several of my colleagues at cccr and iitm for meticulously planning this uh, program and uh, and for all the preparations and the great efforts in organizing this international conference i also express my sincere thanks to the ministry of earth sciences especially dr kamal jitre who is also our chief guest and dr shika john who is here for extending their valuable support to this event i wish you all very productive deliberations during the conference and a comfortable stay in pune please feel free to contact the con- conference organizers at iitm in case any assistance or help is needed once again i welcome you all to icrc cardex 2023 at iitm pune thank you jai hind thank you dr krishnan for your warm address we are delighted to have as the chief guest today honorable secretary ministry of earth sciences dr m ravi chandran Dr Ravi Chandran held several prominent responsibilities including the director of NCPUR Goa where he played an instrumental role in the execution and implementation of polar science activities in India and led geoscientific exploration of non living resources and surveys he has coordinated several India's scientific missions to Antarctica and the Arctic as the deputy project director of the indian argo project at encois hyderabad he formulated and executed the project and implemented the ocean data assimilation and modeling for operational ocean services 
He is also associated with several esteemed international scientific committees and bodies in various capacities, such as the Scientific Committee on Antarctic Research of the International Science Council, the International Arctic Science Committee, the Council of Managers of National Antarctic Program, etc. An avid researcher himself, he continues to motivate the climate com science community. Indeed, a well-recognized figure in this fraternity, let's listen to the address by Dr. Ravi Chandran. Greetings from the Ministry of Earth Sciences. I am Ravi Chandran from the Ministry of Earth Sciences. I would like to warmly welcome all delegates and participants of the International Conference on Regional Climate, ICRC Codex 2023. As you are aware, the frequency of extreme weather events, such as intense precipitation, droughts, cyclones, and heat waves, both on the land and the ocean, is increasing worldwide including in the Indian subcontinent. However, our understanding of the regional climate is still limited. There is a growing demand for reliable and scientifically rigorous regional climate information that can be effectively communicated to end users. The Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiment, CODAX, an initiative under the World Climate Research Program, WCRP of WMO, aims to address this challenge. I am pleased to learn that this conference is organized by, jointly by IITM of the Ministry of Earth Sciences, the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, SMHI, and the World Climate Research Program of WMO. During this conference, participants will discuss specific regional challenges posed by climate change and explore potential solutions. I have learned that the conference sessions will cover a wide range of topics related to scientific aspects of the climate change information, as well as its impact on society and policy making. This platform will foster knowledge sharing among researchers while discussing challenges and innovative approaches in regional climate studies within CODEX framework. We are proud that Center for Climate Change research at IITM hosts such as a regional hub for this international event. Participation from various regions worldwide will join remotely from ICTP's main venue with the significant participation from young researchers. I hope that this conference will produce valuable outcome guiding future steps in advancing regional climate downscaling work while ensuring effective interaction between WCRP Codex and its users or stakeholders. ICRC Codex plays a crucial role in enhancing our understanding of the region-specific climate changes associated with the global warming. It informs adaptation strategies at local and regional scale, bridges the gap between the science and policymaking, improves climate models tailored for specific region globally promotes interdisciplinary collaboration among scientists and facilitates data sharing initiative to effectively respond to the challenges posed by the global warming. Moreover, this conference will shape future research directions, improve modeling capabilities, and support evidence-based decision-making processes concerning climate change impact at local or regional levels. I extend my best wishes for a successful ICS Codex 23 2023 conference. Jai Hind. We thank Dr. Ravi for extending his cordial warm wishes to the conference. We are honored to have Dr. Mnitinjay Mahapatra, the Director General of Metrology, India Metrological Department, Government of India, online with us today. An eminent mon monsoon, cyclone, and urban metrology scientist, Dr. Mahapatra is popularly known as the Cyclone Man of India for having accurately predicted the path of ferocious cyclone storms many times. He has made significant contributions to, the imp to improving the early warning services of IMD. 
His research is mainly based on weather forecasting and cyclone warnings, including cyclonic disturbance, monsoonal low pressure systems, heavy rainfall, thunderstorms, and forecast verification. He has brought laurels to the country from international agencies for adequate cyclone warning. He has received several awards and recognition from different agencies, including an honorary doctor of science from FM University and Kalinga Institute of Technology, a fellow of the Indian Meteorological Society, a fellow of the Indian Climate Congress, and many more. He has received global and national appreciation from government and non-government agencies, including WMO, NDRF, IAF, and state governments for successfully predicting the cyclone. He has served as a chairperson and expert member of several national and international committees and is a permanent representative of India with WMO and a member of Executive Council of WMO. Sir, thank you for honoring our request to grace this occasion. Let's listen from Dr. Mahapatra. Good morning to all of you. At the outset, I congratulate Dr. Krishnan, Director of Meteorology, and all colleagues of IITM, Minister of Arts Sciences, for organizing this international conference. I also extend a warm welcome to all the participants for this conference. It is really happening to know the progress on the science of climate change with respect Look the studies to find out the impact in terms of the frequency and intensity and extreme weather events. Considering the impact in recent years, the World Meteorological Organization has brought out a study that during past 50 years, the number of extreme weather events has increased five times. But however, the number of deaths So there's a lot of response in the So therefore, I will not speak much to say that there has been a significant improvement in the system for weather and climate globally. Yeah. Considering India as a whole, there is significant improvement with respect to the detection, monitoring, early warning, and also the liaison with the disaster managers. As a result, <clears throat> I don't know. Am I clear now? 
there are certain problems in like crafts so i will urge upon this international conference to discuss about the various aspects of the climate change at the regional level and their impacts especially if i just look at the various types of studies carried out there are a lot of studies with respect to detection of the climate change and also its impact but if you look at the attribution studies the studies are limited so we may think about how to announce how to enhance the number of studies regionally through collaborations and cooperations to understand the causes of the climate change and its impact at a granular manner we are happy that minister parsenses through active leadership of the kishan saab have come up with our system modeling and output this modeling is provided to various interest organizations including wmo and ipcc in future also we will enhance our activity with respect to our system try to understand the various attributions and the causes for this climate change on the other hand there are many studies needed with respect to evaluating the projections minimizing the uncertainty bringing out the consensus among the various types of our system modeling and hence the regional climate modeling the codex data made available through iatm will go a long way to improve the r and d in this field i hope the young minds joining this conference will gain knowledge and improve the understanding of the climate change its impact and also improve the modeling aspects there is also need for enhancement of the role of science and technology with respect to other two aspects of the climate change that is adaptations and mitigations we can do a lot as a scientific community to handhold the disaster managers the practitioners the people by providing the knowledge base required for the adaptations and mitigations with this i wish all the best for this conference so thank you very much wish you all the best thank you sir for your encouraging words joining dr mahapatra we are honored to have dr kamal ji tre as our guest of honor today dr ray currently serving as scientist g and advisor at ministry of earth sciences is a program head for scheme of the india meteorological department under the umbrella scheme atmosphere climate research modeling observation observing system and services dr ray obtained her phd from the indian agriculture research institute new delhi in agriculture physics she has more than 30 years of experience in operational weather forecasting and extreme weather events her area of specialization include extreme weather events including heavy rains tropical cyclones heat waves and thunderstorms and atmospheric science agro advisory services she has led to the operationalization of nauka service of imd through its network of doppler weather radar a brilliant scholar she has also been the director of meteorological center ahmedabad madam it is an honor to have you here today and thank you for gracing this occasion let's welcome dr ray for her talk good morning to all i thank dr krishnan for inviting me to be a part of this uh, codex program although i am no longer an active researcher but coordinating the programs of scientific community for better outcomes keeps me in the loop so ministry of earth sciences through its institutes like iitm ncmwf and imd are playing their role to promote the codex vision to advance and coordinate the science and application of regional climate downscaling through global partnerships and this international conference will bring together the international regional climate research community focusing on high resolution climate information and its applications to vulnerability impacts and adaptation the global climate models to provide us uh, with projections of how the climate of earth may change in the future however the impacts of the changing climate and the adaptation strategies required to deal with them will occur on more regional and national scales 
If you look at the past data of extreme events like heat waves, floods, lightning, etc., in India, there is a significant increase in these events in the past three, four decades. For example, the floods of Uttarakhand, floods in Jammu in 2014, heat waves in Andhra and Telangana in 2015, cold wave in Bihar and Jharkhand in 2011. This is with respect to the mortalities associated with these extreme weather events. These, these are some of the events which have been happening every year and causing a lot of deaths. All these and many more are the sub-regional events. Stakeholders like disaster managers need climate information that helps them quantify risk associated with a changing climate. So understanding how extremes change with climate change needs to be prioritized. It is important to understand how climate knowledge, data and information can best be used to quantify risk and how this knowledge and information can be integrated into risk assessment frameworks. RCDs has, have an important role to play by providing projections with much greater detail and more accurate representation of the localized extreme events and the localized area. I'm really happy to see a session on linkages with the society. And I think Codex needs to play that role. It is required that this community takes into account the local topography and other factors which define the vulnerability of a particular region to a certain extreme weather into their downscaling models. So as to help policymakers prioritize the risk due to climate change scenario. Global warming has led to changes which has increased the risk to certain regions and certain communities. But there is a need to provide the risk information at sub-regional levels for adaptation and resilience measures. The CODES community thus has a bigger role to play by educating the communities, stakeholders about the outcomes of their projections. This conference has brought together the international community involved in regional climate research and its applications with particular emphasis on CODEX and related WCRP regional climate activities. And I wish you all the best for fruitful discussions and deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your guiding words. This will surely help for the smooth coordination of the conference hereafter. Now I request Dr. Sanjay to felicitate our guest, Dr. Kamalji Tre, by presenting a memento. This memento is a hand-painted picture of Pune's iconic Shani Varwada. Also request Dr. Sanjay to please felicitate Dr. Krishnan by presenting this memento. Now I invite Dr. Sanjay to propose a vote of thanks. Good morning to all of you. Uh, Honorable Secretary, Ministry of Earth Sciences, our Chief Guest, Dr. M. Ravi Chandran, the Guest of Honor, Dr. M. Mohapatra, uh, Director General of Meteorology, India Meteorological Department. Uh, our Guest of Honor here, uh, Dr. Kamil Jitre, Advisor, Ministry of Earth Sciences, and Director uh, IITM, Dr. R. Krishnan, Distinguished Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege for me to extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all of you on the, this occasion of the inauguration ceremony of International Conference on Regional Climate, ICRC Codex 2023, organized jointly by IITM, the Ministry of Earth Sciences, the Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Studies, ICTP, the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute SMHI in Sweden, and the World Climate Research Program, WCRP. On behalf of local organizing committee, I convey deep regards and hearty thanks to Honorable uh, Secretary uh, of uh, Ministry of Earth Sciences, 
for gracing the inaugural ceremony uh, in a, in with a recorded very uh, full uh, recorded message we extend our wholehearted thanks to you sir for sharing with us your insightful thoughts and providing valuable support and encouragement it is an immense pleasure to thank honorable director general of meteorology dr m mohapatra for inspiring talk which he came now on online and uh, providing strong encouragement and valuable uh, guidance for, for this uh, upcoming conference we are extremely grateful to dr kamaljit ray madam uh, advisor ministry of earth sciences for all the guidance provided for obtaining the necessary approvals from government of india and for the immense support and cooperation received from the ministry of earth sciences for organizing this event thank you ma'am and also for the very very uh, nice talk which we gave we will we will consider all the points what you mentioned in in during the deliberations of this uh, hybrid conference i wish to express my sincere thanks to all distinguished faculties and participants who have come from distant places to make this a great success especially the cordes point of contacts uh, professor uh, koji darkao from uh, japan uh, dr mandira shrestha from ec mod in nepal and uh, dr uh, professor lalu das from uh, west bengal i i we also wish to express my sincere thanks to all local organizing committee members for their unlimited support and extending time for organizing the event without which this event would not have happened my sincere thanks to print and electronic media for their presence and giving excellent coverage of the event i would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude to director iitm for his valuable guidance support and encouragements for conducting the event thank you very much have a nice day thank you dr sanjay with this we will now take a short break i request everyone in front to gather in front of meghdoot hall for a group photograph and then join us for high tea at meghdoot hall basement this op opening session will continue with talks from 11 am onwards at the meghdoot hall and uh, there is an announcement that to reduce the plastic pollution instead of plastic water bottles there are water dispensers provided outside this hall you can use as and when required and there is also a water bottle provided to you in the registration kit so please help with that thank you please gather in front of meghdoot hall for the group photograph <laughs>
Hello. Good morning. Uh, this is one announcement regarding posters display. So participants are requested to put their posters uh, on the poster stand, which is uh, there in the Megdut, um, in the gallery of this hall. So you can kindly put your posters there and, and uh, we will be having a look on, on them during the, uh, yeah, uh, during the poster display session. That will be between 12 to 30 hours. Thank you. Yeah, we'll again announce it.
So, uh, so shall we, we will continue with our opening session. So we have uh, in this session, we have three keynote talks. Uh, uh, first one will be given by the, uh, the Codex uh, uh, Southeast Asia point of contact. Uh, the, uh, and, and he's uh, the Dr. Uh, Frederick Tang Yang. And he's also the uh, Codex Science Advisory Team member. So he, he was also expected to join us here, but due to, uh, he has now moved from the, uh, he, he, he's a professor in the University of uh, Malaysia. 
and he's now joined some bank, uh, Malaysian bank. So due to that, he, he could not join us, but let us hear his, his nice uh, uh, overview of the South Asia and Southeast Asia uh, activities under Codex, what we were doing so far. And, uh, and in advancing the regional climate science through uh, regional collaboration. So he will be talking of the, how, how the Codex activities are going to, collab, uh, to collaborate between the different Asian regional groups, how, how we collaborate each other. So please uh, let us hear, he will be joining remotely from, from uh, Malaysia. Okay, let us hear. Hello, it's time for me to talk. Yes, sir. I can begin. Yes, sir. Please, please. All begin. right. All right. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, um, <clears throat> thank you so much uh, for having me. Uh, hello, Dev. Dr. R. Krishnan, Dr. Sanjay, a guest of honor, participant, uh, um, apology that I cannot make it uh, in person uh, for this wonderful Codex uh, conference, uh, Pune Hub. Uh, <clears throat> I'm supposed to present uh, a snapshot of uh, Codex activity over Asia region, uh, which has uh, four Codex domain, but uh, uh, I was not able to get input from the other two uh, domains. So the talk uh, today will cover uh, South Asia as well as uh, South East Asia. Hello there, my name is uh, Fredolin Tangang. I'm a, a Codex SAT member and also a coordinator for uh, Codex South East Asia uh, activities. Um, All right, so I think we heard so much about uh, Codex uh, in, in our previous uh, speeches. Uh, so I don't think, you know, uh, there is a need for me to uh, talk, uh, introduce what is Codex and so on. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Codex has four uh, domain in Asia, but uh, the focus of the talk today will be only on South Asia and uh, uh, Codex uh, East Asia. Uh, Dr. Sanjay and colleagues uh, provided uh, uh, the slide for you know, uh, Codex South Asia, and I will go through to those uh, you know, in the second part. The first part, I will be talking about uh, Codex South East Asia. Uh, you know, uh, we started Codex, uh, uh, Codex South East Asia as a project funded by APN. We call this uh, CICLID in 2013. Uh, and uh, eventually, when we got uh, APN funding at that time, we got uh, streamlined into Codex and, and became uh, the 14th uh, domain of Codex uh, South Asia, and, and we commonly call ourselves Codex, Codex C. Uh, you know. So uh, this is the summary of uh, kind of the mess, messy slide here. So this is a, a co you know, kind of activity that we have in the Codex South East Asia. Uh, in the first uh, phase one, uh, we downscale uh, a number of GCM using a, you know, a number of RCMs and <clears throat> the run contributed by uh, various institutions within the, the region, as well as outside the region, including uh, GERICS and SMHI, and also uh, some institutions in Australia and, and Japan. So, um, we have completed this and, and uh, most of the data actually we have already uh, uh, you know, archived in the ASGF. Uh, and so in phase two, uh, we further downscale this into a number of subdomain. Uh, 
uh, on the five kilometer resolution. And this is also completed. Uh, and this is also coordinated, although, you know, kind of unofficial uh, because, uh, you know, this is not, not, not really typical uh, uh, resolution uh, or domain uh, uh, within Codex. Uh, we are currently on, on phase three, which we downscale uh, CMIP6 ongoing. And uh, throughout uh, almost a decade or, or more than a decade uh, since uh, we existed, we conducted many, many workshops. I, uh, to be honest, I don't remember how many workshops that we have uh, conducted. And now we have a new baby here. It's so called K uh, Southeast Asia Mega City. So this is actually newly uh, approved project funded, going to be funded by APN as well, starting next month. Uh, and uh, the focus is to come up with uh, high resolution over mega city in Southeast Asia, uh, five mega, mega city actually. Uh, that is Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, uh, Vietnam, uh, Hanoi in, in Manila and also Jakarta. And, this perhaps would become the flagship uh, pilot project for uh, Codex Southeast Asia. In addition to what we have done, uh, there is also uh, this, you know, uh, perhaps most of you know about this Codex Core initiative, which also downscale the CMIP uh, GCM uh, using two RCM. So this is a snapshot of, uh, you know, the first phase. I don't want to go in detail in this one. Here we have a list of, uh, uh, you know, GCM uh, runs in, in you know using different different RCM here, and I show some some figure of a projection of a, a seasonal rainfall there. And uh, in the phase two, uh, we you know uh, run different different domain, and some of these domain actually have a, a very dedicated uh, uh, reason, you know, particular reason why uh, we have it there. For example, the, the one over Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, this is actually a so-called food basket. And you know, when we downscale it to five kilometers, uh, this can be a very good input to you know, some of the uh, uh, you know, uh, VIA community that uh, you know running impact models on, on uh, agriculture and, and some other application. Uh, and this is the, as I said, the new baby. Uh, for us, this is actually going to be led by uh, Dr. Fay Cruz from Manila Observatory and a number of institutions involved and also funded by uh, APN here. Uh, one thing uh, I think, uh, you know, I consider a, a, a quite a, a good achievement uh, for, for us here in Southeast Asia, actually. We, uh, uh, you know, decided to have our own uh, data node, which is also ESGF data node uh, located in, at the Ram Kam Heng University in, in Bangkok. Uh, you know, it's not so much of, uh, you know, if we, we if it just, you know, um, uploading the data, we can upload this in different nodes. But uh, we're thinking at that particular time is that, uh, you know, if we have our own uh, node data, then we can actually add values to this. And for example, uh, you know, within the, uh, um, uh, you know, we call it success, you know, we, we have this uh, ability to, to, uh, have additional uh, features that can uh, uh, connect it to this so-called uh, DSET. DSET is actually a software to run uh, 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 agriculture model, especially uh, PEDI. Yeah? So uh, I don't want to go detailed so we can have more, more slides uh, you know, from uh, Codex uh, Asia. So, um, uh, and another thing is that, uh, you know, the run that we had for the 25 kilometer became uh, uh, input to the uh, so-called, uh, I'm sure most of you know this, uh, the IPCC uh, Interactive Atlas, uh, which you can generate, uh, you know, analysis and figures out of this uh, uh, product. So uh, workshop, there are many, many workshops. And one of the very important thing that, that we, when you're talking about workshop is a capacity building. Uh, from none, uh, you know, not much of the mod modeling, uh, regional modeling activity in this region because of codex, because of capacity building, we have the capability actually now, uh, you know. So as you can see, uh, you know, this guy here, uh, the guru of uh, regional climate downscaling, uh, Professor Filippo, uh, which I believe he will, I'm not really sure whether he's leading, listening or not. If he does, hello, uh, Prof. Uh, Filippo, thank you so much. 
Uh, so there's so many workshops we have done, not just in the, in the Philippines, all, all of these five countries that involved uh, in the uh, modeling uh, you know, activities uh, in the South East Asia region, uh, basically. Now I'm in the uh, uh, Codex South Asia. South Asia. Uh, Sanjay is the you know, lead here. You know, we have Mahindra and, and also Professor Koji and uh, Dr. Lulus Das here. Um, and, uh, I think basically leading this. Uh, I'm not really sure, to be honest, I'm not really sure. You know, maybe the model, the, the way you know Codex is being implemented in South Asia is slightly different than uh, in uh, you know uh, South East Asia because in South East Asia uh, there are many institutions uh, involved in running uh, the regional models. Uh, you know, all over we didn't. Uh, the region as well as outside the region in a true uh, coordinated manner. Uh, but if I understand correctly, for South East Asia, most of this run up, uh, you know, carried out by the uh, IT, IT, ITM, uh, you know, uh, colleagues. Uh, so, um, uh, and, and uh, you know, whatever is it, you know, it provided, it, it provided a platform for uh, regional science to advance and there's so many publication uh, have been uh, uh, published uh, from uh, South Asia region, uh, you know, as, as listed here, uh, you know, more than 40 uh, perhaps in, you know. So, um, and uh, they have done uh, regional assessment uh, climate uh, using Codex, uh, and here, you know, published two, two uh, uh, issue of uh, journals here. Uh, and uh, like what we had in Southeast Asia, uh, in South Asia, they have also conducted uh, um, many uh, workshops and, and capacity building uh, training workshop. And this is this is definitely good. And and uh, 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 you know, without Codex, we won't be able to achieve, achieve this kind of thing. Also, particularly true for South uh, East Asia, and perhaps it is true for uh, uh, South Asia as well. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, IITM have their own uh, node as well. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, um, uh, much more capable than what we have in South Asia. Uh, and this is part of the ESG node as well. Uh, you know. And likewise, uh, the data also, you know, became input to the IPCC uh, interactive atlas. Uh, which can generate, uh, you know, output analysis, uh, you know, from this. You know. So, um, uh, and uh, while, uh, you know, uh, for South uh, East Asia, so far we have not uh, registered any uh, uh, pilot, uh, uh, flagship pilot project yet, uh, but uh, in South Asia, they, they have one, uh, this, is, this is the, uh, FFS, you know, and and I think uh, you know we learn this is quite significant in terms of understanding of the uh, you know um, uh, uh, high high very high resolution over the uh, uh, third pole uh, region uh, in, in South Asia domain. So I think that's it. I hope within within the timeline, uh, I was kind of rushing. And thank you, thank you so much. Would it be any question out of this or? Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Federlin. Uh, that was a very interesting talk on uh, the giving the overview of the Southeast Asia, where you have nicely coordinated with the neighboring countries and produced a, a, a lot of uh, uh, simulations within the uh, Southeast Asia. And as you also mentioned that for South Asia, we had been the IITM took the lead in 2012 when Codex uh, started. And uh, uh, we have been uh, leading the thing and we are open to more people to join uh, other institutions to contribute to the uh, Codex uh, uh, data uh, by their own simulations. 
but yeah the the in the in the cmip6 downscaling it was mainly uh, the contributions from iitm and the european uh, uh, partners so uh, I, I would like to uh, look at the participants for any any questions we, we have short time for uh, any any burning questions you have to professor friendly if i if i may add uh, uh, dr sanjay uh, i have not mentioned uh, uh, about esd yes. the empirical uh, like statistical don scaling uh, okay. you know in this cmip6 round uh, we are also thinking of uh, you know, um, having some kind of uh, uh, activity to start uh, downscaling using a, a statistical downscaling method for uh, Southeast Asia. And in November, we will have a meeting in Bangkok uh, to discuss this. Dr. Fredelin Krishnan here. Hello, Dr. Krishnan. You are my friend. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fredelin. Very nice talk. Can, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this year we saw a number of typhoons uh, and tropical cyclones uh, in East Asia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Bangkok. So what? Uh, so you think this El Nino has a role in this? Uh, uh, Enso variability is also going to affect the tropical cyclone and heavy precipitation. So how are you, go what is the strategy you are thinking? And El Nino's uh, this year is quite intense. And- uh, Yeah, so uh, I, I mean, that's a different, that's a different uh, uh, issue. I think uh, Dr. Krishnan, uh, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, away from uh, what we are doing with Cordex, of course, uh, but nevertheless, it is quite important. Um, uh, and as you may aware, perhaps uh, when come to the, uh, uh, you know, climate projection. Uh, we're not really addressing so much about climate variability. Uh, but what can uh, what I understood about uh, you know the El Nino? Of course, El Nino has already started, uh, albeit perhaps is still in the category of uh, moderate. There could be there could be uh, you know some effect uh, of of the of the El Nino uh, on the uh, genesis of, of typhoon uh, as you know the warm pool is perhaps rather warm now and uh, you know that could be you know uh, contributing to this uh, you know uh, but uh, I, I I must I must admit that I have not really uh, you know uh, updated myself uh, on the latest situation on on this uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan. Yeah. Thank you Dr. Fred. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's also part of uh, climate variability, the backdrop of climate change. I think these two together are influencing many of the extremes. Uh, whether and, uh, correct, extreme. correct. I mean, uh, you know, of course, when it comes to risk, uh, you need to understand both, uh, you know. But the thing is that when it comes to uh, the climate projection that we have, uh, we're not quite, you know, even sure that uh, it, it's, uh, you know, according to IPCC, uh the model the model still kind of uh uh you know um it it, it replicates some of the major mode of variability especially el nino but uh you know but this is this is a scenario run so um it's slightly different than than the the uh you know the the real forecast uh and so uh, but i agree with you that uh you know, uh, when come to impact, when come to understanding the risk, the physical risk uh, of hazard, uh, climate related hazard, uh, we need to consider both, uh, you know, in, in, in understanding the uh, climate risk. Thank you so much, Professor Fred. Fred. Nice Thank to you. Meet you yeah, yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't attend. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I have retired from the university and now working in a different organization, uh, which is also deal with climate uh, so much. So if uh, in, no more yeah. you want to do? Okay. Okay, so he, here, here. Make it, please make it short because yeah. now we... Uh, uh, very nice presentation, President. Yeah, please, please introduce uh, yourself. Uh, uh, I am Professor Lalu Das, you mentioned <laughs> in your talk. So... Okay, Prof, yeah, to... sorry, I forgot to mention you're your a professor. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, okay, it's very, very nice. So actually you mentioned in your talk that um, you have downscale CIMIC-6 model for uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia region for using as input for the DSAT model. So uh, who are the responsible for doing this uh, 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 downscale product? Because I am working in the agriculture university, many, uh, 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 many crop models require really uh, point location, uh, downscale uh, CIMIC-6 data for using as input for future impact study of different crops. So this is a very good message from your end. If you convey the message who are responsible for this uh, product, then we can have some contact with them. <clears throat> All right. Uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps uh, some of you know uh, uh, Professor Atachai from uh, Chiang Mai University. Uh, he is a well-known uh, you know, um, agriculture uh, modeler, uh, mostly paddy, I think. Uh, and uh, he runs Desat in... in and uh, but the thing is that uh, you know uh, it's very difficult for people who work on desert desert to to understand climate output. So what we have done in uh, in the portal, we have some kind of uh, you know a GUI uh, you know to facilitate you know uh, net CDF data uh, from ESGF into the uh, desert model. And this is good because uh, you know otherwise uh, you know we cannot really bridge well uh, from climate model output into the uh, application uh, uh, software like like uh, this set where they input basically an ASCII file. So um, yeah, if 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 you want, uh, you know, maybe you can get my contact from from uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, and uh, we can communicate over uh, email and then I will provide the, you know. Uh, you. And speaking about, you know, to facilitate the output from ESGF into the user, this is not only one, you know, we have other features within the so-called success, uh, the portal that we have, uh, which is our ESGF data node in Thailand, uh, you know, where we can, facilitate the use of this data actually with, you know, uh, 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 in-house developed uh, GUI. Uh, this is the idea actually. I mean, if we just dump our data in some other nodes and we wouldn't, don't, we wouldn't, wouldn't have a, a, any, any capability of, of creating this kind of, uh, uh, you know, additional features. And this is why, you know, but, you know, running uh, ESGM node is not cheap. Uh, you know, it comes with a uh, lot of responsibility and, and money as well uh, over the long run. And yeah, thank you, okay. uh, my colleague in, in Bangkok for doing this. Okay, then thank, thank you, um, Professor Ferlin. Actually, thank there you. are more, more questions here, but we are short of time because we have to move on to the next uh, keynote talk. So thank you very much. We, we thank have, you. And I'm sure I'm sure you'll join in the opening session in the afternoon with uh, the ICTP also. So there will be more uh, interactions with you. Thank you so much. For thank you. I'll try my best. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. So so we move on to the next uh, keynote talk by Dr. Mandira Sishta. Uh, Mandira Sishta is from uh, the EC Mod in in Kathmandu and is a very active uh, um, uh, uh, leader in, in promoting the Codex over South Asia. When, when we have started the Codex in 2012, uh, we immediately in the next year, uh, uh, Dr. Mandra Seshta nicely organized a, a, a workshop there and we all could uh, uh, visit the, uh, the Kathmandu and have a very nice interaction. And from that time onwards, as, as uh, uh, Professor Fedlin has shown, there have been many workshops happening jointly with uh, 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 ECMOD. And so let us hear from uh, Dr. Mandira Seshta on the, on the Codex uh, South Asia interaction with society. As she mentioned to me, she will be focusing on the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Thank you. A very uh, good morning to you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for that nice introduction. So um, 
Dr. Kamaljeet, Dr. Krishnan, Dr. Koji, Dr. Sanjay, uh, Dr. Fridolin, Dr. Rupa Kumar, um, Professor Lalu, um, Dr. Prakash Tiwari, and I could continue on, but, uh, and all the distinguished participants. Once again, a very good uh, morning. So um, I'm delighted to be here at this uh, ICRC uh, Fordex 2023 conference. And this has been uh, much awaited. Actually, the discussions began last year um, with uh, the team. Um, and it's, I'm glad that uh, this has become a reality. So what uh, I'm going to talk about is more the work that we've done, particularly relating to Cordex uh, South Asia and its link with the society. Um, I say the society at large uh, includes all different stakeholders, including uh, starting from the hydromet agencies to various other stakeholders, to DRR stakeholders, and then the link to the people and the uh, community. So that's at large. Uh, for the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So, um, but let me begin quickly by a short introduction to ISIMOD. Some of you may not be familiar with uh, my organization, ISIMOD. ISIMOD stands for the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. And uh, we're located in Kathmandu, Nepal. And we work primarily for eight countries Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal and Pakistan. And primarily, we are a research organization, more a knowledge organization. And uh, we are focusing on sustainable mountain developments and to improve the lives and livelihoods of the mountain communities in the region. Now, um, when you look at the Hindu Kush Himalayas, you may be wondering which region really comprises of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So this particular map that you see here, uh, you know, basically shows you the extent of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. This is a region that extends about 3,500 kilometers from west to east, covering all those eight countries that I mentioned. And the uniqueness of this particular region is that it's a global hotspot for biodiversity, as we all know, as we live here. And that uh, given the fact that it's uh, the largest reserve for snow and ice outside the polar region, we also get the name as the third pole. And it's a very important region, particularly because uh, 10 of the largest rivers really emerge from uh, this particular region, whether you talk about the Indus or the Ganges or the Brahmaputra, Irrawaddy, Yangtze, you know, I could be naming all the rivers here. And the resources from this region uh, feeds more than 240 million people immediately in the region of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, but more than roughly about 1.6 billion people living in the downstream. So totally we are looking at about 1.9 billion people that really depend on the resources of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. So that's a large population. You're looking at basically um, one fourth of the global population. So uh, let me just uh, give you some key issues of the region. I think this is the, sets the context in terms of what we are trying to do in terms of weather and climate and its predictions, because we're faced by a number of challenges. One is that we live in a multi-hazard environment. So there are a number of different types of hazards uh, that are happening in our region, uh, mainly the climate-induced hazards that has happened. And that what hap happens in the upstream is basically affecting the lives and livelihoods of the people living in the downstream. And climate change and variability is a very important issue and really makes us very vulnerable in the region. Another important factor is that uh, it's um, you know, very difficult in terms of access and connectivity. Some of the regions that we have, some of the settlements that we have in high mountain areas, it's pretty difficult for access. And also in terms of weather and climate, it becomes even more challenging in the mountains. Then uh, the governance and the mechanisms, the institutional mechanisms also remain to be quite challenging. So this is the kind of the base that we have to work around. And then what is the climate like? Yeah, so there was a study that was done in 2017. It was 19, it was completed actually. And this particular study, this was led by Dr. Krishnan. It was part of this high map in the Kush Himalayan assessment um, that was conducted by jointly more than 300 scientists. And this particular chapter 
on climate change was led by Dr. Krishna again. And here, what it really indicates is that our region, that is the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, is really warming much faster than other regions. If you're looking at a region that's about 1.5 degree world, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region is going to be warmer by at least 0.3 degrees or more. So this is something that has been found by the study that was led by Dr. Krishnan. And the other fact is that uh, we all have experienced this this year. I think we are facing more and more precipitation extremes, whether we talk about the floods uh, that occurred in Himachal Pradesh or other regions in, in this year or in previous years. I think we are being challenged by more erratic rainfall somewhere there is extreme rainfall while other areas remain quite dry. So according to the report again, uh, the warming and precipitation both are increasing, going to be increasing in the future. And uh, in a, by, by 2100, you're going to be experiencing about two to four degrees warmer climate. And that um, when you're looking at the precipitation, I think that's about eight to 12% increase is what has been reported. And this report is available in the net. Uh, if you look up IMAP assessment, you will find details of this. And for India alone, I think a very good assessment has also been done uh, by Dr. Krishnan and his team. Dr. Sanjay was also part of that uh, for the whole region to look at what the changes would be in the region. So basically what happens here is basically affecting more than one fourth of the humanity. We are on the top of the world basically. And, um, and according to a recent report that was launched by ECMO, that we call it as the high-wise report, just a few uh, months ago, again, this looks at various scenarios, which is very important to be looking at, whether we're looking at a 1.5 degrees to 2 degrees or 3 or 4 degrees. All these scenarios are showing that the glaciers are going to deplete very fast in our region. So what does that mean to us? Well, one is that it has direct impacts on our water resources on the lives and livelihoods of people, as well as the availability of flow, disasters are going to increase, more uh, retreat of glaciers, meaning larger lakes, more possibility of glacial lake outburst floods. So those are some of the projections that we have. Yeah, so if you look at the disasters, you know, there are evidences that it's increasing, whether you're talking about the economic impacts of these disasters or its occurrences, they are all increasing. And then many of these disasters are transboundary. And I think uh, you know, the work that we are doing on weather and climate basically provides that entry point for better understanding of these transboundary disasters that are existing in the region. And I'll give you examples of climate extremes. I think uh, Madam has nicely kind of elaborated on some of the events that has occurred all this year and last year in terms of floods and extreme events. Here I list a few glacial lake outburst floods, for instance, I'll show you some uh, photos of 2007. This was in the Bhutakoshi uh, area, Bhutakoshi River, um, a river that emerges uh, from the Tibetan region, the Tar region of China. This was how it looked. This is the hydropower project that is in place, that was in place. And then in 2016, there came a big glacial lake outburst flood, you know, with very little warning. And then immense uh, disaster. I think this very much probably reminds us about the Chamoli disaster that occurred in India in 2021, where a big avalanche, a rock a slide and avalanche led to a huge disaster in terms of not only more than 200 people losing their lives, but also, you know, three or four hydropower projects completely destroyed. So a similar kind of events are happening across the region, whether you talk about floods or landslides, you know, there's, those are becoming more and more common. And then um, another important point I think we should take into account is the cascading nature of these disasters. So one disaster you know, leads to another, one hazard leads to another. I think this is important. So we cannot look in isolation. We have to look at it cumulatively in terms of what are the different events. So there are challenges, challenges in terms of frequency increasing. I think we have already stated that. Uh, observing networks, yes, uh, it's not enough. We need more. Um, the uh, sharing of information, data, knowledge is limited, whether we talk about across the region or across uh, countries or borders, and the capacity in terms of modeling, the capacity in terms of know-how varies in the region. And what is limited is that the 
uh, climate services that exist is not tailored enough. It is not tailored to the needs of the users. So there I'm coming with the users, the society's need. What do we know? What do they want and what do we know? There is a gap between the two, yeah? And then we need to also be uh, responsive in terms of gender. I think we hardly talk about gender when we are in such kind of technical meetings, but I think the needs of the women, the children, the vulnerability also needs to be taken into account. So uh, climate services, yes, it's uh, basically looking at science-based information and forecasts that empower decision makers at different levels to anticipate and manage climate-related shocks and avail opportunities. So you're looking at a whole gamut um, in terms of the process, where they we're talking about production, translation, delivery, and then customizing it for the use of the leaders. And for which, of course, out here, everybody is familiar with the different scales, whether we talk about the temporal scales or the spatial scales from local to global, as well as from historical to protected climate change, which we are discussing now. And then the climate risk sensitive growth sectors. I think this, there are many different sectors that are really being affected by climate change, whether you're talking about the agriculture sector or the tourism, water and energy, health disasters, all of these sectors are immensely affected. So they need a proper kind of climate information so that they are you know, made available so that they can make decisions on time, yeah? And the right decisions on time. So that's where I bring in the Cordex, uh, you know, the whole um, strategy that is in place uh, where we talk about the data and the society. So if you looked at the strategy of uh, Cordex, um, the 2018 to 2000, uh, 27, there is one particular, out of the four elements, one of the elements, the fourth one is looking at bridging climate science with society, yeah? So that's where providing regional climate data and information uh, it are the, you know, the providers that provide it in terms of long-term trends or variability. And then you're looking at it, how that can inform then better adaptation, better mitigation strategies that needs to be put in place and then informing the policy at different levels, whether you're talking about infrastructure development or whether you're talking about policies for energy. Uh, so the climate services initiative we have at ISIMOD, this is particularly looking at improving the capacities, enhancing the capacities of mountain communities. And that's where I bring in the different stakeholders at uh, the local as well as the regional level to build their capacity, bridge that gap between the service providers and the service, the users. Yeah. So there we are looking at providing climate information services in order to reduce the risks and vulnerabilities of these people. And then the kind of um, pathway that we follow are threefold. One is looking at partnerships. Yeah, we need to strengthen partnerships and user interfaces. Then we look, need to co-develop the services, co-design the services with the communities, with the people, with the society, and then strengthen the capacity. I think the previous presentation that Dr. Frederlin made very much talks about strengthening the capacity. Yeah? So then here, that's where Isimod has also worked closely with the various uh, providers of um, in knowledge, the science, as well as the users, whether you're talking about hydropower you know, providers, or whether you're talking about the hydromet agencies, or uh, the different um, agencies and the um, academicians, researchers, you know, the primary this basically that interfaces with the community and the people where capacity strengthening is very much important. One is to understand what it is about. Yeah, we need to know and we they need to know, understand and then also the impact based kind of information. How does that impact various kind of uh, sectors and then the build the institutional capacity for access and use of these climate change projections and its applications. So the data that is available by Cordex uh, South Asia that has that is available in the web is now, uh, you know, has been uh, provided to the countries to be able to access it as well as use it for various applications. We're looking also at trends, for instance, yeah, and then co-developing and tailoring some of the products. That's also important. And then enhancing the capacity, particularly I think dissemination and communication strategies becomes uh, very critical in terms of making that information and the interface between the community as well as the society with the, uh, not the providers of data information with the science that we have. So um, this is the process we followed. There were several consultations that were held. Uh, needs were identified of the various stakeholders so that um, they are benefited by the trainings and capacity building. We partnered with Met Office uh, UK, uh, with WCRP, 
um, with IIT and Pune, and as well as SMHI, and then held several different uh, capacity building activities in the region for Afghanistan, for Nepal, for mm -hmm. Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And this is one photo of the training that we had on indices. I think climate indices and variables are very important uh, for various sectors. So we had that also a training for different um, stakeholders. And, uh, and finally, I think it does provide us an opportunity for um, enhancing the capacity. But what is important is to look at the partnerships. Enhancing the partnerships, important also is the co-design and co-development of the services. We also need to build the capacity using uh, technology. I think technology is an excellent entry point. And then using it for various applications, data, but data by itself is not adequate. You need to really, you know, unfold that uh, and then be able to harmonize that climate data for the purpose of application. And uh, lastly, I think what is essential in kind of this kind of a gathering, as well as the work that we do across weather um, and climate is that we need to work in terms of promoting regional cooperation and collaboration because it's a regional effort across the region and for which also there's a need to strengthen international partnerships. So with that, I thank you for your time for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mandra Shrishta. Actually, the, this talk gives the, the bridge between the uh, what we saw in the first keynote that uh, Codex data has been produced, how it can be taken to the uh, society, how it can be bridged. And, and Dr. Mandra Shrishta is an expert in that, and we'll hear more in the, in the session B, which is going to happen uh, on 28th, I think, 28th, we'll be hearing it. A, a full session on the codex interaction with society. Thank you very much. It was nice. And if you have, the, we are short of time, but we can have one question, please. Thank you, madam. Uh, I am Dr. Mohan Kumar Dash uh, from National Oceanographic and Maritime Institute, NOMI, also the Joint Secretary of South Asian Meteorological Association, SAMA. So you are working with a very important zone uh, as like as mountain and sea, both are the data scarce region in the earth, earth planet. So, and also it is very sensitive to the landslide. So is your institute running any landslide modeling for support the community? And also is there any projection? So two questions, thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohandas, for that uh, question. I think um, one of the hazards that's prevalent in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, particularly in the mountain areas, as you correctly said, is landslides. Now, what is Isimod really doing on landslides? You know, um, there were a lot of work that was done in the mid 90s till early 2000 on landslides in terms of better understanding the processes, holding training. Then there was a gap for some time. And now, uh, since the last year and a half or so. We've been working with uh, various partners. One of the partners is with NASA. So um, with NASA, we are working with uh, various types of models. One is that we are looking at also the forecast of landslides. Uh, in fact, I have it in my computer also. I could show you separately in terms of uh, showing you know, where the landslides are likely to happen. Depending upon the input parameters, we use the iMERGE uh, data sets. Uh, for satellite-based precipitation and other parameters which can be then used. So that's one part. And um, the other part is also to basically map these landslides across the region. That's one of the things that's important. It has been done in a piecemeal basis. So that's another area that we are looking at. But apart from ISI mode, there are various other organizations also trying to address this issue of uh, landslides, which is uh, getting a lot of attention these days because the number of people being killed by disasters due to landslides is increasing. Fortunately, by um, floods is decreasing because of the effectiveness of early warning systems, but landslides still remains a challenge. So thank you. Th thank you, Dr. Mandar. I, I am sure Pr Professor Prakash Tiwari and all that have a lot of questions remaining. Maybe we can do it because we have, we have to, because we'll have to join after our lunch with the joint sessions. So uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Mandar Sishka once again. And we'll be, we'll be having time to more interact with Dr. Mandra Sishka and Professor Koji in the coming other sessions. Surely we'll have time. So, Professor Koji. Uh, 
thank you very much for uh, coming here and so professor koji is from the university of sukuba he is uh, uh, our other uh, a point of contact for the code of south asia south asia and he will be talking on on the uh, uh, sectoral impact assessments the the other other theme of this conference is going to be on the sectoral impacts so that's what this keynote will be focusing on so let us hear from professor kuch thank you okay so thank you very much sanjay to inviting me it's a great honor for me it's a first first visit to india and iit game it's great honor and great experience for us okay thank you very much um today i'd like to briefly introducing about uh, our capacity building experience and also a kind of uh, training and uh, some uh, latest research activity in japan um yeah those kind of things is briefly introduced in the later on you see okay so um today I, my title of the presentation is a regional climate information for water energy health integrated studies i'm working with a phd student and a master student in the other collaborator in japan and okay so as you may know um large scale natural disaster increasingly threatening asian pacific regions and uh, projected loss and damage of natural disaster is a growing concern of, for us and the paris agreement in 2016 and sdgs uh, in 2015s greatly influenced on the japanese government and in japan the climate change adaptation act came into effect in december 2018 so the japan government having a great and growing concern about the climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation in these days so to do that so fundamental regional climate information is indispensable for understanding changing climate and making decisions on when and how to act and um, special temporal comprehensive and consistent information is necessary and useful for decision making um i'd like to briefly introducing about several example of our research uh, exam uh, research activities oh, okay before that um so even though we have a more ensemble dynamic downscaling and gcm and high resolution gcm and dynamic downscaling so forth so it is not always enough to investigate the uncertainty caused by structural differences in the model um so much more ensemble regional climate information by using the combination of dynamic approach and statistical downscaling approach is necessary to investigate the uncertainty um project to change associated with the structural differences in rcm and gcms and the research for uncertainty information for regional climate scenarios intended to provide end users with an informed selection and uh, decision making I'd, i'd like to briefly introduce several trial for our research group okay so first of all uh, heat stress is a kind of the compound event and primary driving uh, are not only for uh, one variable but also several uh, combination of the uh, multi variables um it's uh, one of the important uh, index to assess in the mortality related to the heat stress crucial for climate change adaptation in japan not only for in japan but in asia also um we take a wide array of regional climate information for risk assessment for heat stress but uncertainty in multi variable bias adjustment at the value in downscaling general saturation could be a, one of the issues um because of that most of the bias adjustment usually applicable for the univariate adjustment only for temperature or precipitation or wind speed and so forth so if we discuss about a mechanism or connection and the forcing data for impact assessment model those kind of the uh, dependency between the multi variate uh, relationship is indispensable or to be a uh, steward so if we collapse those kind of uh, uh, independent uh, collapse and apply bias correction independently so it's very difficult to discuss about the relationship between the multi model uh, correction uh, uh, mechanism and also time series so um it's a result of the 
uh, 3GCM and uh, 3RCM downscaling ensembles. And uh, so, um, so middle panel indicates the original model bias uh, according to the surface air temperatures. Upper, upper panel is the 3GCM, forced RCM ensemble, and lower panel indicates the JRA25, forced R3 RCM ensembles. And if we apply a, a bias adjustment to air temperatures, we can reduce uh, the bias to some extent. Okay. So um, it's a uh, added value. Oh, we evaluated added value for air surface air temperature. It's a uh, right hand panel indicates the original added value, uh, relative, relative, uh, relative advancement. Uh, re so relatively better RCMs than GCMs. Uh, horizontal axis is altitude. So added value seems to be increasing as altitude increases compared to the RCM and the GCM without any bias adjustment. So if we apply bias adjustment, not only for RCM, but also GCMs, we cannot find any significant added value. And because the bias adjustment for GCM also could have a somewhat as enough, uh, enough influence to reduce the bias. Um, the left uh, panel, indicates a combination, uh, only bias adjustment applied only for RCMs without GCMs. Um, the combination of the bias adjustment and the RCM could increase uh, the bias, uh, and could increase added value to some extent and also reduce the bias in the low altitude. So yeah, it is necessary condition, uh, RCM showing the uh, better skills than GCM but uh, if we combine with uh, a better RCM and also bias adjustment scheme, we could produce a better skills, better at the body compared to RCM and GCMs. And the left hand figure indicating uh, uh, adjustment to the GCM. No, adjustment doesn't apply to the RCMs. Um, yeah, still we can see some significant improvement of the skills of the GCM without RCMs. But uh, yeah, it depends on the purpose of the applications. And also we can clearly show in the increase of the uh, scale of the added value of the relative humidity as well. Okay, so before the adjustment, uh, we cannot find any significant added value uh, for, for uh, three RCM compared to the three DCMs. But after the adjustment, we can see a significant improvement of the added value in the higher altitude. So those kind of the uh, in dependent bias adjustment, not only for one variable to the March variables could enable us to make a heat stress assessment in better way. Okay. So, and also secondly, I'd like to showing the kind of added value for compound monsoon driven deep running downscaling trial. Uh, it's a kind of the human cost exposure to compound drought and heat wave over West Africa. Um, yeah, briefly explaining about uh, two training the deep running system using the observation and data, data data set, and also those kind of training data is transferred to the uh, transfer and apply to the GCMs. And a deep uh, ESD method as trained and run a predicted sensitivity. Yeah, it is necessary to making a which kind of variable and region can be sensitive to these regions. Uh, yeah, it depends on the uh, region and timing and so forth. And uh, so we developed the deep running and the model highlighting in the blue box, yeah, this one and apply the GCM sensitivity input to obtain the regional downscaling result by using deep learning downscaling. Okay, this is a brief example of the result. It's uh, uh, observed precipitation and the deep, ES, uh, deep running ESD, CAM, ESM2, and uh, MR5, uh, and MPI. Um, most of the case, uh, deep running downscaling could enable to produce, reproduce the precipitation spatial pattern in a good way. 
So, and also maximum uh, temperature, climatological maximum temperature uh, observed in the observations in the left, upper left hand side is well captured by the deep learning downscaling by the uh, deep ESD, CAM ESD, uh, ESM2, and MEL5, and MPI as well. So, those kind of extreme event is also uh, well captured to, to some extent by using the deep learning downscaling systems. Okay, so what's added value? Um, the deep learning downscaling bias, yeah, it's much lower, much smaller than the original bias of the GCMs. It's a temp bias of the temperature, and right hand figure showing the bias of the precipitation as well. Uh, it's probably a percentage of the bias. Um, yeah, by using the deep learning downscaling method, we can reduce the bias very uh, significantly compared to the original GCMs. Okay, and uh, third example of our trial is uh, a climate change impact assessment of water resources for hydropower assessment using regional climate modeling in Ethiopia. It's conducted by one uh, by one by uh, one PhD student. Um, today, I'm briefly introducing about the downscaling for high resolution land use, land cover change. So, main objective of this trial is to produce, generate a set of high resolution land use change projections for regional research in Ethiopia using the new integrated scenarios for SSP and RCP scenarios. Um, yeah, actually, for high resolution GCMs, so LUH2 project providing the a higher resolution global scale land projection data set, 0.25 degree is provided, but it's not necessarily to, uh, sufficient for those kind of high resolution uh, water resources assessment and uh, assessment of hydropower generation in Ethiopia. So therefore we'd like to uh, downscaling not only for climate variables, but also socioeconomic variables, high resolution land use land climate change downscaling. So it's a brief uh, structure of the, this those kind of methodology. Uh, originally, land use harmonization, LH2, was provided by the LH2 project. The resolution is 0.25 degree, almost 25 or 20 kilometer grid spacing. So by using those kinds of data as a boundary condition or initial condition, uh, we applied the simulation of the land use dynamic uh, models using FLAS model. It's a kind of the uh, cellular autonomous models and uh, one state of the cell is simulated uh, by using the adjacent, uh, state of the adjacent, adjacent cells. Yeah, those kind of the automata model uh, applied for estimating the high resolution land use of change. Yeah. It's a result and the discussion and the validation of this around this high resolution and this sort of a change. Um, by using the initial condition of the 1960 or something, uh, land use cover data using for training and running and simulated land use land cover change, well capture the current observed satellite based uh, land use land cover change data set. So uh, what we've done so far, um, that model is used to simulate a multi type land use change in Ethiopia. And we are now trying to uh, develop the data set 2020 to 2100 uh, with 10 year intervals and eight SSP scenario, RCP scenarios combination and one kilometer spatial resolutions um, to, uh, to facilitate those high resolution water resources simulation and also high resolution RCM crowd resolving model downstream. Okay, it's a final example is the energy potential calculation for mitigation and adaptations. Uh, it's a kind of the uh, combination of the bias adjustment for the 10 meter wind speed to extrapolate uh, 50 or 100 meter. And we estimate the wind power density and also photovoltaic power potentials. And uh, we are trying to estimate the potential of the future uh, photovoltaic uh, potential yields in uh, 
and Pakistan, uh, on Southeast, South, uh, South, uh, South Asia, uh, by using the GCM and RCM combinations. We are now working on that. Yeah, those kind of uh, output could be, uh, uh, we hope, uh, actionable information for stakeholders in the near future. Okay, I will summarize. Okay. So um, bottom-up process and risk-based approach could be uh, essential to include more regional stakeholder and to develop the regional climate scenario for policy relevance. And we'd like to develop the regional climate information and provide the information by selecting appropriate methods that meet needs the various uh, stakeholders. We are now trying to working on the high resolution GCMs and uh, combination with statistical downscaling and crowd resolving modeling. And networking and connection codex areas for rich diversity for multi model method ensemble and for investigating robustness of climate hazard and risk information. And uh, finally, uh, we, uh, we are now working with education, the capacity building for early career uh, researchers. So, make scholarship and special scholarship program uh, project based learning in the University of Tsukuba is working well. I have uh, now eight PhD students and three master students from uh, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, and Vietnam, so forth. And uh, several candidates is now under consideration for 2024, and the uh, application period is now open. And students receive several awards like uh, AGU 2020 and uh, degree program director's awards and the best presentation and so forth. Okay, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. And, uh, oh, Daniel, what? <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Uh, so thank you very much and and nicely you have you have introduced the new methods uh, by including the deep learning and all that which can be used for uh, doing for some uh, example you have given for the sectoral impact studies how it can be used and also the all the other the the new information what you have given would be very useful and uh, as i mentioned we, we are short of time, but if you have any any one question, we can take now, or we can do it during the lunch break because <laughs> we have to uh, continue, uh, come back and join with the joint session, uh, or any any of the practitioner uh, or or mantra in any any or Kamalji is finally. Would you like to have some comments? Yeah. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh... Dr. Koji, for your very nice uh, presentation. Um, I think the bias adjustment seems to be critical mm -hmm. in your analysis. Mm -hmm. So um, is there a particular bias adjustment method that is better than mm -hmm. uh, the you know, various other methods that are available? What mm -hmm. did you find as the uh, best suitable method for bias adjustment? Okay, yeah, thank you very much for your good questions. Uh, yeah, those kind of things could be discussed in the day four in the B2 session, more on that. But basically speaking, uh, it could be a tailor-made bias adjustment, decision-making could be done with the discussion with the stakeholders. And because we don't have a perfect solution for everything, we don't have any perfect uh, magic bullet. So it depending on the situation and the condition and the stakeholders. So we need a more involvement of the stakeholder and discussion with you. I just want to the overall all the presentation. Three presentations were uh, excellent. Uh, really enjoyed. Thank you very much. And Vandita uh, Sreshta's uh, presentation was outstanding. Koji also, Koji san. So I want to thank all the speakers. <laughs> thank you very much. You're very kind to us. I, I have a question. Can I ask? Hello. Yes sir. yes, sir. Please, sir, you can ask your question. Yeah, so I know that there is a time you are doing sectorial two kilometer resolution climate runs mm -hmm. uh, in uh, JMA and uh, so on. So if you have two kilometer run uh, sectorial global climate run, 
then is there the need of a regional model also? So, what's the point? Could, could you sir, uh, sir, can you please repeat, sir? Yeah, because I know uh, in the past uh, in Japan, I think Japan uh, uh, in Sukuba, that center, they are running two kilometer resolution global model for climate studies. If two kilometer resolution global model is there, so is there any need of uh, regional model again or uh, that will be okay? Hmm. Or what yeah. is the status of that model now? It is there or not? I don't know today. Okay, it could be an open question for the Cortex meeting. So we'd like to discuss about the dilemma and the compromise about the benefit and uh, some disadvantage of high resolution and the decreasing number of sensitivity experiment. It's depending on the purpose of your analysis or stakeholders. It's my comments. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Koji. It was nice. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to the Dr. Bo. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Amelin Majumdar to felicitate uh, the session chair, Dr. Sanjay. So, so we we will now break for lunch and um, uh, yeah and and posters are being displayed in the uh, Meghdoot reception area so you can uh, visit them as well and uh, after the lunch we will assemble here again at thirteen uh, hours sharp so please be here at thirteen yeah yeah so we will be joining the opening session at ICTP. So, so the lunch is arranged at the Meghdoot basement. Yeah, please, please look at. So those participants who have still not put their posters on the poster board, you are requested to, to kindly do it as soon as possible. So the, the, um, uh, the, the names and respective uh, titles are already pasted there. So you can just search them and put your posters there.
هلا هلا هلو Good afternoon. So I hope we all are re-energized after having our lunch. So we'll be shortly joining in the opening session of uh, ICTP main venue of ICRC Codex 2023. So it will be uh, uh, live streamed through, through Zoom platform. So yeah. So we request the participants to please come in the front rows. And uh, if your friends are still not here, please call them as soon as possible. Hello, si sente? Si sente? Yeah. So Hello? We are Please take your seat so we can start.
present. Good morning. Good morning, please take your seats. Okay, thanks very much for uh, si sente? No. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Che cosa? Che lo so, ma dobbiamo cominciare. Unfortunately, there is still a long line outside, but uh, we are already late. So we have to start this uh, welcoming uh, ceremony. Uh, let me introduce myself first of all. I'm Filippo Giorgi. I'm actually one of the founders of Cordex with a couple, few people here uh, many years ago now. <clears throat> and um, this is the fifth Pan Cordex conference. Uh, some of you may remember that we had the first one in 2011 here in ICTP. And I'm sure uh, at least two or three of you uh, have been also in that one. Then there was uh, one in Brussels, in uh, Stockholm, Beijing, and then uh, this one. And hopefully this will not be uh, the last one. <laughs> Um, Cordex has grown and uh, over the years, and uh, I think Daniela and uh, and Silvina will tell us uh, what the status is. So um, we don't have keynote talks, in case you are wondering. There was a mistake in the program. It's just a welcoming address. Uh, I will introduce the first uh, speaker, let's say, uh, Atish Dabolkar. He's uh, the director of uh, ICTP the theoretical physicist, but uh, it's always been very supportive of uh, our section and of uh, climate issues. So Atish, uh, we, we all have five minutes, so let's try to be on time. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? You have to speak very close. Good morning. Okay. Uh, so welcome to ICTP. It's a pleasure to have uh, all of you here. Thanks, Filippo, uh, for inviting me to say a few words. Uh, Filippo has already told you about uh, CORDEX, uh, and all of you, I'm sure, know about it. It's the Coordinated Regional Climate Downscaling Experiments. And uh, ICTP is very glad to be a part of it. Uh, so let me, not all of you may know about ICTP. The, it's the Abdus Salam. International Center for Theoretical Physics, uh, which was founded uh, some 60 years ago by the Nobel laureate from Pakistan, Abdus Salam. And it has a threefold mission to promote uh, advanced scientific research around the world, promoting both excellence and inclusion, and making the scientific resources available to uh, everyone around the world. But the third pillar, which is equally important, is to promote international cooperation through science. And I think it's most important in the area like climate science. As you know, the monsoon doesn't respect the national boundaries. So it's really necessary to bring together people from uh, across the continent, across the globe together to discuss climate issues. And therefore, the mission of CORDEX, which is to really have this coordinated regional climate models, is really uh, very, very well aligned with ICTP. So I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this uh, important event. I'm glad to learn that it's the fifth edition. Uh, and my colleague here, Filippo, has been uh, one of the driving forces. Uh, I have to say that um, I'm very happy that uh, Filippo has been at ICTP. He has had a distinguished career at ICTP, essentially, uh, and the climate section has flourished uh, under his leadership. Uh, he will be leaving uh, uh, next year. Uh, so, as you know, he was uh, he has been uh, also was the co-recipient of this uh, 2007 
uh, IPCC Nobel Prize together with the IPCC team. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will find a suitable, <laughs> uh, suitable uh, person to take up the leadership of the section. So I, I would like to take this occasion also to wish him all the best uh, for his, uh, since he has been one of the main organizers of this uh, very major event going around the world. I think it's appropriate that the fifth edition is taking place here. So all the best, uh, Filippo, and my best wishes for the uh, conference uh, this year. And I hope it continues uh, and flourishes in the future. Thank you, Atish. So as you saw, you already said I will be retiring next year and then we'll see what happens. Um, our next speaker uh, will give us a welcome from the city of Trieste. Many of you, several of you, uh, maybe many of you have been here many times. You've seen the city becoming better and better over the years. At least I've seen the city becoming better and better over the years. Um, uh, Michele Babuder is, in Italian, we say Assessore all'ambiente of the city of Trieste. We looked for a uh, English translation, and apparently, at least Google Translate gives uh, counselor or something like that. Something like uh, it's it's a bit more than that. Uh, and Michele actually is uh, is very um, sensitive to environmental issues, and is doing actually, I think. Uh, a lot for uh, for the city of Trieste in this regard. So, uh, Michele will give us a brief welcome on behalf of the uh, city of Trieste. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you, Director. Good morning, everyone, dear guests and ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you on behalf of the municipality. I'm really proud and it's an honor also for me and a pleasure to be here today to extend a warm greeting to all guests of this important conference and to express to all of you also my gratitude for your dedication of the, to the cause of the climate change and environment and also of the effects of climate change. It represents an opportunity for discussing, discussion, sharing knowledge and ideas and collaboration between experts from different disciplines and sectors. I also would like to underline the importance of constructive dialogue and cooperation between the institution, organization, individuals here represented with you. Only through collaboration and unity, we can hope to achieve a meaningful, meaningful solution to the problems we face. Only together, we can make a difference and contribute to a better for all. Climate change requires each of us to adopt the responsible attitudes because they affect, they, they affect to the environment, but also, you know better than me, on social and economic issues. Renewable energy and sustainable energy source, green technologies and solutions for reducing emission, public-private collaboration to enable mobility, and low emission transport represent some possible solution that also the administration must take into account, including adaption strategy for vulnerable citizen, citizen and city. I'm sure that uh, the conference uh, uh, will offer us ideas uh, and useful elements uh, also for the municipality of Trieste. Therefore, I wish uh, uh, everyone a fruitful uh, uh, Congress uh, and days, uh, and uh, I will uh, again uh, thank you for your presence here today. I wish you a wor good work and a pleasant days. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, um, uh, Michele, and I think. The next uh, talk is uh, Krishnan uh, online. How does this work? I don't know. OK. 
Krishna, are you there somewhere? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Krishnan here. Yes. Uh, we cannot hear very well. You can. Can you hear me now? Uh, barely. So you can speak. If you can speak a little louder, it would be better. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. Hello. Yes. So oh, it's okay. Is it audi Am I audible you. now? Yeah, you're audible and visible, which is good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, dear esteemed uh, dignitaries. Uh, in ICTP, Dr. Filippo Jarji, Atish Dabolkar, Sylvania Deniala, the Councillor of Trieste, and uh, other distinguished colleagues at ICTP. And uh, here we have many distinguished uh, dignitaries, Dr. Sanjay, who's at the Cordex Sat, uh, Dr. Mandira Sreshta, uh, point of contact, Dr. Um, Lalu Das, and uh, Dr. Dairaku Koji, and uh, we have very distinguished participants at, and uh, here participating at the IATM hub. So I join my uh, predecessors in extending a very warm welcome to all of you to the WCRP International Conference on Regional Climate, ICRC CARDEX 2023, which is jointly organized by the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP at Trieste, and the Indian Institute of uh, Tropical Meteorology, IATM Pune in India. It is uh, clear that human-induced climate change has led to rapid and widespread changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere, and is already affecting many weather and climate extremes across the globe. This is from the IPCC AR6 sixth assessment report. And now we have the global average temperature during July and August 2023, which was for two consecutive months, which was one and a half degrees higher as compared to the mean temperature for the pre-industrial period, 1850 to 1900. So already climate change is there. It's a reality. It's already happening. And as the climate continues to warm, we are witnessing more frequent and more intense extreme weather events such as heat waves, extreme precipitation, droughts and floods, tropical intense tropical cyclones, etc. And many places around the world experienced flood producing unusually heavy rainfall in 2023 uh, due to extreme weather, for example, in East Asia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, northern parts of India, Libya, very recently, areas in the Mediterranean, North, North America, Brazil and so on. So it's, it's happening all over the world. And in 2022, Pakistan witnessed devastating floods, which were preceded by intense pre-monsoon heat waves, melting of glaciers in the northern mountainous regions, and long monsoon rains, which delivered phenomenal amounts of water over the region. Also, the probability of compound extreme events and their cascading impacts have risen in several regions. Regional climate information is more than ever needed for decision making on, so, on societal issues such as vulnerability and adaptation to a changing climate with weather and water extremes. From this perspective, the ICRC CARDEX 2023 is a very important international conference for not only improving the scientific understanding of regional climate change issues, but also transforming this knowledge to develop reliable regional climate information to respond to societal and policy needs through global partnerships. And uh, truly we are, uh, we are standing up to this mission by having this uh, joint uh, meeting, joint session of the ICRC uh, from two different parts of the world, one at ICTP and one at IATM. So the joint sessions of ICRC 2023 at two physical hubs at ICTP Trieste and IATM Pune in a hybrid format is indeed an excellent opportunity for interaction of a large number of participants between the two hubs. I extend my very best wishes for productive deliberations during the ICRC 2023 conference and wish the event a grand success. Thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Krishnan. As uh, Krishnan said, uh, there are two hubs to this conference. Uh, we have the Trieste hub and the um, Pune hub. I think there are about uh, 500 participants between the two hubs and the online uh, participants. So it's uh, pretty much as, as large as the, as the previous ones that we had. The next uh, speaker, I think it's uh, Nana Brown. Actually, Nana is one, I would say, a success story of ICTP because she has been a uh, student here, a postdoc, and uh, now she's a vice chair of uh, the working group one of IPCC. She's having a tremendous career. Uh, so I want to congratulate Nana. I, know, I don't know if she's... Uh, oh. Is Nana around? Hold on a second. There's always a little... Uh... <laughs> Nana, are you there? Uh, Nana was online, but now she's not anymore. Maybe we can go to the next speaker and then I will congratulate uh, Nana afterwards. Um, so the next speaker is here. You can see him. Uh, his name is uh, Mario Ciancarini. Is uh, from the Italian electric uh, uh, company called Enel. So he's a, a stakeholder. If any of you has never seen a stakeholder, here is one. This mysterious, you know, <laughs> part of society <laughs> that we all talk about, but we never see it. Here's one. We have been working with uh, Enel actually for a number of years, and uh, they're actually using uh, Cordex data for real real world uh, decisions, which is uh, kind of impressive. So I think uh, Mario will share with us uh, some of the NL experience and maybe give us some advice on what the stakeholders need. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect, thank you. So today uh, I will show you our main data applications. Well, uh, NL is an energy company, so we, are into uh, power generation, power distribution, and retail sector. This is why I'm so glad to be here. So many phenomena affect us. I will give you uh, some highlights of, of our main data application, and then I will share with you some suggestions to that if implemented would help us in, uh, in our effort toward adaptation. Let's start. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to start. Some technical problem. Here we go. On the left side, this slide shows our approach to acute phenomena, such as windstorm, heat wave, icing, or also, also extreme rains. Well, we start with a preliminary screening because we need to assess uh, and select the sites that will be more affected by climate change. At this stage, we consider also the vulnerability of each technology to each phenomena. Then for the selected asset, we perform detailed analysis. At this stage, we consider also the specific characteristic of the asset, as much data as possible, high resolution data, and also a catalog of adaptation measures. And through a cost benefit analysis, we assess and select what actions need to be implemented and so included into adaptation plans. But on the right side, you can see also the chronic phenomena are important to us too. For example, we assess the impact of temperature on power demand. We assess the changes in heating and cooling needs, providing it as an input to an energy system model. Then the model consider also other assumptions such as transition scenarios and project expected changes in power demand. Finally, we work also on assessing the impact on power production. For example, we calibrate leveraging on uh, observed data, the changes in renewable productions 
using these link functions and also the observed resources and weather data. And then we use climate data to project the expected changes in power production in the long term. So these are our main applications. Now I will show you some suggestions that will all pass in our work. On the left of the slide, the slide shows uh, suggestions related to increase of analysis quality and coverage. For example, an ensemble expansion would help us, especially for scenarios RCP 4.5 or, or domains such as South America. For us, it's important also to keep working to extend the phenomena covered. For example, the hailstorm is really important to us and it's still hard to model. Then there are also other ideas that would be helpful also for beginner users, such as guidance on ensemble selections, or of course, working to unify as much as possible the data format. On the right, the slide shows other idea to foster data access and simplify it. For example, it would be helpful to select customized area for the download to make it lean. And also services like conversion format conversion services and bias correction services. Currently, we do perform these activities internally. We have also the partnership with ICTP, of course, but to foster other users would be really helpful, we, we think. Finally, on the right, I mentioned uh, technical support, but here I mean uh, a channel of dialogue with business users. In conclusion, I would highlight that we welcome any initiative to jointly develop services, workshops, studies. We know that climate change is a huge complex issue and requires a collaborative approach. So let's keep doing it together. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, do you know if Nana is online now? Uh, Nana, are you there? Give us a sign. Yes. Yes. Oh, hi. Peter Poya, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, how are you, Nana? First of all, let me congratulate <laughs> you on. Uh, Thank Thank you. In the in the IPCC bureau, that's really thank, a thank you very much achievement. So, uh, <laughs> thank uh, you. Okay, we cannot see you, but um, yeah, uh, you... I, I put my slide on. Okay, so um, if you want to just uh, tell us a few words on the IPCC, let yes. me say again that Nana is uh, vice chair of the IPCC. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group One. So she will give us a, uh, a sort of perspective from the IPCC side. And let me also say that it took a long time to actually get Cordex data into IPCC, uh, cool. believe me, because I've been in IPCC for like 25 years. And only in the last report, uh, really, it had a prominent uh, prominent uh, roles. So, uh, Nana, if you want to say a few words. Yeah. Thank you, Filippo, and glad to see you again. Thanks to all the organizers of the program. So, I will focus on IPCC and also uh, talk about Codex. Uh, we all know how the structure of the IPCC is, and all scientists are welcome to contribute at any level in the IPCC. So I started as a member of the um, a lead author in the working group one set assessment report from scoping to the end of the report. I also contributed on the task group on data support for climate assessment, which supported the AR6. So I welcome all the scientists, everyone to be part of this. And I want to show my focus in the, in the bureau uh, currently, as a as a working group one vice chair, I want to drive the effort of inclusivity in the IPCC. That's why I'm welcoming all of you. So this figure is a motivation for me and to all of us to contribute as much as possible on the content and data to the IPCC report. You see that there are many um, these hexagons 
represent the world. And most of the white areas are without data or limited data or with low, with low agreement of um, results from these regions, those areas. So those who are uh, yellow and green have increased in droughts, uh, agricultural drought or ecological drought. And then those of green has uh, decreased agricultural and ecological drought. So you see that all over the world, we're going to battle with drought in the future. And for Africa, most places in Africa, there's no much information. And thus it's a worry because most of our economics in Africa depend on agriculture, which is driven really around uh, rainfall variability. So after the, uh, the IPCC 2015 report, the fifth assessment report, uh, the UNFCCC requested IPCC to uh, develop or write a, um, a special report on 1.5. And there were a lot of questions asked and uh, we got answers. I'm happy that the, the Codex community contributed massively towards. So I use this opportunity to thank the Codex, um, the Swedish government as well, and ICTP for the massive support given to the Codex community, which was able to eventually get into the IPCC uh, reporting system. I have benefited greatly from the IPCC, I've benefited greatly from Codex and my team from the African group. We didn't used to have a lot of um, the Africans participating in the IPCC at all levels, but thankfully through Codex, we have scientists who have contributed to the IPCC report and also in terms of content. So we have had lead authors and most of them are connected with Codex and a lot of them also are connected with ICTP. So I use this opportunity to thank and also uh, request that we continue to work more and especially with the least developed countries and developing countries to get their contribution. As the last speaker said, the climate system is global and we can't leave any region out. So this is my uh, motivation and I hope we all will continue to encourage each other and support as much as possible for inclusivity in the IPCC report. The report is what is used to make most of the decisions that we have around the world. So to all of us, thank you. And I hope we'll continue to collaborate going forward. Thank you, Filippo. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Nana. It's really nice to see you. Actually, now we can we can <laughs> see you in, uh, in a small <laughs> corner. But uh, I'm really happy to see you. Uh, you. At this point, we have two more online. Uh, we're supposed to have two more online uh, contributions from uh, uh, Bjorn Stevens and uh, Detlef Stammer. I don't know <clears throat> any of them is. Uh, do you know if they are online? Okay, so Bjorn, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can, can hear you. Hear you. Me? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, I will start my video and share my screen if that's okay. Um, and uh... Sorry, Bjorn is. Uh, <clears throat> it's. Uh, it's. Um one of the heads of the Max Planck Institute in uh, in uh, Hamburg. So thank you very much, Filippo. And I wanted to thank um, all the dignitaries on the stage and in the audience for the chance to present very briefly this idea of Earth virtualization engines, which some of you may have heard of. Um, I will cut right to the chase and um, start with this this point that a lot of people have been thinking for a long time at least 15 years, um, of how to give an institutional footing to international cooperation in climate science, something that's similar to what happens regularly in other fields, but which climate science doesn't have. And I just have to name facilities like the Euro European Molecular Biology Lab, um, ITER, CERN, ESA. These are all 
forms of international cooperation that, uh, that allow the participant communities to access resources that allow them to punch well above their weight. So the question is, um, we don't have anything like this in climate science, and should we? So people have been asking that for some time. And so what we decided to do was in Berlin to gather a group of people who you can see on the left. Um, you can also download this paper. I'll provide a link later. Um, a, a, a wide cross section of people from the community to meet for five days to really discuss in three days in intense breakout groups as to whether we should do something about this. And we came up with this statement, which I'll read to you. It's taken from the paper where EVE, what we call Earth Virtualization Engines, um, this is a statement of the summit, envisions a world where everyone knows how climate and climate change affects them, where this knowledge empowers them to act. The idea is that by generating entirely new and inherently better sources of information, EVE would catalyze a change in the broader ecosystem of data and services to help deliver a just, equitable, and scientifically grounded basis for action. So that's what EVE wants to do. And the idea we came up with for how to do it to meet those goals was through an international federation of centers of excellence, so more than one, to empower all people to respond to the immense and urgent challenges posed by climate change. Each of these centers of excellence should, and here we listed five things, use the best available science to continuously grow and refresh a data space with small ensembles of kilometer scale, multi-decadal global climate projections the basis for people to imagine the future. Um, we should establish and maintain equitable access to the space of data and software so that everyone can use it. These centers should support and encourage the innovative use of data to generate information, particularly on global, um, on local climate impacts, something the Cortex community is very familiar with and has lots of expertise. We should cooperate, not replace, existing operational climate services, as well as research infrastructures, to amplify both their own and EVE's impacts. And we must, and this is very fitting for being at ICMTP, is include a strong component of well-tailored capacity development, outreach, and exchange. The premises of the Earth Virtualization Engines I listed here is, 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 is six. Um, one is that knowledge is nice, um, but people need information. They're making decisions every day and they need the best we can deliver in terms of what the future might look like. The second point is that today's computers are powerful enough to run, most people don't realize this, but most of the computers we have today could run small multi-decadal ensembles, multi-model of global coupled simulations at the kilometer scale. Um, but an ability to access them and use them for this purpose is something that an individual center cannot do. If we want to use these technologies, we have to cooperate. We've also seen how machine learning provides a way to interact with enormous amounts of data, um, and it lowers the threshold for involving people in the information extraction from the data. Um, and this sets the foundation for interactivity. So we have wholly new potentials to use climate data to create climate information. We recognize that a handful of centers will be needed, just um, not only to engage talent and to link different communities and access different um, data, but also to fill the data space. It would go beyond the, the capacity of any individual center, even if it was, a, a, say, a single big center in the global north. Um, so we need more than one. The other thing I, that, that, that struck many of us is that building new institutions creates a possibility to structure and locate them in ways that better develop capacity and engage local data providers at the forefront of the science. So the idea was, was Eve, is this gives us a new chance to develop capacity and, and engage global communities. And finally, we recognize there's an existing and vibrant climate um, service community. Eve, could in no means uh, 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 supplant them, but what it needs to do is support them. It needs to engage and support the climate service communities that already exist with quality control, traceable, and professionally prepared data streams. I'm sure um, we didn't think of everything, but a lot of people gave it a lot of thought, and we tended to think about a, a great deal more than most people give, it, give us credit for. So I will just say here the next steps is we're proposing um, a EVE purport, preparatory project um, two years to kind of work out how this would function. 
And one of the things where I think in this project, it was that we go from a project office to an implementation plan that's particularly relevant to this community is some of these things that we talk about here, like in the inner circle of these real world laboratories. If we, if we create this enormous data spaces, how can we work with different communities to, to, to learn to use these best? And here, Cordex has immense expertise and would be of a great benefit. And so I will end here. Um, you can scan that, 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 that um, QR code if you would like to download the EVE document. But I will I'll end here where, where I began. And with the question is that, yes, we should cooperate to access the, the best and biggest technologies to advance our understanding of climate. And, and we must. And Berlin, if anything, it took the first step to creating a platform, uh, a framework, where communities like Cordex, we will be in Kigali next month, where we can begin to try to fine tune its shape so that this serves um, all of us as well as possible. So thank you very much um, for your attention and for inviting me. Thanks very much, uh, Bjorn, and uh, good luck with the EVE uh, um, enterprise. Uh, now we have, or we should have, Detlef uh, Stammer. Is he online? Detlef, are you there? Uh, while he connects, uh, Detlef is a professor at the University of Hamburg, but he's also the uh, chair of the Joint Scientific Committee of uh, WCRP, the World Climate Research Program. And the WCRP has been uh, instrumental, actually, in setting up uh, Cordex uh, from the very beginning and uh, in supporting it uh, over the years. So we uh, really need to thank uh, WCRP and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Detlef's uh, uh, sort of perspective on the future of Cordex. Can Detlef? you hear me? There he is. Yeah, I'm here and I hope you can see my screen. Um, I, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, actually um, welcome all honorable guests and, and um, all the delegates um, at this um, fifth um, Codex conference. It's actually the second I'm um, attending. Um, some of you might remember the, the one in Beijing where I also, um, uh, in fact, uh, stayed a few days. And I would like to, first of all, endorse everything that had been said, including what, what Bjorn just said, but uh, actually come back um, kind of a little bit to um, down to earth work um, and maybe the conference ahead of you. Uh, and, and remind you all, in fact, how, how central um, Codex is for, it is a, an element of WCRP and it's very central actually to what, what we need to do. And I think the urgency also was, uh, was mentioned before. It is an international conference on regional climate. Um, and uh, so, so the, the importance of Codex for um, many of the things that WCRP is, is aiming to do um, it can, for instance, be demonstrated here or illustrated by uh, showing the mission, develop, share, and apply the climate knowledge uh, 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 that contributes really to the social well-being of society. Uh, very central, in fact, to also what, what Bjorn just mentioned, but Codex is, is, is very important. Um, if it comes to um, the, uh, uh, the, the objectives of, of WCRP over the next decade, bridging climate uh, science and society, again, an element where Codex um, is very essential to actually be a pilot um, in what evolves um, in addition. Now, um, very briefly, and I don't want to actually uh, impinge here a lot on structure, but for, for those who might be new to WCRP or also new to, in fact, the new WCRP, this is shown here, the structure. Essentially, we have core projects uh, and we have lighthouse activities. And um, core projects um, has now two new elements, really very important. First of all, Earth system modeling and observations. This is an integrated way. And second of all, regional information for society. And then the lighthouse activities I will come back to because it's also very essential. Now, the, the core project, um, really, I want to highlight two things. First of all, the regional information for society is a new core project, regional information for society, really what we need on the regional basis, local basis. And you see Cordex really become, had become, an, a, in, in fact, an agreement with Cordex and a central element of this new core project. So it's really 
a cortex has been ele elevated really to a new role within WCRP and to develop regional information for society. And in fact, I see really a pilot role of, of cortex in this for more development within WCRP. And the other thing is ESMO, it's Earth System Modeling and Observations, really, really um, is concerned with uh, improving climate models. And improving climate models has many aspects. It's not just a resolution. Of course, it is resolution, but also more reality, more skill in predicting um, extremes, um, weather events, many things. And you need, in fact, also more processes, including, for instance, getting glaciers and uh, the water cycle improved, many things. And again, Cortex, in fact, through already running very high resolution models can in fact help us a lot to understand what we need to do for very high resolution models on global scales. And again, the pilot activity. And along these lines, these are our lighthouse activities. These are big flagships. These are big efforts that we want to do together by all the corporate decks. I'm really addressing very important part. And there are uh, kind of four I want to highlight. First of all, explaining and predicting the Earth system change. Cortex is about really a lot about about understanding um, processes on a regional local scale. So I think uh, in a, a collaboration with this core uh, lighthouse activity, very important. Digital Earth, it's really kind of a, a developing a digital twin to the Earth. I mean, this to some extent what, what Bjorn is talking about, it's really what WCRP is aiming for here um, in, in many respects. Um, and um, so again, Cortex can actually be a pilot in helping us do this. A new lighthouse activity, and this is what I really want to highlight here to this community you might have not have heard about, is um, uh, uh, WCRP just created two new lighthouse activities. One is GPEG's Global Precipitation Experiment and uh, associated with this year of precipitation. I think Cortex can be a pilot really in improving the, the hydro hydrological cycle and, and helping us to really predict the precipitation better, the extremes and the uh, water cycle, the dry the extreme, the precipitation, monsoons come in at some point as well. And then climate intervention, this is not where we want to actually uh, propagate the use of climate intervention, but we want to investigate the, the risks, the, the danger may be um, all elements of climate intervention. Again, Cortex, in fact, um, hopefully can actually help us here to understand the, the possible impacts also on local and regional scale. Um, the, the future, um, we have heard about it. I don't want to dwell much about it. Um, extremes will be really um, an element that we all expect to increase. Um, this is rain, flooding, heat waves, uh, um, extreme weather. Uh, Krishnan already touched on this, and I think Codex can be very important. And with this, I really would like to wish you all the best and good luck for your conference, um, but also reminding you, um, Bjorn mentioned this already, the conference in Kigali coming up next month, Open Science Conference on for Advancing Climate Science for a Sustainable Future. I hope that actually at the end of your week, you all pack your luggage and come to Kigali and actually bring kind of really input from your conference into Kigali that can be used to really uh, produce a conference statement. And we really hope that, that you've already come prepared and give us really a lot of insight on what uh, Codex can bring in. With this, I really would like to stop and I stop also sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Detlef, um, and good luck to the new activities in WCRP. Believe it or not, we are almost on time. So we have the grand finale here with uh, the two co-chairs of uh, Cordex. I don't know how you want to organize your, your uh, Daniela Jacob and uh, Silvina. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning and a very warm welcome from myself but also on behalf of Silvina, of course, who will talk in a minute, but also on behalf of the scientific advisory team of Codex. First of all, I would like to say that this conference is a very important conference to honor Filippo's work. I would like to mention this here right at the beginning to make very clear that without your engagement, we would not be here. <laughs> so.
So then I would like to also welcome our guests in Pune and the guests and participants. And I think this is a real new way of carrying out our Cortex conference because it is not just listening hybrid somewhere, but we do have two equally uh, set up hubs with equal set of agendas where we have parts of joint agendas and parts of, of uh, uh, local agendas. And I think this is great. And thank you very much to the organizing and to the IPOC for carrying out this and being making make this conference happen in this very, very international and sustainable uh, way. So thank you very much. So why are we here today? What do we want? I would like to say a few words about what we would like to achieve. It's not a, a listen only conference for you. So the idea is to uh, go through the program and find out in the dialogue where and how will the future of Cortex be designed and what are our major areas we want to go to and what are the challenges we are having ahead of us. And I'm very glad to head you here to opening to the opening session and also Krishnan in Pune with the very distinguished guests uh, for the opening session and during the conferences. So we have a few challenges. We would like Silvina and I, we are very ambitious and we would like to get something good out of the conference. And Detlef just mentioned it, one of our main aim here is to come up with some key messages from this conference here, which we will put to the Kigali conference, where we can make a clear statement on the role of regional climate knowledge and regional climate expert uh, being active in the different communities worldwide, in the scientific communities of WCRP, in the IPCC community, and in the practitioners com community, where we, where we experience the changes in weather and climate daily, on a daily basis. So we, have, we are in a, in a very critical moment of time. We, we need to find ways to support a just and sustainable lifestyle for the future. And if we do our century simulations, we go beyond 2100. We are all getting a bit older, but also more experienced and more connected. So where are we, what, what we would like to see? We are starting today with the science part in the A sessions to get the insights and find out where are our challenges? Is it still the coupling of all components? Is it the very high resolution, the convective scale permitting modeling? Is it the, the kilometer scale, uh, what we just heard from the EVE initiative? Where are the challenges? Where are we heading to? Where is the added value and, and can we do this in a sustainable way so that we are not wasting resources economically, social and ecologically. The second point is <clears throat> where are the, the, the gaps if we, if we want to continue with coordinated experiments. We learned a lot from the coordinated experiments scientifically, but they are also providing a source for development for all over the world. And it is a tremendous important um, part. And Filippo, thank you for starting this uh, coordinated activities uh, on a continental scale. So the question is, do we need smaller domains with higher resolution? How can we connect to other activities in WCRP, which are similarly set up? And how can we best provide information to help society cope, to cope with climate change? on an international basis, having in mind that we have to push for capacity development. We really have to push for capacity development in all parts of what Cortex community is working on. So we will discuss this a little bit. I would like to give a big thank to the flagship pilot studies. They are doing a great job. It's a very well designed, very efficient, um, instrument within Cortex, and we will also discuss with you um, what is there an added value? Sure, there is an added value, but where are the challenges with the flagships? Did everything work out as you wanted to, or is there, have you experienced some barriers? And can the flagship pilot studies be an anchor to 
get uh, implemented uh, on a finer scale some operational coordinated activities on the kilometer scale modeling, for example. And then, of course, there's the entire question about how can we inform impact and adaptation community with trustful, reliable, useful, and usable information. And this is where we connect, of course, as part of RIFS, we connect to the climate service community, to the adaptation community. The Adaptation Future Conference started also, or is starting uh, next Monday, I guess, so and that is a very, very interesting community of practitioners and scientists to work with. So the connection to society, the connection to the impact scientific society, and then to the, to the non-scientific society is also part of our agenda. Silvina, you want to step up? Okay, okay. Thank you, Daniela. I think you almost said it all. Um, I want to, again, welcome all of you to here to this uh, big conference. I welcome all participants in PUNE all also. And uh, I really like to encourage all people to interact and participate during our insight sessions, which are uh, uh, dedicated to think about how we deal with the future challenges with, within the coldest community. So I would very much like you to, to to hear from you uh, and to participate in these important discussions. Because as you know, Cordex, um, uh, we, we are the two co-chairs. Uh, there is a scientific advisory uh, team, the SAT, uh, but the community uh, 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 efforts are, are the main uh, part of the Cordex uh, uh, endeavor. So, and the community is you. So you, uh, we need you uh, here participating uh, interacting and uh, uh, your inputs are very, very important for us. So I, I would like to thank you uh, in advance for your participation here. Uh, I would also like to, to mention um, another issue that maybe Daniela didn't, didn't brought up, uh, which is that this component uh, of the, how important has Cordex been and how can we improve um, the ability of use the Cordex data produced by simulations uh, with models, with uh, statistical downscaling tools, any, any approach uh, for impact. And how, how can we provide um, a, an actionable information for impact analysis that then can be used to inform society and to uh, produce adaptation uh, options like those we have here recently from uh, these guys here, uh, Mario and, um, and uh, Michel, Mikel. So uh, thank you very much for being here. I will come back to Daniela with some uh, administrative messages. Thank you very much, Serena. And before I pass the microphone to Filippo to close the session, I would like to mention three things here. First, I just want to let you know that the Cordex data has made it into the EU regulations. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the stock-based big companies, worldwide acting companies, have to carry out an EU taxonomy. And if you look into the, into the regulations for the EU taxonomy, you will find the, the reference to CMIP and Cordex. I think this is a tremendous success, which you all have made and which we should celebrate here. I think this is really, it, it is a success, but it's also a duty for us to carry on and to develop even further reliable and more usable information. In order to do this, we will listen to all your talks. So please upload your PowerPoints if you haven't done it yet. And uh, those of you who are co-chairing and who were supposed to meet with us at 9 a.m., please come here just after we've closed the session. We will meet now here on this desk. But before, I'd like to pass the microphone to Filippo. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> By the way. By the way, Silvina has a last name, <laughs> Solman. <laughs> Everybody says Silvina, but yes. Uh, just a couple of uh, uh, 
Thanks to remind you. I think this this evening we have a icebreaker event, and it's here in the terrace. Or do you know where it is? Yeah. Also, let me remind for people who have signed up for the Thursday evening event, you need to get uh, tickets um, at the front desk, not of this building, but of the other building, and try to do it by today because the restaurant. The place where we're meeting uh, wants to have an exact number of participants by by the end of the day today. So please, uh, you know, go there and pay the ticket and and get the ticket, which we you will have restaurant. Um, Irene, I don't know if you want to say something logistically. Uh, it's a pretty complex setup. There are many meeting rooms. I hope you all sort of uh, will become familiar with it uh, as time goes on. There are some rooms here, some rooms in the um, Leonardo building. Uh, so maybe Irene will say a few words uh, about that. Thank you and welcome from my side as well. I'm, uh, well, you will see my name as Irene Lake, but it's really Irene Locke in Swedish which will be hard to pronounce for some of you, I know. So Irene Lake is fine. Uh, anyway, welcome from me also, and I hope you all enjoy this week here in Trieste. And regarding um, some issues, if you want to ask for directions, I won't be able to give you because I'm still a bit lost in these buildings. I'm, I may know the name of the rooms, but I couldn't point you in the right direction. So please follow the signs and take a look at the program online and also ask the ICDP staff because they can give you the right directions to the rooms. But make this sure- It's not 100% true because if you ask me, <laughs> some rooms, I have no idea where they are. So because the name have changed over time. <laughs> so- uh... <laughs> Yeah, try to, try to find someone who looks at home. Um, uh, anyway, um, we will have a good week and we will have the coffee breaks and then we will have the, the lunches in the cafeteria in the Leonardo building and the posters today will also be in that area. So make sure you, uh, you put your posters up there in the Leonardo building in the cafeteria and terrace there area. And for other directions, uh, please ask the uh, the ICTP staff, as I said, and also make sure you know the fire access you see up here, two on the sides, and I think maybe there's one up there as well. Um, and uh, other things regarding, yes, as I said, the icebreaker tonight in the at the terrace as well, and then uh, if there are any changes, we'll let you know. So, yeah, have a really nice week and welcome here. Good to see you all. Okay. I think uh, the weather should be nice for the rest of the week, so enjoy Trieste as well. And uh, now we have a coffee break and then the different sessions. Thank you very much. And now, uh, I think the for Trieste, it is a coffee break for half an hour, uh, which uh, according to the schedule, it will end in uh, hour 2, 2.30. And we, then after 2.30, there is another session, on, the first session on uh, A1, on the earth system modeling in regional con context. So we'll be again joining back to ICTP uh, from uh, 2.30 to 4 o'clock. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, for us, we, we will be having the health break plus uh, the first session of posters have been put, the A4 posters. Uh, Lightning talks on that posters on the on the A4 session posters. So, who would like to 
the in that poster session who would like to give a short presentation are welcome and may please report to the chair dr sopna panikar please could i please ask the session chairs to come here to the desk no coffee for you at the moment you will be at the end of the line session chairs flagship pilot people please come those who were ex expected to be here at 9 a.m and meet with us please come to the desk thank you A quick announcement for participants: those who want to uh, submit their TA claims tomorrow, it will be arranged in the uh, uh, Varamil uh, Varamir Hall reception area. So between sixteen hours to seventeen hours, you all can submit your TA claims. Thank you. Just open it and speak.
Genau, ja, an. Ja, online. Ne?
Okay, good morning, everybody. Please take your seats, get ready. We are about to start the session, otherwise we are running too late. Everybody have a seat, please. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started with session A1 on regional earth system modeling. Um, thank you for being here, waiting for a few more people to take their seats. I'll be co-chairing the session. My name is Melissa Bukowski. I'll be working with Klaus Gerken here. Um, we also have two great rapporteurs helping us summarize messages from the session, Daniel Abel and Henry Pinheiro, who is not sitting in front. Yes down there. Thanks for your help today. They'll also be helping run microphones around for questions. We do have a packed session. So if you have really deep probing questions you'd like to bring up for discussion, we may ask you to hold them to tomorrow's session um, on future scientific challenges and our summary messages from this session. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Samuel Samo who will be talking about something, your title is not actually on the agenda. It will be on the slide. So it, it'll be a surprise. Thanks. Yeah. So I've been invited by the by the organizer to give an overview talk about the regional earth system model. So I will speak about definition, which will remain uncertain, sorry for that. Uh, I will speak about the benefits and I will speak also about the challenges for the Cordex community if we want to uh, use more and more and develop a, a regional earth system model within the community. So I will start with this very well-known, uh, let's say, regional climate improvement dilemma. So if you want to put your workforce in regional climate model development, you have to choose between developing the physics, increasing the resolution, increasing the complexity, or developing large ensemble to study uncertainty. Since the beginning, I say that the Cordex initiative has put most of uh, his efforts in two of these axes. So high resolution, for example, with the FPS and convection, and large ensemble for the international coordination and the delivering of robust assessment. But then it means that most of the simulation today in Cordex are, as a, are atmosphere and land surface regional climate model simulation and the complexity, the increase in complexity has been a bit outside of the scope uh, of the first phases. And it is where comes regional earth system model that, that is one of the tools, let's say, that can fill the gap towards the increase in complexity. The problem is Preparing this talk, I realized that there is no clear definition for regional earth system model. It's not in the IPCC glossary, for example, whereas earth system model is or regional climate model is. There is also no clear definition in the Cordex documents. Sometimes they are called regional climate system model, as in the Met Cordex community uh, to which I belong. Or they can be called also atmosphere ocean regional climate model. And I think that the infancy of regional earth system model were the atmosphere ocean regional climate model during the, the year 2000s. So I try to give you my definition. So I would say that in theory, our system model should be regional earth system model be, should be holistic regional climate model or comprehensive regional climate model that would couple the full representation of the regional climate system with the human society, also in its full complexity, in order to tackle what is called earth system science questions. Well, I mean, we are not at that stage yet, that's for sure, even if you can see the word regional earth system model now more and more in the community. So I would say that in practice today, there are complex regional climate models for which on the top of atmosphere and simple land surface uh, model, you add the high resolution representation and the high frequency coupling of other components. So you can pick uh, whatever you want in the list, so ocean, human activity, sometimes aerosols, sometimes cities, cryosphere, but never everything together. 
What I would like to say also is that those kind of complex regional climate models are now more and more in use in the community. You see uh, coming literature, a large bunch of literature. They have been used in some of the Cordex FPS. And you can find statements and references, at least in the chapter 10 of IPCC IR6. So you have two nice uh, vision of what the uh, Earth system model can be. So Paolo Ruti's vision with Lego and uh, the, the logo of the regional climate system model we are using at Chinois. So the definition is clearly uncertain, but I think the benefits are clear. So there are for me two uh, big families of benefits. So first one is that those complex regional climate models can really improve the information that standard regional climate model from Cordex can provide over land. And there are three different ways of doing so. So you can, I think they can improve the representation of key forcing uh, of the regional climate over land. For example, the regional seas, the aerosols, the non-use. They can also modify the regional climates because they are representing new, new feedbacks, new feedback loops. And you can, with them, test new what-if scenario that you cannot test with the atmosphere standalone regional climate model. I will give you illustration hereafter. And there is a second family of uh, benefits. That is the fact that you can provide information for new components of the climate system that were not represented in uh, Cordex. So it means interacting with new communities, developing new knowledge. Also, why not providing new climate services and, and touching new users? So let's start with illustration, I hope. Yeah, the quality of the figure is okay. So let's start with an illustration about better forcings. So here is a typical convection permitting regional climate model that we will be running in climate mode at 2.5 kilometers uh, in my institute. And we can wonder what is the source of information we will use over the sea areas for this specific domain in INCAST mode and also in scenario mode. So if we follow the, the CORDEX standard protocol or the FPS convection protocol, we will be using low resolution data sets as they're coming from um, either coming from reanalysis or from the low resolution ocean component of GCM. So this is what you have here for the climatological uh, SST pattern and here for the climate change signal. So the land sea mask is not very well reproduced. There are a lot of uh, points that are land or mixed land sea. We, you don't know exactly what to, to get as an information and there is no special structure in the SST. Also the climate change signal for this part of the domain is quite uh, homogeneous, is quite flat. But then if you switch now to high resolution ocean regional climate model that can be coupled with the atmosphere model, you end to start to get a small scale pattern in the SST feature. And also you can get pattern, small scale pattern in the climate action scenario. So for example, here we have an enhanced warming uh, in the Balearic Sea, or here a weakened warming along the Croatian coast. And this may have impacts on the climate of the island, on the extreme uh, precipitation along the coast, and also on phenomena such as Medicaid uh, that are now well known with uh, the, the former Libyan events and that are uh, very strongly sensitive to SST and RC coupling. What is true for the spatial pattern with SST uh, is also true for another forcing of the regional climate is the temporal resolution or the day-to-day -day, uh, day -day variability of aerosols. So in my team, we have studied a lot the way aerosols are represented in a regional climate model. And here I'm giving you an example uh, for a time series. So it's a three months uh, period. It's a daily time series of aerosol optical death for the Lampedusa Island, a small island south of Italy, where you have in red observation. In green, it's a regional climate model with prognostic aerosols. So aerosols are emitted, transported, uh, deposited, and so on by the model. And in blue, you have the the standard uh, Cordex way of representing aerosol, which is climatology. So as you can see, the day-to-day -day variability is much higher with the prognostic aerosol, especially over the Lampedusa Island because you have dust event passing. Well, I mean, aerosol, we don't really care in Cordex, but this transmits, this translates into a change in the day-to-day -day variability for uh, surface shortwave radiation. And this is what is illustrated here where you have two PDF, it's a long term, so it's a more than 30 year average uh, daily PDF of the surface solar radiation average over the Mediterranean area. And you see that the PDF are quite different with a larger uh, PDF for the prognostic, uh, prognostic aerosol regional climate model and a more picky uh, PDF when you use climatology. And this is due to the fact that in a regional climate model with a prognostic aerosol, you have new days. You have dusty, cloudy days where the, the level of uh, radiation is very low 
And on the other side of the spectra, you have clean, clear days, days where you have no cloud, no aerosols, and that enlarge the variability. And this may have potential impacts on the ecosystem if they rely on photosynth photosynthesis and also on the photovoltaic energy production. So it's another example on how regional earth system model or complex regional climate model can bring better forcing for the climate overland. Now let's switch about uh, feedback loops. So with such a model, you can also um, study because you represent new feedback loop. So here is an example where we use a complex regional climate model that coupled atmosphere, land, river, and ocean for the Mitchman area, and in which we have done a test adding aerosols again. So this is the AOD map, uh, which has this pattern over the Mitchman area. It's a summer. Then when you add such a pattern of AOD in your model, you get a direct aerosol radiative forcing at the surface for the short wave, which is negative. And in a standard regional climate model, this leads to a cooling of two meter temperature over land. But then when you have a more complex model with SST interactive, then you activate another loop of feedback, which is this one, because this radiative forcing leads to a cooling of the SST that then activate the water cycle. So cooling of the SST lead to a decrease in the latent heat loss. So you have less evaporation over the sea as expected, then less specific humidity over the sea, but this is advected over land and less precipitation. In addition, you have another, another loop here where the cold SST lead to colder air above the sea that is then advected over land and reinforce uh, the signal over land. So with this new loop, this, this kind of model, first you can study the new feedback loop that is scientifically interesting, and then you can influence the climate overland. Something else we can do with such a more complex model is new what-if scenario. So this is a, a slide just for Daniela because I, I know she likes what-if scenario. So in this model, what do we do? So we use a regional climate model that has a complex land surface module, meaning interactive vegetation, uh, CO2 fertilization effects, deep hydrology, surface hydrology, everything coupled. And it was for answering a very recent request from an operational user, local users, that was willing to assess if they plant more trees in their very small region in France. So it's uh, the so-called Gers region, it's here, it's a very small region in France. Toulouse is just east of that. Will we mitigate climate change for, for the small area in France? So we were trying to answer this question. I mean, we are far from answering anything, but we tried. So for that, we set up a Eurocordex like experiment at 12 kilometers. We put, I mean, we put the model at a global warming level two, so around 2050. And then we apply a drastic afforestation test. It's a bit too strong. I don't think the, the people can do it in the real life, but it was to see the, the effects. So we went from a, a forest cover over the Gers area of 17% to 80%. And we look how it influenced the local climate change. What we obtained, we obtained a decrease in the extreme temperature change. So we mitigate the increase of the extreme. And also we mitigate the drying. So here you have the, the precipitation value in summer over the Gers area, the small department in France. In the SSP at global warming level two, you have a drying. But when you put trees, you mitigate this drying. So it's really interesting as a result. However, we also find that, first of all, the effects of afforestation is very complex, it depend on many, many processes, thermodynamic, dynamic, and so on. It depends on the season, so well, you are not mitigating the climate change effect every, at every season. It depends on the species of the tree you plant, and it depends also on the afforestation spatial scale. So on this figure, for example, here you mitigate the drying, but if you afforest the whole Europe, like in the Lucas uh, FPS protocol, then you increase the drying. You are not mitigating it. So this kind of model can really help to, to investigate new uh, what-if scenario and then answering new requests from users. So with such a model, you can also provide new climate information for the new component. So one that we are not taken into account uh, before in Cordex. So this is an example, for example, for marine heat waves uh, at sea in front of the city of Marseille, which is a big city south of France. They are bubble graph. So I don't know if you know bubble graph, but one every bubble is a marine heat wave that has been detected either in the observation or in the model in a space that covers the duration of the marine heat wave, the maximum intensity, and the color is the severity. Um, the blue bubble are the ones that were observed. So it's satellite data. In 2022, where we had a record marine heat wave in the Mediterranean area. 
And the other bubble are from the model, the couple system, for two global warming levels. So this is global warming level one, which is nowadays, let's say, so it's present climate. And on this side is global warming level four, so a very uh, extreme uh, warming level. And each time the blue uh, bubble are the observed one. So what we obtain as a conclusion is that uh, the observed marine heat wave were really matching or correspond to the strongest marine heat wave we can simulate with the model for present climate. So, so we are really the toppest record we can have today. But they may become very weak events if we reach, uh, uh, fortunately, I hope we will not reach this global warming level, but they become very weak events if we reach uh, the global warming level four. And this, when I'm showing this kind of uh, plot to a marine protected area manager, they told me, yes, this is useful for us. Because then we know that we, we need to adapt to such an event. It's not something we will not come back, that will not come back. But if we reach this warming level, then we will have to completely revisit it, the way we manage marine protected area. And now, with such a model, we can also provide such information for cities. So here we are using a kilometer scale regional climate model that include an advanced city module. It's a model that is used in particular in the framework of the FPS uh, Urb RCC. And we are producing a uh, detection of, of heat wave, this time for cities, but also for the rural area outside the city. So we are in Paris. In red, you have the heat wave for Paris. And in green, you have the heat wave detection for the rural area surrounding Paris. And again, it's a bubble graph. So duration, maximum intensity, and severity is the size of the bubble this time. So in present climate, you can see that the heat wave, as expected, are uh, more intense in the city than outside, but they are not longer. And what is interesting in this simulation is that when you go to high warming level, so this is the end of the 21st century for SSP 5L5, the difference in characteristics between the heat wave is decreasing between the, the city and the rural area, because in this model, the urban heat island decreases, because you can dry the soil of the rural area, but you cannot dry anymore the soil of Paris. So it's another example. I mean, this was just two illustrations of new climate information uh, you can extract from complex regional climate models. Now, I want to finish with what I do consider as the current challenges uh, for CORDEX, for the CORDEX community, if we want to develop and use more uh, complex regional climate models. And it's uh, filled with my personal advice also to be discussed this week. So four main challenges, definition, capacity building, standardization, and production of new knowledges. So definition first. My vision is that regional earth system models are only a natural development of regional climate models. So I will not go for trying to define it. I will just keep using regional climate models. Not sure everybody agree with that. And also because discussing with the people from the ESM community, it would be a long-term fight to define what is exactly a regional earth system model. Also, it has an implication is that it means that we will be able to mix regional climate model with different level of complexity in the same cordex ensemble. So for example, for the next zero cordex ensemble, some group will be using atmosphere land surface model, whereas at CNRM, we will have also interactive uh, aerosols in the model. And they will be all mixed in the same cordex ensemble. Then it's up to every cordex domain to define what is the minimum list of components you want to have for your cordex domain. So for example, in med cordex, we set as a minimum requirement atmosphere, ocean, river, and uh, land. That is coupled. It's mandatory. If you don't have this, you cannot enter med cordex club. But then you can add whatever component you want on the top of that. If the community don't want to follow my advice, which is very likely, then I <laughs> please spend time on defining what is the requirement to obtain the regional earth system label? Otherwise, it will be branding, it will be uh, whatever, but uh, I don't think it will be regional earth system model. Second challenge, capacity building. So in order to, to keep a good diversity in the, in the community, we will need to invest a lot of time in developing, but also maintaining, because it's difficult to maintain such a model and share a diversity of complex regional climate models that you can uh, move uh, in any area of the planet. And this, we need to acknowledge that this will take a lot of resources. We will also need to find the good way to interact with uh, existing modeling community for the new components. So oceanographer, uh, specialist of the city modeling, specialist of the cryosphere modeling. They are existing, they are somewhere, but they are not in Cordex. 
So we will need to find how to answer with them. And we also will need to develop a reference data set because evaluating such a model is much more complex than just evaluating uh, climate over land. We need also to prepare for multimodal studies and data access by the users. So we need to define variable lists for the new component. We need to define the file naming. We need to define specification and then be prepared for publication on the SGF. It also means that as a community, we need to develop good practices for the model documentation, especially if we don't call them regional alert systems. So if we call them regional climate model, it means we will need to have good documentation in order that the user of the model knows what is inside. So simulation protocol, probably, and good practice for model evaluation. And finally, I think it's also good to think how we will produce new knowledge. So the first point would be to, to ask every context domain to define what are the key scientific questions to be addressed with such a complex regional climate model. And also, what does it mean, complex regional climate model for a given context domain? Then to invest, to investigate what would be the benefits and the limitation of adding a new component that was never studied, I would propose to dedicate FPS as it was done today with the FPS RC, the FPS aerosol, the FPS on uh, Urb RCC. So I think it's a very good tool to address uh, a new component like uh, Glacier or I don't know, sea ice or whatever. But outside this, I would advise not to spend too much time on added value because if you spend a lot of time on added value, it means you spend a lot of your time on questions relating to model and not real life questions. So those complex regional climate models are also very good to address a real world scientific issue. And I think it's good to spend a lot of effort uh, answering real world scientific questions like studying feedback, what if scenario or robust assessment for the new components. And finally, as a community, we also have to start uh, delivering regional climate information with such a component, with such a new model. Imagine new climate services and also start to contact uh, what could be the new users of this new uh, climate information. So I, I thank you. I'm, st I'm stopping here. I'm open for questions and also for discussion during the whole week. Thank you very much. Thanks, Samuel. We have a few minutes for questions, comments, anyone. Thanks. Uh, Joseph Sictus, uh, when you were talking about the experiment with aerosols, was it mostly dust or are you talking about anthropogenic like sulfates and biomass burning and things like that where the solar radiation was? This one? Yes. So I, I did not put the domain on which, so Lampedusa Island is south of Italy. It's very influenced uh, by dust. So here, what you see is mostly dust events. Okay. And also the, the PDF here is done for the south Mediterranean domain, which is under the influence of dust. But within this model, we have uh, five different spaces of aerosol. So we have natural aerosol, but we also have anthropogenic aerosol. So sulfate and even now nitrate and ammonium. So you can do such uh, analysis also uh, north of Europe or anywhere else. But clearly here, the impact is the dust impact. Uh, Samuel, thank you very much for this very nice talk. So uh, not only for my slide, but, uh, but uh, thank you very much. I think this, uh, this is a good opening uh, for the scientific sessions now. And um, I think your, your personal advice here is quite interesting. Um, I mean, we can discuss about coupled models since, I mean, we, we're discussing it since decades, but I, I do, I really think it's good to push for it. I also like your, your layout uh, related to the FPS. I have one question here, which I would like to challenge you because it is on added value. And, um, and we, we, yesterday in the set, we discussed a little bit, uh, should we discuss added value? And uh, are we still um, in the position uh, to defend what we are doing through clearly showing that there is an added value. If I have listened to the opening session this morning, at least two out of 10 of the main opponents um, sound tremendous, co tremendously convinced about the importance of regional information and regional climate modeling. So I would even say um, we do not have to care about added value anymore. Would you agree? Yes. I'm obliged. I mean, it's very really rare that I agree with Daniela. So. <laughs> so, 
So I think it's why I, ch I have chosen the word benefits. So those models, they can be used for many things. So it's better. I mean, proving the added value is, by the way, is using the model for something interesting. And I think I remember uh, Hans von Storff in Lund some years ago saying the same. Stop looking for added value. Just use your model for something, which is a real world scientific question. So I, I would agree. So hi, this is uh, from IITM. Can we also ask some questions? Ah, from yeah, it's from Pune. You are getting from Pune, me. Go, go ahead. Yes. I was looking for you in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Here. <laughs> Uh, so, um, I am Pankaj Kumar, uh, and the point which I wanted to just discuss with you is that the model which you used is, um, has an ocean component as well? In some of my example, yes. The, the, the simulations which you talked about, the, the heat wave in the France, uh, urban and those things, yes. or it is a regional model coupled with an urban scheme? or it is also the ocean which is coupled there with the regional settings? On this example, uh, we are yeah. using uh, Medcordex med simulation. One, so it's regional climate model for the Medcordex domain. And for the Medcordex domain that I'm one of the members of the chairing committee, we are only use, using coupled systems. So we have only coupled ocean, atmosphere, river, and land surfaces, so, so yes. In such a model, we have a, we have a, a high resolution ocean model that is fully coupled. But this is okay. the case for every Metcordex simulation now. Okay, okay. Set this as a minimum requirement to participate to Metcordex. Okay, we will Thank take you. one more question. There were some competing hands up, so Daniel's going to choose over there. Sorry, Klaus. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, Sam. Uh, I just have a question regarding your uh, advices, because I like them, um, regarding the capacity building, because it takes a lot of resources to build and our ESM. And okay, you have one, I'm glad for you, but we don't. And so um, I'm wondering if you think that in the end, it's gonna um, lead to a decrease in the variability of modules, because people will connect with existing groups and so, for instance, if we want to add on an urban module, we're going to connect to a group that already has one. And in the end, we're going to see a lot of um, the common modules that can decrease the number of models that are available. Was it clear? Not, not so clear, but. Okay. En français, yes. Okay. No, no, but it's okay. But yes, yeah. I, I mean, it's a lot of resources to develop such a model. Yeah. And it's even more to maintain it. So to pass the change of the computer, for example, because you have different modules, you have different communities that you have to connect and they have to, I mean, you have to align the agenda of everybody. So clearly it's one of the weakness of such a model is that it is much more complicated to develop, maintain, and also to share. So for example, in my team, we have a very complex regional climate model, but we, we don't share it. It's too much complicated. So yeah, if but... somebody wants to use it, it can come on our computer, but we are not able to port it somewhere else. No, but if, uh, like if we want to add an urban module, we're going to connect to a group that has already that already has developed an urban module. So in the end, we're going to have the same module as they do. And because it's so complicated, like in 10 or 15 years, everybody is going to have the same modules. Don't you think? It's no, I don't think so, because I mean, OK, it will probably decrease a bit the model biodiversity. But still, we have different groups developing urban module. We have different groups developing ocean model. We have different way of thinking aerosols. So I think we will keep diversity, but this is why one of my advice. So we need absolutely to keep diversity even for such a complex model. And by the way, we have the same problem with the convection permitting regional climate model. We decreased a lot the diversity of the modeling uh, group and modeling tools, but we have to, to make effort uh, to save this diversity. It's very important. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on. If you noticed, we gave Samuel a little extra time because our next speaker, to the best of our knowledge, is not here. That was William Cabos. So we're going to start with Frederick Desmet. And for these next speakers, we have 10 minutes with two minutes of questions. So it's going to go pretty quickly. And we will give you a sign when you have one minute left, okay? Thanks.
one. Uh, also, also one little remark for the online participants in Pune and everywhere else. Um, you can type an exclamation mark in the chat and we try to monitor the chat in Zoom so the online participants can also participate in the discussion. Thank you. May I start? Yeah. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Quentin uh, Quentin Desme, and uh, the work I will present is um, part of my uh, is a part of my PhD. And uh, you you will see this title is a little bit ambitious, but uh, uh, I will mostly present uh, how I configured a regional climate model a RC coupled model um, RC coupled regional model in Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, I will go very short on the introduction because Samuel uh, did a really nice job. And uh, I will just uh, present my uh, study area, which is Southeast Asia, as you can see here. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to say that, um, yeah, in the, in the area, the community is at a very early stage of uh, Earth system model. Um, and um, yeah, so far, the, what we can see in the literature is mostly only uh, ocean and atmosphere coupled regional model. Um, there is no more module usually that is added. And um, the, the, the air sea coupled models that exist, um, either they have um, clear focus on one of the components with a very coarse resolution in one of them, or they are not able to run a very long term, um, I mean, over a few. Uh, over um, uh, little scale uh, event um, uh, time. And so um, this is why uh, I started this work, which consisted of using the regional climate models that were used as standalone versions in the region, um, which are REXCM uh, in the, um, for the atmosphere and uh, Symphony, which is a local ocean model of uh, my lab um, for the ocean. And so uh, the first part of my work was simply to code uh, the um, Oasis uh, routines, which is a coupler, which would allow uh, eventually to exchange the fields between the two models with um, uh, practically it's simply the sea surface temperature is given from the ocean to REXCM. And within REXCM, there are bug parameterization that allows to compute the um, fluxes that are here in the, uh, in the bullet points um, right here. And, um, and to send it back to the ocean. Um, with this technical setup uh, ready, uh, then my first uh, cobalt simulation uh, came out with, um, if I only plot the SST biases, but you, I could, uh, it was uh, terrible in terms of uh, bias. You can see here only seasonal averages, but with monthly averages, I could have uh, three, three um, degree cold bias in a, on very big areas. And so after this first attempt, which were done with um, uh, configurations that I heritated from both communities and I just coupled, uh, coupled them together. I, um, it occurred to me that there was a need for a further uncoupled parameterization and notably of the of REXCM, the atmosphere model, um, which would be focused on um, the fluxes, uh, the sea fluxes, because this first configuration of REXCM uh, actually were set up uh, with mostly validation with land data, with land uh, near surface temperature and land precipitation, because this is uh, basically um, variables of interest usually for the populations, uh, but was not relevant uh, if I want to couple the models. So I set up a method uh, with the uncoupled REXCM where I ran 36 simulations uh, with various combinations of um, REXCM's physics options. Uh, and my uh, targets were to have ocean surface fluxes. So I give up to, I don't look at all on at uh, land data and I focus on, uh, on the graph in the, um, in the lower uh, right corner on uh, Latin heat, uh, sensible heat, long wave, short wave, precipitation and wind speed, uh, near surface wind speed. And for all of this, I look only at um, um, kind of large uh, scale spatial and temporally uh, patterns with on the one side sub-regional annual cycles and on the other side seasonal spatial patterns that I study with respect to the um, reference data set that I uh, uh, put here with notably three base metrics, the mean bias, correlation coefficient and standard deviation. And so with all of these, um, uh, how to say statistics, 
then I apply um, the continuous scoring function that is described in detail in um, Desme and Goduck, which allow to aggregate all of these results and to deduct a kind of a rank um, a score for each of the configurations that allow me to rank and eventually to select and eliminate the adequate or non-adequate um, simulation. And uh, here I show only a subset of uh, this result with the five first configurations. I will not explain in detail what the code means, but they are just like configuration names. And uh, you have for the four uh, most contributing variables and the aggregate uh, results. And I squared the simulation, the configuration that we chose for um, the cold one. And I just want to highlight that with this result, the heat contribution, the heat uh, flux contribution of the of the um, aggregate scores uh, were not very. Um, um, there is no configuration that clearly st stood out for this uh, thing because we can see on the first rows you have latent heat and short waves, the two biggest contributors to this flux. And you can see that the configurations that are featured in the first ranks are very different. Here you see, for example, the number four. For the, um, the first, the third number is uh, number four, and uh, it's not at all featured for the latent heat uh, first configurations. Um, and on the opposite, uh, number five and six here, uh, there is only one configuration that features uh, this one. Uh, for those who know REXCM, this number is the, the Cumulus convection uh, choice. Um, and so um, the conclusion is just that um, even though we have been able to select um, a better configuration regarding the reference that we chose, uh, there is no configuration that is both that both stand out with uh, simulating the near surface short wave, uh, the surface short wave flux and the latent heat. Um, but we will see what it gives. In the between, uh, before going to the to the cobalt simulation, there is a challenge regarding the coupling algorithm, with notably the, the state-of-the-art uh, standard averaging parallel algorithm, where we exchange uh, average fluxes at a regular um, coupling frequency. Usually, it's we people choose one hour, and there is a clear problem with synchronicity. The conservation is okay because anyway we send average fluxes, so the same quantities are exchanged for the same durations. Uh, but the synchronicity, there is, there is um, typically a one coupling period lag, which is involved and uh, which, can, which can involve errors that uh, are estimated in uh, Marti et al. Uh, um, I really refer you to this uh, paper to see they, they use the Schwarz iteration to estimate the errors involved by this kind of uh, algorithm. Um, and, uh, and so it's a bit, um, I mean, it uh, made me think of trying to find another way to do that. And so I developed, um, I mean, I set up um, um, an algorithm that is simply based on uh, the computation of the different uh, submodels within a, the atmosphere, which are not uh, at every time step. For example, radiative transfer in my model is like every 24 uh, minutes it's computed. And so um, if I want to couple in the finest way possible, I simply need to send instantaneous fluxes every 24 minutes for the surface radiative transfer, uh, which is different for turbulent heat, for example, with a different uh, time step, but the principle is the same. And so I set up the coupling algorithm simply by um, sending the fluxes to the ocean each time they are updated, um, because in the between, uh, they here in the upper, upper curve, you can see that it's um, a linear, um, how to say it's constant uh, most of the time. So you don't need to couple at every time step, but after they are updated, they are all sent. And uh, when the SST is needed right before computing these submodels, the SST is, is given. And with uh, this uh, algorithm, the synchronicity is almost uh, okay because there is a residual DT lag due to the fact it's, it remains a parallel algorithm, but both models are running concurrently. Um, and the conservation is okay because um, in it's not um, average fluxes, but they are instantaneous fluxes exchanged each time they are updated. So in the end, the same quantity are still uh, are still uh, exchanged. And so uh, with all of these uh, patterns, um, this is the same uh, map as the uh, previous, the first attempt. And you can see that um, the, um, it's kind of uh, successful in the way that we don't want, as uh, Samuel said, to have a, a clear um, necessarily something better. We just want to 
better than the uncoupled version. We simply want um, it to be uh, coherent. And uh, here the biases, uh, they are coherent. Here I, I put more details if you want to see at the online versions, but um, clearly sometimes for some variables, sometimes it's better, for sometimes it's worse, but the validation are comparable. And so now we can be serene uh, in using the corporal model uh, in um, for studying uh, various um, uh, questions. Uh, the validation uh, was uh, set up uh, and uh, we are happy of that. So I just want to uh, uh, to um, sum up the key highlights. The first one is that with an adequate method, it can be convenient and affordable to aggregate many comparison statistics in order to select or eliminate a subset of members within an ensemble. It's not something uh, difficult to do, uh, even if you have many, many, sorry, many, many members, many statistics and so on. With the method I use, it's very affordable and convenient. Um, the second one is to is that identify, identify and focusing on the core variables that condition the success of your corporal experiment is definitely worth it. Like even if um, you are not interested in latent heat or um, shortwave uh, surface at the ocean surface, um, it's uh, worth it to focus on them simply for setting up the corporal model. And the third one is that it's affordable. I didn't mention it, but it costs only 10% more resource to use the coupling algorithms I use. And so it's affordable to do it at a high frequency uh, and to eliminate the synchronicity issue that I mentioned uh, earlier. And so I thank you for your attention. Sorry, I was a little bit more than 10 minutes. Well, thanks. We, we will take one quick question if there's one in the audience. All right. Thank you. We're going to have to move on otherwise. Okay. Um, so our next speaker is Aquib Javed. And to save him a moment, he'll be talking about Himalayan glacier anomaly as simulated by a coupled regional glacier climate model and its synoptic scale drivers. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, I am Akif Javed. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, IISER Bhopal, India. And today I will be presenting a work of my thesis. Uh, it's called the Himalayan Glacier Anomaly as simulated by a coupled regional glacier climate model and its synoptic scale drivers. So uh, why do we care about Himalayan glaciers? So you can see that this figure uh, represents the all the major river basins which originate in and around the Himalayan region. And we can see in the context of the Indian subcontinent, the three uh, 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 river basins, that is the Indus, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra are the three major river basins which sustain the population of this region. And also, uh, we can see that the, how the rising temperatures are threatening the Himalayan glaciers. Uh, many reports have come up. Uh, this is a, a figure of a Rongba glacier, uh, which shows uh, that how much this glacier has rotated in the last 80 years. Uh, similarly, this is a figure taken from Akagar Atoll, which shows the Gangotri glacier, which has rotated almost about 2.5 kilometers in the last few centuries. Also, uh, uh, this, uh, as I said, already said that this, these glaciers sustain almost one fifth of the world's population. You can see how densely populated this region is, and all the three main rivers originate in the river basins, uh, which are fed by the Himalayan glaciers. Uh, many reports have come up that which has shown that the third pole, which is the Himalayan glacier, is melting away. Uh, uh, the Himalayan glaciers are the loss is speeding up uh, in the new reports which came very recently by uh, by IC mod which shows that uh, the Himalayan glaciers are melting almost 65 percent faster uh, than the just last 10 years. Also, the Himalayan glaciers risk of losing 75 percent of their volume by the end of the century. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, th this was uh, by another study which came like la in the last three four months, uh, which showed that the Himalayan glaciers are actually very very much vulnerable in the last few decades. Also, the Himalayan glacier melt has been under, underestimated by 6.5%, which is a lot. And this uh, underestimated mass loss from glacier terminating lake is, is in the greater Himalayas. 
Also, uh, what is the motivation of my study? So there's a, a phenomenon called the Karakoram anomaly, which is uh, basically refers to the recent resurgence in the Hima in the mass balance of uh, in the mass balance of the uh, Karakoram Himalayan glaciers reported since the turn of the century. Uh, many recent studies have shown it, uh, like uh, Bolch et al., which showed that after the year 2000, there has been a slight surge in the mass balance of the Karakoram regions in Himalayan glaciers. Uh, the same thing was shown uh, uh, by, we, you can see that uh, the glaciers of other regions such as Eastern Himalaya and Central Himalaya have been retreating in the recent decades. But for the Karakoram region, some glaciers have shown a slight positive trend or even uh, stability. Uh, the same thing was shown by Azam et al. in the in his another paper in 2018, which uh, which shows a similar kind of trends in the recent period. Uh, also, the same thing, the, no, sorry, the glacier anomaly, this Karakoram anomaly, can be visually represented by a, a regional uh, climate glacier models mass uh, simulated mass balance, which was done by Kumar et al. in 2015. As you can see, that the Karakoram, most of the regions in the Ka Himalayan region are showing red colors, which basically shows the melt. But some regions in the Karakoram region, uh, you can see that there are bluish red boxes here, which basically represents the surge in the mass balance. Also, uh, uh, in, in another recent study by Fari, uh, Fari Naughty et al., which showed that the uh, ice floor velocity change over the Karakoram region has shown some positive uh, trend. Another very important aspect is that the snowfall is the most important parameter which dictates the mass balance variability uh, for the region. And this was shown by Kumar et al. in 2019. Now, uh, what is uh, what I have used here is that uh, the mass balance of my region, that is Karakuram, we have simulated it using uh, Remo Glacier, which is a coupled uh, high resolution coupled climate glacier model. And, uh, what it shows is that uh, you can see that the, the glacier processes form a very complex nexus, which includes many different different parameters, which uh, controls the eventual mass balance. Uh, sorry. Also, you can see that uh, most of these complex uh, uh, processes are not really well represented in the mod modeling community. Uh, earlier, what used to happen is that uh, uh, most of the GCMs use static glacier masks, but now what we need is to dynamically adjust the glacier masks uh, for future purposes. Also, uh, what we did, uh, also what we did was that uh, in Remo Glacier, uh, we have incorporated a dynamical glacier scheme, which is basically a two-way uh, information flow uh, using a uh, using a glacier module called Dynamize, where we uh, what we do is that uh, the Dynamize use various uh, different parameters, sends its input to the physical parameterization, and gets a two-way information flow back, and then calculates its energy balance. And using that energy balance, we can see that how the glacier anomaly of the Karakoram has been simulated. And you can see that the Karakoram region shows a, a positive bluish color uh, we, uh, as compared to the other regions of the Himalayas. Now, uh, what I am looking into the study is to look into the uh, uh, reasons why this glacier anomaly is existing. So what I looked into is, uh, is into the synoptic scale factors behind its sustenance and st uh, stability. So, uh, 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 what I did was to look into the impact of Western disturbances, which are basically, uh, you can say, are upper tropospheric uh, synoptic scale extratropical cyclonic systems, which are originating in and around the Mediterranean region. They get uh, generous, uh, genocized around the Mediterranean region and then get embedded into the subtropical westerly jet stream. And they travel to eastwards towards the Himalayas until they get impeded and they provide the necessary in, uh, snowfall influx over the region. The boreal winter facilitates conditions promoting their production and development, and also the upper tropospheric cyclogenesis is promoted by incursion of cold polar winds into the area already warm and moisture laden. Uh, then they travel eastward with a mid latitude subtropical westerly jet stream. Uh, also, the IMD's definition says that they are the cyclonic circulation uh, trough in the mid and lower troposphere or a low pressure area on the surface which occurs in the mid latitude westerlies and originate over the Mediterranean Sea. Also, so my objective of the study was to examine the role of WDs in controlling the Karakoram anomaly, quantify the WD snowfall contribution to regional precipitation, identify the key behavioral changes in WD frequency and intensity, and dynamics controlling the formation and its propagation in recent decades. So this was my study region where I can see, you can see that this is the Karakoram region. Uh, and I also done study for other regions, but this particular uh, presentation is focused on the Karakoram.
also uh, what i used i used a tracking model uh, using three separate uh, global reanalysis data sets which are era5 mera2 and ncep to generate the w catalog of wd storms uh, which has uh, impeded the regions in the recent decades this model was developed by dr kevin audius of Re university of reading and i used relative vorticity between 300 and 400 hp levels to track the uh, uh, all the wds the study period was divided into P1 and P2 because uh, uh, this only after 2000, uh, we could see uh, the change in the uh, trend of the carocolum mass balance. Also, there were some filtrations done to identify all the tracks, uh, all the tracks for the region. You can see that these are the tracks generated using ERA5, these are using MERA2, and these are the NCEP. Uh, what I found was that the, there was hardly any change in the frequency of uh, fre uh, WDs uh, impacting the Karakuram. You can see that there are hardly any change seen. But what, uh, what we could see is that the mean precipitation intensity is found to be increasing in the second period, which is the uh, uh, recent period. And this increase was almost uh, seen to be about 10% uh, as compared to the previous decades. Also, the, uh, when I found the spatial difference in the mean intensity of precipitation over Karakoram, we can see it was dominated by the positive differences. So the intensity of WDs have increased over the region without any change in the frequencies. Also, uh, I checked into the volume of WD associated precipitation over the region, and we can uh, and I could find was that the snowfall volume associated with the WDs was found to be increasing in the recent period. Similarly, its contribution in total season snowfall was also found to be increasing. At the same time, uh, I could find that uh, the WD snowfall contribution in total seasonal precipitation, which also includes the liquid precipitation, was found to be enhanced in this recent period. And also the contribution from non-WD sources was found to be decreasing, and it was statistically significant as well. Also, uh, what I found was that uh, what was the uh, dynamics which controlled the genesis, the frequency, and the intensity of WDs in recent period. So uh, I found that the uh, baroclinic instability was found to be increasing over the Mediterranean region, which is the core genesis region, for, and also the track density and the genesis density was found to be increasing in the recent period. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, the, the jet streams uh, is one of the very important factors which controls the uh, intensity and the frequency of WDs, and it was found to be migrating polewards over the uh, genesis box. And similarly, what is the Karakoram anomaly connection with the WDs? This is the mass balance figure uh, of the, an the annual mass balance figure for the Karakoram, and you can see that uh, uh, this is the this is the winter months, and this is the rest of the months. And you can see that the winter months is the most important period for controlling the mass balance. Also, the accumulation during the uh, winter season plays a vital role in the annual mass budget estimation of Karakura. And uh, at the end, I found was that the ensemble mean of WDs contribution of glaciated fraction was found to be increasing in the recent period, which clearly shows that how WDs are a very important factor in controlling the mass balance for the region. And it rose from about 37% in the previous period to about 47% in the second period, which is a relative jump of about 27%. So in the end, I would like to conclude with some of these points. And this work, as I said, was already published in uh, uh, 2022 in Journal of Climate. And thank you. And I'm open to questions. OK, thank you. We do have time for a question from the audience. Um, I have some question about the glacier model. Yeah. Um, how does it interact with the rest of the system? So do you have an interaction between the glacier model and the river model, for example? Yeah. And what are the, the coupling variables? Yeah, I'll show you the figure. So as you can see, the, uh, the our glacier model actually uh, includes a DGS, which is called the dynamical glacier scheme. And what it does, it, con it consists of two modules. One is the atmospheric model, which is REMO. And the one is a glacier module, uh, which is called Dynamize. And it has, it, it, it calculates the, all these, uh, all these are uh, provided as like, uh, some are provided as inputs and some are actually uh, calculated by the module itself. And all this information is then sent to the physical parameterizations, which is also sending information to the dynamize. And this is a two way information flow. And then they together, they calculate all the energy balance and the runoff take, uh, and all the runoff parameters, which are taken into account for the mass balance estimations. And uh, you can see that uh, what happens that uh, basically we have a, uh, within a, every grid box, uh, we have, uh, 
you can say we have divided our uh, grid boxes into different different sections such as some section can be considered as snow some as ice and because of their interactions are different we calculate and we uh, provide their inputs in a separate way so and ultimately we kind of uh, collect all the information and provide a, you can say composite kind of energy balance values which is ultimately used to calculate the mass balance and mass balance itself consists of various parameters so our, i think the seven to eight parameters are used finally to calculate the mass balance Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is Klaus Gergen. And Klaus will be talking about the coupled groundwater to atmosphere simulations with the regional climate system model TSMP as a contribution to the new European Cortex CMIC 6 ensemble. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name is Klaus Gergen. Um, I'll briefly talk about coupled groundwater to atmosphere simulations that we want to contribute uh, to the new Cortex uh, CMIP-6 ensemble. Um, our interest is in the terrestrial water cycle interactions and feedbacks. And you can see, for example, here some of those, which is the soil moisture temperature or soil moisture precipitation feedback. These are heavily impacted, certainly, by the presence of groundwater and by soil water processes. Also, there is human intervention with this system, such as through um, groundwater abstraction, irrigation, also as well as uh, land use and land cover change. Now, under climate change, we have an intensification of the hydrological cycle, which has an impact on these feedback loops, but also these feedback loops themselves uh, have an impact uh, on this intensification. And conceptually, many of the feedback loops are understood, but the strength and the sensitivity uh, of these feedbacks is often unclear. So in this context, one may ask, um, what are the drivers of hydroclimatic extremes of droughts and heat waves when groundwater is considered in land atmosphere coupling? and what's the impact on water resources. Another thing that's interesting is how does human water use play in and what does land use and land cover change do when it comes to long-term modifications of the water and energy cycles. Um, the way we tackle this is by using our terrestrial systems modeling platform. It's a coupled model system that essentially consists of the COSMO regional climate model coupled to the community land model as the LSM. And we have an integrated hydrological model, the PARFLOW model, which uh, can do 2D, 3D variably saturated subsurface and, sub and surface flow uh, calculations down to a depth in this configuration to uh, 60 meters. The important thing is that surface and subsurface systems are treated as a single resource. And I try to show on the next slide um, that it's beneficial to use a uh, regional climate model with an integrated hydrological model, as you can really do this groundwater to atmosphere simulations. And that gives you a more realistic uh, process representation. On the left, you see a, say, standard LSM, where you have mainly vertical subsurface uh, exchanges of water. Here on the right, you see an integrated hydrological model with 3D subsurface hydrodynamics. You have lateral flow in the subsurface. You have aquifer uh, stream flow interaction, you have uh, uh, saturation access overland flow, infiltration access overland flow. So the subsurface uh, and the surface hydrodynamics are linked. You can uh, resolve kilometer scale heterogeneity and also hill slopes processes uh, with these types of models. That has uh, a certain added value when it comes to how groundwater affects land atmosphere coupling. It has an impact on the land water balance and hydrometeorology in general. It has also been shown that uh, once you go towards kilometer scale simulations, actually 3D hydrodynamics is very important as there are some scale dependent feedbacks. Also when having a close terrestrial water cycle, this opens the door for water resource investigations that may lay the basis for a number of uh, VIAX applications. How it looks like when you run a model such as Tessis MP in this coupled setup with power flow and how this redistribution of surface and groundwater uh, may look like you can see here. This is just a short test run over the Euro 11 model domain 
a 12 kilometer resolution. We have a high initial soil moisture. Model is just starting to run. Uh, it's all fully coupled. What we look at here is the pressure. Uh, in red, positive pressure would mean uh, ponding water along the convergence zones, along the rivers, the Rhine River, Po River, we are currently here. So you get this um, very heterogeneous redistribution of surface and groundwater, and that also affects your uh, land atmosphere coupling. Now, I'll give you two examples uh, how this effect may uh, uh, look like. Um, Looking here at groundwater treatment, how it affects heat waves, we compare terrestrial TSMP with a set of um, error interim driven uh, cortex, say phase one uh, RCMs, again over the European uh, region. TSMP here is TSMP is in blue and the 12 RCMs are in gray compared to some reference data sets, error land, EOPS, and also GLEAM. On the uh, upper left here, you see the annual number of heat wave days for the years 1996 to 2008 for mid-European uh, prudence region. And already here you see that uh, Terces MP has a tendency to be perhaps a little bit closer to the, to the reference data. At the lower panel, we show again for the mid-European domain, uh, the multi-annual mean absolute deviation of the, uh, of the heat wave days. And what also becomes apparent here, the TSMP with a 3D subsurface hydrodynamics seems to be a somewhat closer uh, to the observations, the red dots, uh, or closer to the to the reference of, of, of EOPS. So basically, we also compare here ERA land uh, to EOPS. The RCMs are in the uh, box whisker plot. Um, looking at the summer heat intensity, the amplitude between the highest summer temperature and the multi-annual summer 90th percentile, uh, we see a kind of a similar picture. Again, the, 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 the mean absolute deviation from the EOPS observation is such that uh, TSMP is somewhat closer as well as uh, Eraland. So we see here a tendency towards reduced deviations of heat wave metrics uh, from EOPS. And the reason for that is we have a redistribution of soil water, and that may lead to a higher evaporative fraction. And this can also be partly confirmed here in this plot by looking at the comparison of TSMP and the other models uh, with the clean data set. Also here, the uh, mean absolute deviation of TSMP is somewhat lower than for the other models. So the groundwater affects land, land atmosphere coupling and may alleviate heat wave extremes. This is also in line with what we've shown in a study by Jessica Coyne, where a heat wave maxima could be reduced by up to one Kelvin during the 2003 uh, heat wave. Now coming to the second and final example, this is human water use impacts in a coupled TSMP simulation. Here we wanted to know, uh, again, simulating the year 2003, uh, Euro 11 model domain, model domain uh, era interim uh, lateral boundary forcing uh, and different uh, human water use uh, um, uh, scenarios that we put in here uh, and a um, undisturbed uh, water cycle run here that's called that's that's uh, the, the nature run. So we wanted to use what is the impact on the atmospheric water budget and does this also lead to changes in the terrestrial water resources if we see a change. So we're interested here in the atmospheric water budget or more specifically in the strength of the continental sink. We measure this with the atmospheric divergence, which is uh, controlled by evapotranspiration and precipitation. And usually your continental sink over the whole year, for example, 2003 looks like this. So we have uh, a precipitation surplus. There is precipitation uh, exceeds evapotranspiration. So essentially we have over the continents a net import of water. Hence we have an uh, a continental sink. Now, when comparing the human water use run with the uh, undisturbed nature run, again for 2003, uh, looking now at individual river catchments, specifically observe here the catchment in the catchments, for example, uh, in the southwest. What you can see here is with the purple colors a decrease of the continental sink. So, this is a uh, human water use induced alteration of this uh, continental sink. And it's consistent with the, with the actual human water use. That means the pumping, uh, the redistribution of the water, the pumping, the water extraction, and the irrigation that leads in this case to an ET increase. So you can either have a, a, a change of your continental sink by reduced precipitation or, for example, by increased evapotranspiration or a combination. Now, I cannot show you the full detail of this study, but uh, perhaps you want to check it out yourself. But um, through then 
further atmospheric feedback processes and redistribution of water, also transport of atmospheric water out of the region. This has an impact on subsurface water storage. So essentially what you see here on the upper right is we have in these areas where there's a lot of water extraction, irrigation and evapotranspiration, we have drying watersheds because there is a decline of the groundwater table that we can see here. For example, this is also again for the year 2003 when comparing our nature run with the uh, human water use um, scenario run. And this has then certainly a lot of implications for water management and the sustainability uh, of uh, water resources. Um, in the new upcoming uh, Cortex CMIP-6 uh, ensemble, the climate limited area modeling community uh, has quite a number of coupled regional climate model um, ensemble members that are uh, categorized as so-called increased complexity models, and they uh, add to the ensemble of the balanced GCM RCM matrix uh, that Eurocortex uh, came up. I'll just give you a quick overview here. This is Cosmos simulations. This is ICON simulations. And there is a tendency towards atmosphere ocean coupled models. But uh, as I could just show you, we also have the terrestrial water cycle uh, covered here. And uh, yeah, the focus region is over uh, Europe and over the Mediterranean. And I'd like to advertise a few posters from colleagues from this uh, CLM community on coupled and or high resolution uh, simulations that you, that you please uh, check out in the poster session. Um, I think the list is not even uh, complete. So to summarize and um, conclude, um, coupled regional climate models with integrated hydrological models can simulate all states and fluxes of the terrestrial water and energy cycles, so groundwater to atmosphere. Through this land atmosphere coupling, groundwater processes, 3D hydrodynamics uh, affect uh, hydroclimatic extremes and water resources. And also human interventions have an impact on the water cycle and can be simulated. And that I think makes also a lot of novel information available for a multitude of uh, VIAX applications. So the model runs are ongoing. And what we certainly look at next is uh, the evolution of European water resources under climate change projections. And with this, I'd like to thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thanks, we have time for one quick question. Uh, thanks, Klaus. Really nice work. Um, one of the challenges with, with using these types of models is that you need to tell it something about the geology going down to 60 metres, which is difficult to observe. How did you guys deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. I would have an additional slide, but no time for that. But uh, we have we have now a combination we use, for example, in this specific setup. We spend a lot of time actually on the setup, a lot of time. So we use a soil grid data set on the one hand side, which is eventually translated into soil, soil hydraulic properties that Parflow needs, Fangenuchten parameters, permeability, uh, and so forth, hydraulic conductivity. So this is this is highly important that you get that that you get that parameterization right. Once we reach depth to bedrock, in this specific case, we use the international hydro hydrogeological map of Europe which is then again translated into these hydrofacius distributions that the model has to see. So even when you think you have it about right, this is a setup that we can use pretty much everywhere in the world, except that we would need to replace this, the, 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 the lower layers with a different data set like Gleason data set. The real problem also is once you have it right or you think you have it right, you need a lot of spin up time. For example, for a Euro 11 run, we need about 30 years of spin up in order to have the subsurface in a quasi dynamic equilibrium. And it may even be more than 30 years. So I would tend to, to say it's 40 years that we need to spin it up, which is a problem if you want to run transient and you want to have like, you want to run pseudo transient with time slices in the future where you have a spin up time spent for your future time spent. That's a real problem. That's a real challenge with these kinds of models. Thank you. Hi, this is this is from Pune. Can we also interact? Sure. So uh, just just a query, I think it's uh, again I'm Pankaj Kumar. So um, I ju I was just trying to understand this how this groundwater uh, processes which you include in your system uh, is improving the land surface processes. 
Is it the conductivity, diffusivity, or something like that? And if, let's say, groundwater, the regions where the groundwater has depleted, do we expect more heat waves in the, those areas, if I got you right? Um, perhaps it, 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 it's uh, the second question I didn't fully get. The first one I can quickly answer, but we can continue on the chat or, or online or by email. The, the, the first thing I is just reiterate, uh, just reiterate. So if we have, let's say, the groundwater is depleted uh, from subsurface, so does this mean that the area wherever it is will be more prone to heat waves? Prone to what? Heat waves. Uh, heat waves. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I did yeah, bad hearing. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, we have a we have a study out how this how this um, that you can enter actually a feedback loop where you have. This is a very important point. Actually, you have in this kind of model you have a certain memory in the subsurface, and when you have a very strong heat wave with a hydrological drought, that leads to an uh, initial condition for the next season uh, that can trigger a feedback process that eventually is amplifying uh, a drought and is also amplifying heat waves. So yes, there is, there is like someone put it, there is uh, also feedback processes that you can investigate with these kinds of simulations. Okay, thank you. We need to move on. Our next speaker is Jessica Steinkopf, and she'll be talking about the latest projected climate change signal over Southern Africa using the conformal cubic atmospheric model CCAM or CCAM. Over and backwards and keep rest Okay, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Steinkopf. I am from the Global Change Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I will be showing you some preliminary results in looking at the latest projected climate change signal over Southern Africa using CCAM. So at the Global Change Institute, we use the conformal cubic atmospheric model in our modeling activities. We run it on the Lingao cluster of the Center for High Performance Computing, the CHPC, which is in Pretoria. And um, there is a long history of climate modeling on the CHPC and over the years performance has generally improved, but recently we've unfortunately been affected by um, national electricity cuts called load shedding. Uh, this is the process of cutting electricity off in different areas to kind of manage a supply demand issue. And so this has unfortunately meant that the number of simulations that we are able to run simultaneously has been severely reduced. And it also means that the amount of time it takes to complete a simulation has been um, really, has really increased. So um, I don't have as many ensemble members today as I'd like to present, as I'd hoped to present, but um, I will be presenting what we have so far. So more on the conformal cubic atmospheric model, which um, the next speaker will give more details on, I think. So it was developed by CSIRO in Australia, and it uses a conformal cubic grid by project projecting a cube onto, this, um, onto a sphere. So this means the model can run um, in a stretched grid mode for variable resolution regional modeling, um, or in a non-stretched grid mode um, to provide almost uniform resolution globally. 
So this um, quasi-uniform grid provides the a unique computational um, advantage, and this gives us the ability to perform these high-resolution runs over long periods of time on our supercomputer. So over recent years, it has been widely used in many studies in South Africa and also in Australia and globally. So in order to um, dynamically downscale uh, CMIP6 models over Southern Africa, uh, we will be using CCAM and this is the first of these runs will be the first of their kind for this region and we will be generating the largest ensemble ever for this region. So um, as I mentioned, CCAM has this stretched grid global model, um, which becomes a regional model by stretching the grid over the area of interest, which in our case is Southern Africa, as you can see on the right hand side. So um, by stretching the grid, we can concentrate the grid points um, over our Southern African domain and create these high resolution, um, approximately eight kilometers in the horizontal simulations. So um, prior to downscaling the CMIP-6 GCMs, ERA-5 has been downscaled for the period 1979 to 2020. And um, in order to downscale, we follow a two-step process. In the first step, uh, we the coupled sea surface temperatures and sea ice concentrations are bias corrected. And this is to remove any systematic errors and provide us with more accurate present-day climatologies. We then use these corrected sea surface temperatures and sea ice concentrations from these global GCMs and use them to um, force the CCAM atmospheric uh, model at the lower boundary. And we first do this in a global 50 kilometer run. Once this run is complete, we are able to then further downscale um, CCAM and use this global simulation to drive a final scale run at eight kilometers. And then finally, um, the outputs are written, are regridded back onto a standard latitude longitude grid so that we can use them for our analysis. So we are in the process of downscaling 10 uh, CMAP6 GCMs over Southern Africa. Um, for two SSP scenarios, uh, the first one being 3.70 and the second one, 126. So these are the GCMs, the CMAP6 GCMs that we plan to downscale. Um, and today I will be presenting the one for GFDL ESM4. So um, on the left-hand figure, you are looking at the climatic research unit, total annual precipitation for the period 1961 to 1970. And on the right is the CCAM GFDL um, first 50 kilometer resolution run. And as we can see, um, the Run on the right has done well in capturing the west east gradient of rainfall over the region. And although there is some overestimation over central southern Africa, uh, we do see th the correct gradient. And we can also see that there is um, an underestimation in the rainfall totals along the east coast of Madagascar. So we then take this. 50 kilometer resolution run, and we use it to generate our eight kilometer run. So on the top left, you are seeing the same 50 kilometer figure for 1961 to 1970. And on the bottom right, you are now looking at the eight kilometer high resolution run. And um, in South Africa, the Central interior is elevated on a plateau that is created by the great escarpment that runs along the east, the south, and the west of the country. And what 
really good about this um, eight kilometer simulation is that we can pick up improved um, convective rainfall along that eastern escarpment, uh, which is incredibly important as the most of the northern interior of the country relies on uh, water supplied from the dams that are found in this region. So it's really important for us to gain a better understanding of um, how uh, rainfall is projected to change over this region. And we can see um, an improved um, simulation of the convective rainfall here. So um, along the south of the country, I don't know if you can see the box in the middle image, um, we have the Cape Fold Mountains. And so I have just zoomed in to the Cape Fold Mountains along the south, which is a all year rainfall region. And I've zoomed into the Eastern Escarpment, which you can see as the box on the right in that central figure. And um, just to look at the seasonal cycle, again, for the same period, 1961 to 1970. And if we start with the Cape Fold Mountains on the bottom left, this is an all year rainfall region. And we can see that no distinct um, dominant periods of peak rainfall are found there. So it's correctly simulating this all year rainfall in both the 50 kilometer and eight kilometer runs. And crew is provided for reference. On the right-hand side, the Eastern Escarpment is a summer rainfall region. And so we can clearly see the peaks in rainfall um, during January and December, correctly displayed in both the 50 kilometer and eight kilometer runs. And although the eight kilometer run does overestimate this rainfall, um, it's also an indication that it is better um, representing the convective rainfall. So um, next is important. Now we can look at um, um, the first ensemble member of a future climate change signal. So on the left-hand figure, you are looking at that same GFDL model, um, but it is the 2030 to 2039 climate change signal relative to that 1970, um, 1970, 1961 to 1970 baseline. And <clears throat> over this region, we can see a strong drying signal, particularly along the east coast of Southern Africa, um, sort of the southern areas of Mozambique, stretching across into Zimbabwe and um, Botswana and across into Namibia. There is also a very strong drying signal along the east coast of Madagascar. And we can see that by using the eight kilometer runs, we get a much better depiction of regions with um, particular regions of uh, below and above average rainfall. And then on the right hand side, we have the minimum and maximum temperatures and how these are projected to change for the same period, 2030 to 2039 relative to 1961 to 1970. And in both the minimum and maximum temperatures, we can see a projected increase um, in these, particularly uh, over kind of Western regions of Botswana and Namibia. And so I think, is the time up? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jessica. I think we have time for one quick question. There's one above. Thanks for the presentation. Um, what criteria are you using to select the 10 GCMs uh, that force the uh, high resolution model? Thanks for the question. Um, at the moment, those are the 
10 GCMs that we have the corrected sea surface temperatures for um, at the moment. And we are guided by our colleagues at CSIRO in Australia according to using those models. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much again. So I think we have to move on in the interest of time. Our next speaker is Marcus Thatcher, and he'll talk about the development of a regional earth system model using a variable resolution global grid. Hello, um, I'm Marcus Thatcher um, from CSIRO, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the development of a regional earth system model um, using variable resolution grid. And I've listed some of my colleagues here that have, have helped me with this presentation. Um, so as everybody's probably aware, there's quite a few different methods for dynamically downscaling um, regional climate. Uh, the, a very popular one is a limited area regional climate modeling approach but it is possible to do it um, through a very high resolution global um, atmospheric model, though they're more rare because you need a very powerful supercomputer. And a sort of compromise between those two approaches is a, is a variable resolution um, global climate model, sometimes called a stretch grid model, where we're still simulating the whole globe, but we're trying to redistribute the grid boxes so that they're focused over the region that we'd like to target. Um, and in this case, we're going to talk about the CCAM model that Jessica just also talked about um, briefly and how we've gone about implementing some of the regional Earth system components uh, into that model for use in, in some of the Cortex experiments. So Jessica's already introduced CCAM, but I'll just, just for completeness, um, this is a semi-implicit, semi-Lagrangian, non-hydrostatic model based on a cubic grid that, that Jessica's already explained, and the model was originally developed by John McGregor. Um, although the development's led out of Australia, we are very reliant on um, our collaborators around the world to help us out, um, in particularly South Africa, New Zealand, South America, and Southeast Asia. So it is very much a collaborative effort. Um, and so far, we've been implementing uh, uh, different uh, system components, um, particularly focused on prognostic aerosols, inline ocean model, and to um, starting to build in the terrestrial carbon cycle. Um, it is an open source model, so if people are interested, they are welcome to download and run the model and do what they, they would like with it. So because it's a variable resolution model, it poses a bit of a problem in that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so, so to get the variable resolution, we've gone down a coordinate transformation approach um, using a SMIT transformation. And so that SMIT transformation prefer, preserves the orthogonality of the grid that focuses um, over a particular area. And we have an example um, here where the top plot shows a projection of the cube on, on the globe and you can actually see the corner points where there's a little bit of grid bunching. Um, in fact, we're working on a new version of this sort of avoid that. Uh, and you can see here the Smith transformations redistributed those grid boxes in this case to focus over Australia. Um, you can do this other ways, uh, but we've gone down a coordinate transformation approach because it, it simplifies some of the numerical issues for us and it's a lot easier for us to optimize. Um, but it does have this drawback that um, by increasing the resolution here, we've degraded the resolution on the opposite side of the globe. So the number of grid points is conserved. Um, uh, and yeah, the CCAM was part of the uh, early generation of stretch grid models. Um, and there was some intercomparison, for example, this one in 2008, which people can read. So because it's a variable resolution model, it poses a bit of a problem in that how do we nest it in a GCM? We have no lateral boundary conditions to do that nesting. And so our approach has been instead to, well, there's, there's a couple of different ways. One way is to just uh, use the method that Jessica described where we'll just SST force the model and often that's used for bias correction um, and then downscale from that. Or you can use um, spectral nudging to, to downscale directly from the GCM, but it limits our ability to, to bias correct. Um, the spectral nudging basically is an approach where we're, instead of constraining by a lateral boundary con condition, we're constraining in terms of a wavelength. So we'll typically nudge wavelengths above 3,000 kilometres um, and higher, and so they're constrained by the host GCM. 
And then details that are smaller than that scale can evolve in the regional model um, as it sees fit. Um, and so it's a little bit different to some other spectral nudging methods where we can actually use these very large wavelengths and often you can have wavelengths which are larger than the high resolution um, domain area because you've, you've saw that the whole globe being simulated at some resolution. Because we're using this spectral nudging, we can actually be selective about which variables we nudge and at which levels. We don't have to provide boundary conditions for all the, or spectral nudging for all the variables. Um, so for example, we don't nudge um, relative humidity or water vapor at all. We, we allow the model to be independent um, from that. And we choose to nudge winds above um, the boundary layer height of eight hectopascals. Um, you can, do multiple nesting where you can work your way down to finer and finer resolutions. If you go fine enough, the grid becomes very stretched and then you need to be very careful about um, that you have enough wavelengths resolved in the host model for the spectral nudging to work and the frequencies updating and, uh, enough that it's constraining the model, but it never, it's, it always stays stretched grid as a global model. So you could run it um, and it will run stably even in these highly stretched um, modes, although errors would, would eventually grow from these low resolution regions. So on this sort of stretch grid framework, we've been implementing um, various uh, system components. And so far we've implemented uh, prognostic aerosols with the direct and indirect feedbacks, um, including dust, sulfur cycle, carbonaceous and sea salt. We've also been working on inline Bizonesque ocean model um, and the terrestrial carbon cycle. The prognostic aerosols have been implemented in a purely emission-based um, model. So, so some of those emissions are prescribed by, by um, the SSPs, but also some natural emissions can be controlled by feedbacks in the model, such as soil moisture affecting dust emissions. Um, you can use spectral nudging to constrain the background aerosol concentrations if you want to, but sometimes with the cortex domains are sufficiently large, we've found that that wasn't um, particularly necessary. Um, and so it means that because we're using this stretch grid and because we're using spectral nudging, we can implement some of these um, earth system components, but we don't necessarily have to have sub-daily um, GCM aerosol boundary condition, for example. So it gives us a lot of flexibility with data avail availability um, in constraining the model. Um, the CCAM ocean model is being built in line. Um, so we've actually sort of built a custom model into, inside the CCAM dynamical core. And this is sort of represented by this schematic of all the different CCAM components. Um, I appreciate it might be a bit hard to see, but basically we have the atmospheric dynamical core and the ocean dynamical core. And the two models are joined through a unified um, turbulent mixing scheme, which is a K epsilon closure. So, Basically, the column starts at the top of the atmosphere and ends at the bottom of the ocean, and we have one implicit solution that runs through the whole column. So that allows us to get very frequent coupling and to deal implicitly with conservation issues and things like that, but it does mean the atmosphere and ocean grid have to be aligned. So we find that it's more appropriate in regional models where we've, we've resolved the, the ocean coastlines to, to a reasonable degree um, so that this approach can work and it's, it's fairly efficient. So despite the fact that we don't have this homogeneous distribution of ocean points, we still managed to get eight simulation years per day at about 12 and a half kilometer resolution out of the model in, in mixed precision mode. Um, so it's not really slowing us down too much by going down this approach. Um, again, we have the issue of constraining the ocean model because we don't have lateral boundaries. And again, we use the spectral nudging, but because we've used a convolution approach on this, grid, um, we um, were able to uh, allow the met method to handle the regular coastlines, um, things like that. So here in this figure, we've got an example from an earlier run where we had um, sea surface temperatures from the from the reanalysis and they're constraining the CCAM1, which is allowed to add structure, but it's still constrained to agree with those sea surface temperatures at a larger scale, um, typically above a thousand kilometre um, resolution. We can do a traditional kind of um, nudging where we'd, we'd, we'd nudge the currents um, below the mix layer, but you can also configure this model in a way that you look at the differences in the SSTs in the regional simulation and the host model and constrain the mix layer so that those SSTs agree at that large length scale. And in some ways that's kind of consistent with some of the traditional way of doing cortex design. So there's quite a bit of flexibility in how we how we de um, design the model and how we constrain it, um, depending on the data that's available. 
One of the drawbacks, though, of going down the, the variable resolution approach is that we do need to have scale-aware physical parameterizations. And so these parameterizations have to operate over scales typically between one to 100 kilometers, although we, we, we are pushing below one kilometer now into the to hundreds of meters. Um, and so that poses a problem, particularly when you're getting towards the gray zone. So we've taken a very pragmatic approach and it's a very active area of research, particularly for CCAM, but I believe other models as well. And some of these scale aware parameterizations tend to be used in things like um, the convection scheme, which has a type effective time scale that depends on grid spacing, the cloud microphysics, the, the variance of moisture within the grid box depends on the, on the grid spacing and the turbulent boundary layer scheme uh, the counter the counter gradient term, which is basically eddies, the size of the boundary layer have to be weakened as we as the resolution approaches the boundary layer height. And so we've found that that tends to work fairly well, and that we've we're generally getting um, added value as we go down to finer resolutions. But it's definitely a, an area that that needs careful attention and and some care. So. Uh, so anyway, that's a bit of a summary of, of how we've gone about designing uh, the CCAM model, particularly for the um, stretch uh, for the Earth system components and consistent with our stretch grid approach. Um, we're still adding to this, trying to work on, starting to work on um, some atmospheric chemistry components, particularly for urban areas, but that's still in development. Um, and we think that this approach gives us quite a bit of flexibility and therefore is useful as part of a complex ensemble in that we can change some of the assumptions in how models are downscaled and therefore um, see if the, the um, projections are still consistent with other regional modeling design. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus, for this interesting presentation. Are there any questions? There's one up there. So thanks, Marcus. It's a really interesting talk. I wonder if, if you could say something about what you see the added value of resolving the wider globe, albeit in a coarser way, over, say, the limited area uh, uh, regional modelling. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it a slightly complicated question to answer. It's, it's from our point of view, it's, it's uh, we, we have a sort of pseudo two-way feedback feeding back into the global circulation. And sometimes when we're criticized for some of our regional modeling approaches, we can say, well, we haven't imposed these boundary conditions and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I also believe that the regional modeling's limited area models work quite well. So it's not like there's a fundamental improvement over that, but I think it um, allows us to change some of those assumptions um, and particularly gives us some flexibility, particularly when data's limited for say, constraining the motion model. Okay. Thank you. We can take one more quick question. It's just over there, Vera, yes. Very short question. So what are you doing about the vertical level? So a uh, very big advantage when you're using regional models that you have a much higher number of vertical levels. So are you using this high number of vertical levels in the global, so overall? I, I couldn't quite hear the question, but I think it was about vertical levels. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yeah, so... Um, well, in, in these simulations, we're using 54 levels in the atmosphere and about 40 levels in the in the ocean. Um, and we've found that's adequate without being too computationally expensive to run. But, um, you know, there are some advantages to increasing the number of vertical levels, but we're trying to balance that with the resolution and so on. But I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your questions. I didn't quite hear the second part. Okay, yeah. So again, thank you very much, Marcus. Um, and I think this uh, concludes the session. But before we finally close, uh, there is one announcement. And I think we should give all the speakers and also the organizers another round of applause. Thank you. Uh, this is a quick announcement for rapporteurs and sessions co-chairs. Please check the poster sessions as well, because we have to include all the messages uh, brought by oral and uh, posters. So just to remind you, thank you.
So uh, we will be now starting uh, the poster session here in the uh, Meghdoot Auditorium itself. There will be lightning talks and the session chair is uh, Dr. Sapna Panikal and the reporters of this session are uh, Jyoti Sharma from ISER uh, Bhopal and Ajink Aswale from IITM Pune. So may I request Dr. Sapna to kindly preside over. Good afternoon all and welcome to the lightning talks on the A4 poster session. So we have the young researchers from the IITM hub. They'll be presenting their highlights from the talk. Each online in-person speakers can come to the dais and present their highlights of the work in two minutes. So first I invite Bela Loth, analysis of shift in LPS, trajectory over India during monsoons in its dynamics and effects on the Speciothermal distributions of precipitation. The variability of precipitation associated with LPS over the Indo Gangetic belt in the recent decades. In motivation, low pressure systems form a very crucial part of India's climate because they bring a large portion of India's rainfall, especially during the Indian summer monsoon months. Very specifically, nearly 60% of the rain. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so the title of my uh, poster is the variability of precipitation associated with low pressure systems over the Indo Gangetic belt in recent decades. Uh, so in motivation, first of all, the motivation of my study was the importance of low pressure systems to the Indian climatic system because they bring a considerable amount of rainfall to India, especially during the summer monsoon months. And uh, nearly 60% of the rainfall that is received by the IGB um, is because of the low pressure systems. Uh, the time series over here, it shows the low pressure system tracks that pass over IGB in these years uh, from 1980 to 2017, which was my study period. Um, so the Indo-Gangetic plain, um, as we know, is very important to India because it is the main agricultural hub. Um, that is because uh, topographically it consists of mostly plains and also it has got um, a lot of fertile soil because of the deposition of sediments. Um, so collectively, uh, since low pressure systems are very important to the Indo-Gangetic belt precipitation, um, I'm going to uh, talk about the variability of precipitation um, over the IGB by the LPS. So uh, methodology, in my methodology, first um, LPS tracks were, uh, they were plotted using the TRACK or the track uh, tracking algorithm. And um, I applied my LGB mask, which is the uh, red portion um, in the, um, uh, IGB section over India. So uh, that means that I uh, segregated only those tracks which pass over the um, IGB. And then certain um, parameters of these low pressure systems um, that passed over the IGB, uh, such as the mean attributed rainfall, uh, the mean lifetime of LGB, uh, sorry, uh, um, LPS, uh, the mean track density and the mean genesis density, they were uh, studied. Uh, each of these parameters have been studied for three different periods, and these periods were found out by running a change detection point test for uh, the precipitation uh, time series, uh, the precipitation received over IGB. This is for the total precipitation. So um, my two change points are 2005 and um, 1995. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bella. So I invite the next speaker, Dharmendra Kamath. Is he available here? Okay, then we will move on to the next speaker, Vikas Kumar Patel. He'll be talking on the increase in water vapor over India and Indian Ocean during the period 2009-2020 implications for amplified regional warming. Good evening, everyone. I am Vikas Patel, research scholar from the University of Technology, Kharagpur. I am presenting today the increasing water vapor over India and Indian Ocean during the period. 
and implication for the amplified regional warming. As we know that water vapor is mostly done for the most abundant greenhouse gas. It is not like the other greenhouse gas, which is increasing the temperature, but it is amplifying the temperature which is already caused by the other greenhouse gases because their lifetime period is very less compared to the greenhouse gases. So here we analyze the distribution variability in the water vapor by considering the tropospheric water vapor by we have integrated the water vapor from surface to the 100 SPA just to get a tropospheric water vapor and that humidity data is taken from the various data set for example AIRS, ERA5, MERA2 and the some selected data on stations and we carry out the annual acclimatology and seasonal also and we found that key AIRS satellite cannot capture the entire column of the water vapor because of the cloud cover that will not work and we found that all the satellite all, all the data measurement is showing more or less the increasing pattern of the water vapor in most of the regions in some cases it is not some it's cases not showing the, some stagnant water vapor but in most regions, whether it's indian ocean or arabian sea or uh, bay of bengal it is showing increasing but uh, in particularly in the mam like in the pre monsoon season the water vapor in the bay of bengal region is somewhat decreasing even not in the total column water vapor and intercooler integrated water vapor, we check this uh, like a particular pressure level also in throughout the troposphere with the 100 SPA, 950, 850 SPA. In all the pressure level, the water vapor is decreasing during the MIM, especially in the Bay of Bengal. Then we further carry out the study. What are the sources and the drivers that is affecting the water vapor uh, trend in that region? So in that figure, we can see that the water vapor in the most region increasing. We see the Bay of Bengal where it is decreasing during the MAM. And we also analyze the trend in the heotranspiration, heopressant because both are the sources which are driven by the surface air temperature on the SST. And we can see that in the annual also and in the seasonal also, the heotranspiration is increasing in most of the reason and trend during the JJ is, is much, much higher than compared to the other season. Because in JJ is not only about the heotranspiration, it's also about the transport of the water vapor from the Indian Ocean, which is driven by the Indian summer monsoon wind. If you see that water vapor is increasing, not even the entire column water vapor, even in the its pressure level in the troposphere, it increasing the most reasons. And the rise in water vapor, so it has implication on the radiation and other kind of things. So we have also computed the water vapor radiative effects that I haven't shown here. And in the most of the cases, like in the most of the radiation stations, the water vapor radiative effects is showing positive at the top atmosphere, which means that rise in water vapor and corresponding radiative effects will amplify the ongoing global warming is caused by the greenhouse gases. Thank you. Thank you. So now I call upon the next speaker, Roja, Roja Chaluvedi. She will be talking about the historical and future projections for variability in West Pacific subtropical high and its association with Indian summer monsoon using semi-fly simulations. Good evening. I myself is Roja Chalwadi. Now my um, poster title is a historical and future projections of for variability of in uh, West Pacific subtropical high and its association with Indian summer monsoon by using use, uh, using CMA6 simulations. Um, in uh, a recent studies Chalwadi et al. 2021 and 2023, there has a strong connection of the subtropical high variability on the intra-seasonal and intra-annual variability and its association with the Indian summer monsoon. And, also, and uh, uh, on the overall, uh, out of 23 models of CM6 models, and the, uh, on the pad, based on the pattern correlation, eight mod these are listed, eight models are selected. And uh, in the over, for the historical period, along with the observation, here observation is taken as the based on the NSEP and also uh, along with the ensemble, we can see that, that black, li black line shows the solid, uh, solid line shows that climatological position of the WPSH location and uh, uh, AWCM model, it is exactly estimating the location of WPSH over a historical period. Coming IATM ESM, it is well estimated the intensity of the WPSH over the historical model for the historical historical period and the WPSH it is uh, well associated with the Indian summer monsoon rainfall from the observation is almost all selected eight models it is showing the pattern of the um, association of WPSH coming to the future projection compa compared to the historical pro historical projections 
we can see uh, there is a end of the century from 2069 to 2099 it is w wpsc is shifting westward along with the intensification coming in the uh, by the end of the century the association of the wpsh and uh, it's in the summer monsoon it is associated by the end of the century thank you thank you roja so we have the next talk from michelle sharma she will be talking on the winter precipitation characteristics in the ultra scale convection permitting we will move on to the online presentations so the first presentation is from mohammed abid khan evaluating the accuracy of pre-analysis products for wind energy development Hello. Hello. Yeah, you can please start presenting your work. Uh, okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, you can proceed. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, today, our talk is assessing the reliability of reanalysis product for the wind energy development, uh, a comparison with INSO observation. So, uh, as you know, the reanalysis product is a very crucial for the analyzing the historical weather uh, pattern in the case of wind energy resources evaluation, especially particularly in the uh, focus region is wind energy. So the difference between the actual and the simulated land surface wind simulation. So this emphasizes the need for the simulated product in the long term assessment. So in our study, we compare the reanalysis product with the observation station data set to verify the wind energy estimation and to support the wind farm development. You can see our uh, domain is South Asia region and uh, we have used the uh, three reanalysis product and the observation data set is heavily integrated surface database. So based on in this uh, uh, study, you can see the figures and graphs so we have concluded uh, there is a JARA 55. This is the more accuracy uh, uh, compared to the other product. So uh, this is the JARA 55 Japanese product. It's more accurate product near to the observation. So uh, this assumption might help wind energy companies uh, predict change in prediction and maximize energy benefit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. So we'll have the next presentation from Precious Alvin Day, hybrid statistical downscaling, oh. reducing the biases in the dryness of drivers of the combat wet warm event in the Western African hey. summer. Hey. Is the speaker available online? No. Okay, then we will move on to the next speaker. Is uh, Mohammed Umar Nadim? Is he available? Yeah, I can. I am available. Can you listen me? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, please, please continue. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening from the uh, University of Scuba, Japan. I am here to present one of very major uh, issues in South Asia. As we know, uh, last year, floods hit us very badly in Pakistan. So it opens the eye for every researcher, uh, for every hydrologist, uh, so that we have to increase our knowledge, specifically related to the extreme precipitations like uh, flood forecasting, and extreme precipitation event. Uh, during last flood, according to World Health, uh, sorry, World Bank report, about uh, 50 million acre feet volume was generated during that flood. And one of the major reason of that flood is about extreme precipitation. So as a researcher, as a, as a hydrologist, we need to improve our knowledge uh, about extreme precipitation and rainfall runoff modeling as much as we can. So today I would like to uh, present uh, my one, one of my ex uh, expected results. Uh, as we know, on the uh, mountainous domain, it is very difficult to obtain the precipitation estimation due to the rugged topography. So we have to explore different sources of the precipitation. In this study, what I have done, I have taken three uh, uh, precipitation product like IMR, TRIP, and PDIR and compare them with the uh, locally installed gauge data at uh, multiple temporal scales like daily, monthly, seasonal scales by using statistical indices. And uh, um, uh, for after that, after the evolution, I use the uh, extreme event indices like rainfall 95 to evaluate them. So the result shows that according to figure three, generally the correlation coefficient be between the satellite precipitation product and the gauge product is increased, uh, sorry, as decrease as the high, uh, elevation increase. So we can say that the I-merge and uh, I-merge estimation can be utilized for further hydroclimatic applications because its correlation coefficient is greater than 0.7 and uh, uh, its bias is plus minus 10. Now currently I'm apply, uh, trying to apply this uh, uh, satellite product into the hydrological modeling by using SWAT model and uh, 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 to calculate the runoff of that particular flood. Fl uh, that's all from my side. If you have any question, please uh, do let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Muhammad Nadeem. So we will have the next speaker, Paulumi Chakravarti. Is he available online? Yes. So she'll be talking on the comparative analysis of thunderstorm and rail storm. Hailstorms events over Chakan, India. Yes, ma'am. Uh, am I audible to you? Yes, you can. Uh, yes, I'll share my screen. Uh, uh, if the other participant could stop sharing a screen, I would like to share mine. This is this your poster is already in the screen. You can start. Oh, discussing. yes, I'll just start. Uh, hello and welcome to my presentation at the International Conference on Regional Climate Codex 2023. I'm Dr. Paulami Chakravarti and I'm the founder of Global Climate Association, my initiative towards climate literacy. Uh, so for the introduction, numerical models are indispensable for simulating various atmospheric conditions and aiding decision-making processes. This research that we have here is the part of my doctoral work evaluates thunderstorms and hailstorms in Jharkhand, India, using the WRF ARW model and ground observations. We centered on events from May 2009 and May 2010, examining the ARW model's precision in depicting micrometeorological and meteorological parameters, study area and weather conditions. So Rachi, uh, situated in the eastern monsoon trough region of India, frequently experiences intense pre-monsoon thunder and hailstorms, locally known as the Kal Baishakhis, as it falls on the Indian season of Baishak. Two cases of storm events were chosen, one on 11 May 2009, and another event was on the 30th May 2010. WRF ARW version 3.9 was utilized with domain centered around Rachi, Jharkhand, and the model's resolution was set at 3 kilometer in the innermost domain. 
The observational data was obtained from Micrometeorological Tower at BIT Mesra campus in Rachi. The major findings were, comparing WRF simulations with observational data, I observed that the model represented wind circulation patterns accurately for both case studies. Sensible and latent heat fluxes and geopotential heights followed trends consistent with observational data. Notably, turbulent kinetic energy and planetary boundary layer height depicted maximum variations around storm events, although the turbulent kinetic uh, energy model value in the second case significantly deviated from the observed value. So the implications and conclusion are, despite some limitation, the WRF ARW model proved to be a reliable tool for simulating short-lived extreme weather events thus making it invaluable for numerical climate prediction in tropical regions. It is particularly vital for a region like Jharkhand where such storms have far-reaching societal implications. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions and a fruitful discussion. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Balmi Chakravarti. So we have the, our next speaker, Shiv Shivam Saxena. Is he available online? Assessing the role of ocean heat content in modulating Indian summer monsoon onset. Is he online? No. So we will move on Hello. to the last presenter from this session, Nishal Sharma. He's connected. Uh, He's yeah. available. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Please, Shiva, you can proceed. Uh, Ma'am, uh, shall I share my screen? Can you please share the screen? This is yes. post, his poster. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Shivam Saxena. So uh, I have worked on the uh, the ocean heat content and how it is uh, modulating the Indian summer monsoon onset. Uh, currently, IMD predicts ISM onset uh, like with one month lead. Uh, they use some um, six parameters to predict uh, using the, some statistical models. Uh, uh, currently, we use SST. Uh, IMD uses SST uh, to predict the ISM onset. Uh, but uh, new studies have shown that OHC can be ocean heat content can from Indo-Pacific region can be a good predictor also. So uh, we tried for the, uh, how OHC from Indo-Pacific region uh, is uh, modulating the ISM onset dates. So for that, the data set we have used is uh, ANSAP GODAS uh, to calculate the ocean heat content. This we have used uh, to calculating the ocean heat content. And this is the trend of, uh, ISM uh, deviation and it is increasing since uh, pre-industrial era and the same with the ocean heat content, it is an increasing trend. Uh, so I calculated the special map of correlation between ocean heat content and the ISM onset. Yeah. So uh, the findings are like uh, in the uh, earlier onset, uh, when there is a, a earlier onset, Sorry, for the delayed onset, there is a uh, warming uh, in the southwestern Indian Ocean and the eastern Pacific Ocean. And uh, while uh, it was uh, opposite for the uh, earlier onset, uh, we have plotted the significant correlation also uh, for these maps. Uh, like these area, dot, dotted area are uh, having significance more than 95%. Uh, to validate the role of ocean heat content, uh, we have done uh, EUF analysis. Uh, so the first mood of EUF is giving the highest uh, IOD mood uh, for Indian Ocean, while uh, the in the Pacific Ocean, uh, the main dominant mood of the ocean heat content variability is uh, 
it's and so mode and you know southern oscillation uh, so i tried the correlation map with the ism onset and the pc1 principal components from the eof so uh, with the pc1 we are getting the with correlation with nino 3.4 we are getting 0 0.93 uh, with the ism onset we are getting this uh, good correlation uh, while the P ind uh, from pc1 principal component for indian ocean it, we are getting 0 0.78 uh, very good Sh correlation shivam you may please conclude your results yeah so uh, finally uh, i developed two in uh, indices heat content indices from the ocean uh, indian ocean and one is from pacific ocean so uh, i run a regression model uh, that is uh, sgt regressor uh, which gave me uh, the final result for like for what the ocean heat content when we are taking uh, uh, for a uh, ism onset to predict ism onset uh, it was giving a standard deviation of 5 4 days uh, with the prediction as 8th june as a date for this 2023 year and this is a time series of, for the prediction uh, while with actual uh, this is a time thank series you shivam of, for your yeah. discussion so we can continue the discussions during the yeah uh, thank post you. viewing session so do we have any more presenters online? No. So then we will move on to Nishchal Sharma. She'll be presenting the winter precipitation characteristics in ultra scale convection, convection permitting model. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Nishil Sharma, PhD student, Aizar Mohani. Today, I'll be discussing winter precipitation characteristics over Hindu Kush Himalayas in an ultra scale convection permitting model. So, Hindu Kush Himalayas is also known as the world's third pole. It receives substantial precipitation during winter uh, season associated with western disturbances. Though uh, the uh, various challenges associated with lack of observational network and high spatio temporal variability of precipitation, uh, there is a requirement of high uh, fine, finer grid uh, resolution uh, models. And and recent developments have been going into k scale or kilometer scale modeling so here uh, we have uh, analyzed the performance of ecmwf global 1 kilometer ifs uh, nature run with explicit deep convection which means that the model uh, is able to resolve the subgrid uh, scale processes and we do not need to parameterize convection in the model uh, here we have used different uh, source data sets to uh, validate the performance of the model and uh, over different regions of hindu kush himalayas Coming to the results, elevation dependent distribution is an important factor when we consider the uh, precipitation dynamics specifically over mountainous terrains and uh, compared to the other data sets, it is, uh, uh, the model is able to well resolve the distribution of precipitation that goes uh, throughout different, uh, uh, through the different elevations in this mountain region. Um, in terms of spatial distribution, the model is able to capture the intricate details of the uh, precipitation uh, variations uh, 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 in the region. Specifically, it is able to capture the uh, uh, precipitation precipitation hotspots of max precipitation maxima. Such details are generally missed in the uh, other coarser resolution data sets. In terms of microphysical characteristics also, the model is performing uh, quite well in, um, uh, uh, in terms, as we can see from the cloud hydrometeors. Statistic uh, statistically, the model uh, stands much closer to the reanalysis data sets followed by the satellite products and also shows a correlation greater than 0 0.7 with most, most of the data sets. So such similarities between these uh, data sets uh, underscores the reliability of this model. Uh, coming to the extreme precipitation characteristics, the model again uh, does a good, good job in giving the uh, uh, in giving the uh, hotspots of uh, precipitation maxima as well as uh, the count of the extreme precipitation indices. So con to conclude, K-scale simulations are important. Specifically, it has uh, already been established today in many talks that uh, such, uh, uh, such simulations are important when specifically we consider the complex topographies as they have a lack of observational data. Uh, the model here is able to represent the mean and extreme precipitation characteristics. And when we talk about such uh, kilometer scale modeling, it is important as it is uh, as we uh, as you uh, as we expect that such models will be able to understand this complex interplay that play, uh, goes on between the terrain and the complex topography thank you i would be happy to have any questions if you thank you mr
So I think we do, we, ha we have covered all the speakers from this session. So let us give a big applause for our young researchers from IITM Pune session. So with this, we are concluding the session and more discussions can be carried out during the poster viewing session. This is after keep right. So I request uh, Dr. Sanjay to kindly felicitate the session chair, Dr. Sapna <laughs> Yeah, we need your claps. Yeah, now we can um, have a break and um, we will reassemble here at uh, 17 hours. So yeah, 5, uh, 5 p.m. So uh, yeah, yeah, so at 17 hours, we will attend session A2, that is convection permitting modeling. That will be a live streamed through Zoom platform that will be happening over uh, uh, ICTP Italy. And uh, yes, so yeah, we can now break for tea. I would like to add, actually, let us have more interaction. See, the, the point of we sitting here and listening to that talks is that actually we should interact. So they may, they may have time constraints. They may allow only one or two talk uh, questions, but let us show our interest. See, now the next uh, session, as he told, is perfectly the, the last poster was on convective permitting modeling. So please interact. That's what uh, you and your students and all that. No? Try, to, try to ask some questions so that let them give us some. No, but they're, they're, when the chair there is asking, let us, let us get into and if they allow, otherwise, again, we'll, we'll have more time for interactions. Okay, thank you. So, tea is arranged at the Meghdoot reception hall. <laughs> okay, yeah, pardon. So, it is in the Meghdoot basement hall.
Hello, Prova Prova.
हेलो attention please uh, there are few quick announcements so so those who wants to submit the ta form that uh, i have already announced but this is again for your confirmation so this is this um, ta claims can be submitted tomorrow uh, that will be in uh,
starting now. Welcome back. I think we should start. We are already 10 minutes delayed, if I'm correct. So um, I think we had a very interesting morning. Thanks a lot. And uh, we are now looking forward to two more very important sessions. Before we start, I would like to give you a few more announcements here. Uh, you see, Silvina and I, we are developing some ideas on the fly. So all your ideas are, are really welcome. There were several questions in the, in the meantime. So first of all, in the, in the lunch break. First of all, there is a meeting with the SAT at 6 p.m. today uh, at the entrance of the Leonardo building where we, where we just were yesterday for registration. A quick um, connection because we have to organize the um, the inside sessions. You have probably realized that in at the inside sessions there are no moderators named. The inside sessions will be organized in a way that the session co-chairs are presenting their major outcome on uh, one slide. Not more than one, maybe not more than two, ideally not more than one. Um, and Selvina and myself will then will then coordinate and organize the uh, the discussion and lead this into the future. We will also uh, prepare a little bit the topics on what I have mentioned before um, this morning for the discussion about the future tomorrow morning. You know that we have this longer discussion with the, the insights from session A, where I think we get already information about new experiments, high resolution, ESMs, and so on and so forth. And then we have a long time to discuss the future. So please be prepared and uh, make up your minds until tomorrow morning what you like to bring in. It's, it's where we would like to hear your views. So all inside sessions will be the on will be work on similar a similar way. We have a quick um, um, information going back to the highlights from the sessions, and then we go into the future. And the future discussion will be moderated by Silvina and myself. Um, same as on Friday morning, when we have about a one and a half hour of the future of Cortex to wrap up where we would like to discuss with you the headline messages, um, the future of FPSs, and so on and so forth. So um, it would be really great. We asked the rapporteurs to um, to uh, um, uh, write down and, and um, monitor the, the, the good ideas from the audience so that we can bring in your ideas into it. There's also the idea that one SAT member is in each side event. I saw we have three side events tomorrow between six and eight and on Thursday between six and eight. And we aim for volunteer SAT members to report uh, before Friday, so uh, Thursday night after the dinner, um, maybe on, uh, on the important outcome of the side events, which we also need to take into account on the Friday morning. Um, then there is the, the discussion about the flagship pilot studies, also in the at least in the written program, printed program. I haven't seen much uh, information. So the idea is we already asked, as that you know this, uh, we asked the um, flagship pilot study PIs to prepare a slide with about five questions or so. I guess you have sent them to someone. So they are somewhere. Uh, I know they are uploaded in a folder somewhere, which uh, we will look at them. But you also, we also saw that there are side events on flagship pilot studies um, where we also like to collect your views. On the one session on Wednesday afternoon on flagship pilot studies, we are aiming for a little panel discussion with the those PIs of flagships who are here. I have no overview at the moment how many flagship pilot studies are represented in the room. But so this will be a bit of a surprise panel. Um, but uh, Silvina and, and myself, we will moderate the panel and the, this. So as I said, we're moderating the insights, the future, and the flagship pilot study, so that you get a bit more information on what's ahead of you. Um, then there are the um, so the, the the posters, and as Silvina also mentioned before, we would also like to bring in the knowledge from the posters. 
So it would be good if the co-chairs of the sessions and the rapporteurs agree on major messages from the posters. That's a big challenge. That's a real big challenge. But, um, but as you, you can imagine, the posters are equally important as uh, we are talking here in front. So it's, it's really uh, good to think about this and to have this organized. So I think these were the main points for now. I guess we have every other day a little bit of this announcement and, um, and try to, to get things going. So as I said, for the SUT members meeting at 6 p.m. today, um, just after the poster session and just before the nice reception starts and the drinking starts, we would like to get a quick wrap up of today. Thank you very much. And uh, now we have about 15 minutes delay and I pass over to you. Okay. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Maria Laura Vitoli. I'm with Abraham Torres. Uh, we will be chairing this session, that is a two session on convection permitting modeling. And our invited speaker is Erika Coppola from ICTP. Erika, the floor is yours. So welcome everybody. First of all, nice to see all of you in Trieste. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, summarize uh, all our experience in the past uh, five to 10 years. So the aim of this talk is like to report uh, all what we have learned in this uh, um, experience of the high resolution within Cordex. And uh, what uh, we have learned is not only thanks to the flagship that were a very, very useful instrument, but also thanks to the triggering of the discussion that the, flag, the flagship pilot study uh, brought in the whole scientific community and the interaction with the other scientific community, community like for example, the convection permitting uh, climate community. So I will start uh, with the three whys uh, we wanted to answer during this year. So why we wanted to go on convection per permitting scale? Because uh, we uh, know and wanted to be able to represent the subscale process. We wanted to see if we could reduce the uncertainty due to that. We want to investigate the new insight possible coming from this scale. Why the multimodal approach? Because we want to uh, have robust uh, evidence uh, uh, and add robust evidence to what we learned already from the single model study. We want to generalize some aspect that we learn from the single model study and also to provide a collect collective assessment of our model capability at such scale. Why it is important than the coordinated effort? Because uh, we learned that we need to keep uh, the ensemble populated because uh, we really need to have a robust result. We need to leave the room for a complementary approach, like for example, the AI approach. And uh, what we need to do is for sure model, de model development, but together. So the coordinated effort will also help our model development. So what did we know before? What what did we know before starting the coordinated effort? We basically didn't know much. We, kn we knew a few things coming from the single model study, but for example, we didn't even know if our model were able to run, to, to rain. So we say we, we learned within the project of the Alpine region that there was a large variability between the model, but there was a clear difference. We didn't know, for example, how our high resolution convection permitting model were comparing with the statistical downscaling, but we learned that from the experience with the South America flagship pilot study. We didn't know if our model were ready to go in region where the land surface coupling is very important, like the region in Africa where the Lake Victoria is playing a fundamental role in triggering high uh, precipitation events, uh, not even in region like the third pole, where, for example, we have to deal with the complex interaction of the topography. But 
we did that uh, and you, we were able to succeed in all this region. And what did we contribute uh, to the science advances? So what all this effort in the flagship pilot study on convection permitting contribute to the science advance? So we definitely have an insight more on the smaller uncertainty for convection permitting uh, simulation at the hourly scale, both for the present day and for the future. So in this is reported some statistic, like for example, the intensity, the frequency, and the high precipitation events for the summer and fall region that for the Mediterranean region are the two uh, uh, seasons in which we expect the convective event to develop. And in all statistics, statistic and in all the region that are reported on the x-axis, we see that the red bar is roughly smaller than the blue bar. We investigated that even further, always using an ensemble approach. And we found out in a recent paper submitted from Georgia Foster that the model uncertainty contribute, contribution to the total uncertainty is substantially, is substantially less in the convection permitting model compared to the standard R RCM. We have learned that uh, using a tracking algorithm, we can um, look at what is uh, the change, what, what are the change that the global warming is imposing to this uh, uh, system. And so we have learned that, uh, for example, all the property of these high precipitation events like duration, distance travel, propagation speed, volume, mean, and severity is increasing. We also have learned that the distribution of these events uh, is moved from unimodal to bimodal. So we have more of this demand in the months of June and October. And, but the precipitation is not the only thing we have looked at. We have looked also at the contribution of the high resolution, for example, on the signal of the heat wave. And what we have seen is that heat wave are heavily modified by this fine scale process and future heat wave can be more intense and robust at this scale. What also we have tried to do is uh, try to understand if we can use complementary approach to back up the fact that these models are uh, very expensive to run. And so this is very an example here in North Italy of very extreme events. There were several flood happening. These are our all, this is all the ensemble of our model. This is our observation. And this is one of the first AI method that looks uh, promising. So just to summarize this part, what was the contribution of the coordinated effort was to consolidate what we, what we knew before. It was to add to what we have been uh, knowing since uh, uh, 10 years ago. But now what is uh, the step forward? So what is the advance uh, where we have to go? Can we really trust this result? How can we add robustness to this result? And from the brainstorming of several community, this is what we think should be the future direction. First of all, it's uh, well asked from all the community that the domain should uh, be larger than what we use today, because for example, we have to take into account how the large scale, the change in the large scale, it's impacting the small scale. Of course, we need to move to transient simulation. We need definitely to keep a multimodal approach. There is a high consensus on this. We have to exploit the complementarity between the dynamical and statistical approach. We need to have a worldwide strategy for collaboration. Uh, that is the fundamental characteristic of the CORDEX framework. We need to have uh, a ch choice of domain that allow to include all the community and not exclude the work of anybody. And on long term, of course, uh, we need to have a continental approach. But what about the work, the model development we need to do together? So for sure, we know we need to include the urban. It's something that we have seen already this morning. We need to look at the vegetation dynamic and how this is feedback, how is this feedback at this local scale? We need to include the hydrology and the groundwater as Klaus showed this morning, but also we need to have something more in our model about the sea ice, the glacier, the land, the water use scenario, the aerosol, the ocean, and last but not least, the human. So I just want to focus on two of these uh, points, so larger domain 
and considering a worldwide strategy, what, what does it mean? What could be uh, the idea behind this? The idea is that we need to define, we need to keep a cortex to help us uh, to gather the community. So we need a strategy to define domain that as such resolution are very, very expensive, but we need to keep this effort in a way that we don't start to lose uh, the group of scientists uh, simulating on, over on uh, their own domain of interest. So for example, for Europe, we could envisage something like that, like as well as uh, for the other continent. And then we need to really keep looking at how the large scale is uh, uh, influencing our resolution domain. Do we have change in the large scale that are impacting the result in our uh, high resolution domain, hopefully larger than what we use uh, today? And so what is uh, that uh, could, which could be uh, a strategy that the convection permitting regional climate modeling uh, within Cordex could have? We could have as a goal to address the regional climate change research challenge globally. And in particular, we could focus in the global south from which we learn a lot in this year. How we could develop frontier research project um, in climate science, for example, optimizing this high resolution model uh, that taking the advantage of the interaction with many uh, community as we did so far in Cordex. Why is this relevant? It's relevant because uh, this will enhance the understanding of an important physical process, like for example, the tropical convection, but also in this way, we will manage to provide through climate service, actionable climate information. What is the added value that we can get? We can use a bottom-up approach. We can have a model development that can be tailored to the region and to the most relevant research question. And also we can remove the data access barrier that we know well, that was one of the main uh, problem in the up to today. And so this is just a sketch to show you how we could act. So we should have, you sh we should be a research nexus for policy relevant and actionable regional climate information. We need to develop uh, side by side uh, our modeling ability, but also the interaction with the society and move across all the time span. We need to look at the past, the current and the future. We need to also look at the time scale of the policy and how relevant are the information that we need to uh, produce for that. And this is then, what is it in the reality? I just took an example from the latest IPCC experience. So if we look at the South American continent, this was one of the two continents in which we were able to uh, build up the whole chain. So have an assessment on the observed and projected hazard, vulnerability and exposure, and come up with a map of the risk divided per sector. This was very tough for all the other region, and uh, this was only possible for Europe and Central and South America due to the literature gap and uh, also the data and modeling uh, gap. And with this, I'm done. Okay, any questions? No? Where? Stefan. Hello. Hello, I'm from Pune. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you... My name is Sridhar Naik. I am from Japan Meteorological Corporation. Thank you for your nice presentation. I was wondering whether can we use, whether can we use the, CP, the CPM models for forecasting purposes? I did not see any time series that uh, can predict a particular extreme events or something like that. Do you have checked any such kind of uh, time series analysis? Did you make it? So, sorry, I missed the last part. Can we use this model? Yeah, for miss the, 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 the convective permit model. Can we use for forecasting purposes? For forecasting. Yeah, forecasting. whether forecasting, okay. yeah. 
forecast, forecasting. So those model, uh, some of these models are taken from the weather forecasting community. So definitely this, uh, the uh, technique that we inherited, it's coming from the weather forecasting community. So sure, some of these models are being used and can be used also for that. Yeah, I, I have one more question regarding the large scale influence. So do you suggest uh, the large scale uh, is necessary to use the convecting per convective permitting model? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the first part. What do, do, I, do I use for yeah. the large scale? Large scale, in, yeah, large scale. Uh, you, you have taken large the, scale is represented yeah. through the lateral boundary yeah. condition yeah. and yeah, we yeah, can find that... perfect boundary condition or with the GCM driving. Okay, okay. that's necessary to improve the model capability, right? Okay, next question. Thanks very much, Erica. Um, you mentioned in one of your in, in one of your final slides about the um, about the different time scales and how Cortex has up until now really focused on climate projections, long term climate change, maybe middle of the century or so as well, which we're now fast approaching. But increasingly, you know, demands for information are constrained more and more by, you know, more short term and near term climate change, especially demands for information on, for example, will next summer look like this summer in the Mediterranean? Um, so what do you think about our strategy, our, our current strategy, which has a time scale of about 10 years from start to finish of uh, products production? and the demands for more near-term climate information and if we need to, how we address that in our strategy. Okay, so I mean, uh, the first answer that I think uh, can be given to that is that uh, it's more and more uh, developing uh, this, uh, the science of the climate attribution. And so by doing study of attribution of specific, specific events that we are observing in the present, uh, we can uh, try to answer those need of knowing will, what will be the typical summer in a couple of two, three years. By doing this, we really need uh, the uh, possibility to use uh, the high resolution simulation that we have, because typically for attribution study, you, only, you don't need only the present and the past observation, but you also need model that they are able to represent similar kind of events, like for example, this cloud. So this is one direction we could do, we could go. So enhance this kind of uh, study and employing our model in this kind of study to show the capability. But of course, as you say, our time scale is a bit disaligned with the next uh, five, 10 years. So I think we have to also develop strategy to focus on the next, uh, um, let's say decadal time scale that is because we are more and more request about this information and I don't think we are ready as a community to answer to that. Okay, thank you, Erika. Um, sorry, we, we don't have it. We don't we have it. Well, we will move to the next speaker. Uh, it's Erasmo Bonano from the Hadlet Center. He will be talking about tropical cyclones change using convection permitting simulations. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk about a project, a recent project that we have done. Uh, the purpose of the project was actually to generate high to generate high impact events for the study, the study of, uh, of uh, coastal flooding in Shanghai. They were really interested in uh, like worst case scenario for the future. And the work has been done in collaboration with the Shanghai Climate Center, part of the CMA, and uh, for the coastal flooding bit with the uh, University of Delft. 
So what's the starting point of this, from my point of view, in this, in framing the, the issue of the issue of the status of the projection for uh, uh, that area, for Shanghai, the Shanghai region? Well, uh, what we have in mind is most consistent with this figure from, uh, sorry. what did I do here? <laughs> sorry, oh, okay, thank you. I'll do it the most simple. Uh, this is the region of interest in this particular basin. We are actually studying one small bit in this particular basin. And what we get from uh, AR5 in particular, which focuses on the same uh, time frame and uh, upper end scenario we are interested in, is that basically we have a, a robust reduction in frequency, a robust increase of frequency of the higher event category four and five, a robust increase in intensity of the of the storm and a robust increase on in the precipitation associated with that. Uh, this study is based, this figure is based on a range of different sources, which include, uh, I mean, from statistical downscaling to either last study, and has been uh, updated recently by Kutsun et al. from a group of WA experts on, on the field, uh, who gather even more information about all the available projection in the whole uh, world basin uh, where there are uh, uh, tropical storms. And uh, uh, one of the main components of this new study is the use of uh, downscaling experiment, which are mostly based on, I mean, some of them are based on convection permitting model, but usually in a framework where by the use uh, reanalysis uh, boundary condition as a baseline and they estimate the effect of climate change for the future by using pseudo global warming approach. And, uh, uh, and so as a perturbation with respect to the baseline from the reanalysis and uh, given the fact that they tend to simulate the whole domain, the whole basin actually, not domain, uh, the, there is also most of the time the need of spectral nudging to keep the large scale consistency with the driving uh, condition. I will go to right here. In this approach, instead going to uh, the far end, upper end, uh, with a strong increase in temperature and uh, all the associated change, we thought it would be better to use a fully physically consistent future coming directly from the GCN, hence the Cortex. Uh, set up. In particular, we are using uh, the uh, orange domain at 12 kilometers to simulate the, the region, basically the whole basin with the formation and development of tropical storms. And there's a only region which is focused around Shanghai, which is actually here. So the typical trajectory goes from the south toward the coast and then years back uh, to maximize also the spin up of the storm entering the smaller domain to increase the chances of generating smaller scale feature. Uh, this, the period to consider are 1981-2000 for the historical part. And of course, we went for the high range scenario RCP 8.5 at the end of the century. The choice of the model will be justified later, but I would say like standard uh, setup we use for Cortex. So there is a, uh, the update of the SST directly from the GCM, no changes on bias correction. A daily time scale, time very the uh, greenhouse gas concentration growing with uh, with the scenario or the, the RCP. Uh, there is a time varying uh, changes in the aerosol diagnostic, which is taken by the radiation, the cloud code, uh, which is depending only on the scenario, not the particular GCM. And we got the standard six hourly update for the SCM and three hourly for uh, the GCM. I failed to, men to mention already that this. Some simulation, some data from this work is already being used to simulate coastal flooding in this paper. Uh, we are using GCM, and so we create the problem of is the model that we have chosen able to generate a, a reasonable statistics for the present climate? So, for that, we need at least a basic assessment of the large scale environmental conditions which lead to formation and development of uh, tropical cyclones. Uh, in particular, we need realistic SST. We need a good description of the days where the flow is not so strong, which led to the generation of deep convection. And we need uh, the information about like, the same consistency with the vertical stability, a good vertical stability from the model itself. These are the large scale. Then there are smaller scale uh, variables, which are also important, but I'm not considering this particular uh, 
work. And so we start with the SST here, the comparison of the SST from Argent to Yes with this the observed one. You can see that the region of interest, this is our domain here, uh, there's a very uh, uh, relatively small bias. Uh, the bias goes up in the region of the Russia current and then it goes or even worse on the, on the center of the Pacific. But basically, we are happy with this uh, as, as a reasonable, workable uh, starting SST. What is interesting here is that for the climate change for the period we have chosen, it gives a more almost uh, constant, smooth pattern of change over the tropical area that we are considering which is more or less 3.5 uh, degree. This is for a model that uh, uh, for this time slice that we are considered gives a, a change of 4.8 degrees. So we are really at the upper end of what we got from CME5. Uh, from the atmosphere, we have this condition on the, uh, the I mean, we'll say weak flow, but basically a weak uh, difference between upper level wind and lower level wind, which Again, it's one of the conditions that leads to help the formation and the development of tropical storms. And here we see we have a larger bias in the model. You can see here, a stronger wind. And uh, this is possibly related, more really is actually related to the monsoonal flow from Argent to Yes. Uh, but basically, I would consider this acceptable in the framework of what we usually get in the regional camera model simulation. In the future, there's a strong reduction of the monsoonal flow, and so the associated signal in the in the wind shear, which leads to a reduction of uh, the wind, uh, basically over Indochina, uh, but also a, a slight increase in the number of days where the condition for tropical storm uh, tropical storm formation is favorable. Um, this is one bit, one part, like the first part of the problem. The GCM is doing something decent that we can use. The baseline is decent, but of course, we are using an intermediate step before the convection permitting model, that is the 12 kilometer model. So we have to check that indeed the 12 kilometer model is keeping the same patterns as the, the, the GCM. It's not a problem for SST because they use directly in the SCM, but it is a problem for atmospheric boundary condition. And so this is same plot as for the top. This is what the 12 kilometer model does with this information, how it reproduces within the domain. And let's see that, I would say not completely by chance, but there is a, a, a correction. The RCM counteracts. This is the difference between the historical, the GCM and the RCM. So the RCM counteracts the biases of the model. Uh, this is probably very well justified for the lower part because the interaction of the monsoonal flow with the surface uh, mountain geography and coastline, not so much for, for, for this area. But anyway, the end result reinforced the idea that we can use this setup to uh, generate reasonable information, reasonable baseline for, the, uh, uh, for, for our region, for the south, southeast China. Uh, Temperature has also been studied with a similar result to this. It's not too bad, and it is well reproduced by the RCA. I didn't mention the local variable. Those are considered. Ah, OK, the result, very quickly. I don't know. <laughs> that was so slow. Main result for everybody wants to see, seen also in another region, is that uh, taking the main uh, um, diagnostic for the diurnal cycle uh, precipitation to check how the uh, what kind of improvement you get from the CPM, you see that observation and uh, CPM place this at the uh, in early to late afternoon in the southern part, in the tropical part of the region. And this is not something that the 12 kilometer model does for tropical storm very quickly. But basically, this is the maximum intensity of the storm versus the depth of the storm at the same time. And you can see that the black line is the observation. The light blue line is 12 kilometer, and the four kilometers is the darker blue line. And you can see there is some improvement toward the observation from in the 12, uh, in the four kilometer model, but we are still in a situation where we are far from the uh, observed line, and in particular, we don't have many events uh, uh, above category five, probably one or two. The same information, the same uh, uh, plot, has been, uh, the same uh, points have been. Uh, 
uh, fit to a slim value uh, to a slim value distribution, we can see that uh, there is an increase. The red part is the future. There is a, a, an increase of uh, uh, intensity in the future that's particularly visible at the upper end. So you can see that, for instance, the ten event period of the present climate would become a two year period in the future. This is both common to the twelve kilometer and to the uh, to the four kilometer. Uh, these two models don't give any way the same uh, range, the same uh, curve. It seems to be saturated, in particular, for kilometers. You don't get the outlier that you see in the observation. And for precipitation, you see, this is a, this is a much in trajectory, much in plots from, uh, much in uh, points from uh, 12 kilometer, 4 kilometer. You can see that basically 12 kilometer tends to blob, but you see the higher resolution structure. But at the end of the day, but in the composite, center around the storm and uh, azimuthal uh, average for each radius around each storm, you get this kind of plot, where you can see that the 12 kilometer is far too uh, wet uh, at the peak. That the four kilometer is, uh, goes much uh, closer to the observation. And for the future, we have this very strong increase in precipitation, which is both on the peak intensity, but also on the average intensity, which is calculated by average up to a radius. And these two increases and increases in average are actually something that goes above the classical variable range. Uh, and this is not strange because the result of Knudsen and Alcho will put them in the upper 25, uh, upper, upper quartile of the result. So it's something that we get from tropical cyclone. And this was basically the end of my presentation. So if I will say one last thing, I would say uh, the four kilometer improves the uh, description of tropical storms, but uh, we get the same result basically from the 12 kilometer for climate change in particular. So that's it usable. Thanks. Sorry, we, we don't have uh, time for questions. So we can uh, um, ask you in the coffee break, right? Thank you. Well, our next speaker is Julia Curio. Hello. Sorry, we don't have any time for questions. Hi, um, welcome everyone. So I'm going to talk about uh, Tibetan plateau vortices, something that probably not a lot of people have heard of, um, but I will also present some results from our uh, Cortex Flexure Pilot Study, CPTP. Um, yes, so Tibetan plateau vortices, um, on, the, on the map you see the Tibetan plateau and Asia, and you see a lot of black tracks, and this is basically an example for July 2008. These are all... Um, of these vortices we, we have tracked for this month using uh, Kevin Hodges' tracking algorithm track. And TBVs are frequent phenomena um, and they're mainly present at the 500 hectopascal level and they are being tracked in the um, relative vorticity field. And one thing to note is that 500 hectopascal over the Tibetan plateau is relatively close to the surface. Um, so they're meso alpha scale uh, cyclones and they have a vertical extent of two to three kilometers. Um, these systems have a, a pronounced uh, annual cycle with a maximum in summer and um, a minimum in winter. Um, and they basically move eastwards from their genesis regions um, along a band of high track densities um, at 34 degrees north. Uh, this has to do with the position and strength of the subtropical westerly jet. And um, as you all can also see in this example is that only a minority of these systems um, actually leaves the Tibetan plateau. So here we see the, um, how much precipitation um, these systems actually contribute to the monthly total precipitation. This is the average for, for July for uh, error interim. Um, and over the Tibetan plateau, these systems basically contribute up to 70%, these blue shades in the center. 
Um, but downstream of the Tibetan plateau, um, the contribution is up to 10% or maybe up to 20% at the edge of the plateau on average. But if we look at individual months, so this is just for July 2008, um, you can see that there's one um, system, oops, basically leaving the Tibetan plateau here and then moving all the way to the coast. Um, and this system um, basically contributed yeah, 60, 70% um, at the edge of the Tibetan plateau. And this was really just due to a single event. So they can be really important on the event basis. And this um, specific event uh, triggered uh, flooding and um, really, really heavy rainfall. So there was one station in the Sichuan Basin which recorded um, a quarter of the annual rainfall in just 48 hours. So they can have a really big impact. So here you can see the same system again on the map. You can follow the red circle around um, how the while the um, TPV moves off the Tibetan plateau. And we have here a storm centered view of the, of the storm. <laughs> and the cross is the, the center of the vortex and the blue and green shading is the precipitation. And you also have the orography outlines in gray and the dotted lines are the updrafts. And as you can see, when the um, cyclone is still over the Tibetan plateau, it only has is connected to very little amount of rainfall. But as soon as we move to the edge of the Tibetan plateau, you can see that there's more precipitation developing at the slopes um, east of the cyclone center, and this continues, and you also get very strong updrafts. And then the system moves off the plateau, but the precipitation stays terrain locked at the edge of the plateau. So, which shows us that the system is not actually bringing precipitation or moisture with it from the plateau, but it's just dynamically triggering um, this was, was at the end actually a mesoscale convective system at the slope of the um, Tibetan plateau. And um, this basically happens when you watch this moisture transport, the white dot is the cyclone and the yellow colors is like strong moisture transport. You can see that when the system is moving off, now this stopped now back and forth and when you follow it you suddenly get these yellow colors in the Sichuan basin so it basically taps into a moisture source that usually bypasses the uh, Sichuan basin to the south in this one event so this was just the back up and so we actually tracked that um, also the MCS um, in, in brightness temperature data um, and also looked at the uh, accumulated precipitation in iMERGE and we um, identify this um, TPV, which moves off the plateau. And then we also can identify the MCS that's basically in the Sichuan Basin. Um, and this event um, was then selected as a, one of three case studies for our um, Cortex flagship pilot study, convection permitting third pole, advancing hydroclimate research over the third pole with kilometer scale modeling. And here you see the, the different domains for the different um, modeling centers. So in total, we have uh, 36 ensemble members with um, um, a multi-physics WARF ensemble, uh, MPAS run regional and global, Cosmos CLM simulations, ICON and Rexiam. And they were either directly downscaled um, from era five or with the 12 kilometer intermediate domain. And the overview paper by Andreas Prine um, has been published last year. And there's also a nice um, website, so you can have a look at this. Um, and at the moment, we have these um, three case studies, um, a flood producing MCS, which I just presented a bit, um, a heavy rain producing monsoon period in 2014, um, a heavy snow event. And also, we have now um, one year simulations for the water year 2020. And the publication for this is in preparation, and I think it's going to be submitted in the next couple of days. Um, and ultimately, we will also going to have some decadal runs, but this is still um, a bit in uh, not not clear who's going to be able to afford to run these simulations. Um, so when we look at these MCS case, so in the top row, um, this is basically accumulated precipitation for for the period of this event. Um, and in the top row, you have the observations. Um, and in the um, the two reds, um, squares show the only two um, simulations that actually kind of uh, capture this event. So, um, oops, sorry. One is the where we basically nudged WARF back to the large scale circulation. 
and the other one is um, the icon simulation. All the others don't really um, capture the precipitation, so it's it's really difficult to simulate um, this event. Um, and when we um, look, so it's difficult to capture this MCS re, um, connected precipitation. But then we also look back at this uh, the vortex evolution in this case um, because I showed you before there was this moving off TPV, and these are Hofmüller diagrams of um, filtered vorticity. Um, it's time against um, uh, longitudes, uh, latitude, yeah, longitudes. Um, and there we can also see that in in era five we see this nice streak of vorticity where the where the vortex develops and moves east. And in all the wharf um, simulations and other other simulations, this is basically too weak. Only when we nudge back, we get a bit more of a single uh, signal. And again, ICON is uh, performing quite well. Uh, we don't really know why ICON is performing much better than the others. It has a bit of a higher resolution, but um, and this confirms again uh, what I've uh, also seen in in other work that uh, this TPV development of this uh, vortex plays a key role for the development of this extreme precipitation uh, MCS event downstream. Um, so then the question arose, okay, we, we, we know this for case events um, that a TPV costs a lot of precipitation or an MCS costs a lot of precipitation, but how often do actually extreme events in this region occur in connection to mesoscale weather events? So we had a master student looking at this in, in observational um, data, and for the Sichuan Basin, so these are the stations that were available to us for daily accumulates of rainfall. And she basically picked the 10 most extreme events and made sure that these events are separate events and it's not just one event in the whole basin. And the strongest event had 424 millimeters of rainfall during one day. And the, the weakest of the 10 had 255, which is still well above the 99th percentile for this data set, which would be 85 millimeter per day. So yeah, they're really strong events. Um, and you can see here um, just the development of this one, one of them events where it goes basically through the, through the Sichuan Basin. Um, and then we checked in our track databases of MCSs and TPVs. Um, if we can can find systems that occur at the same time at these extreme events, and we found for more than half of them um, that we could attribute it to mesoscale weather events, and even for the ones where it was not not a clear event found in the databases, we still could see that there were mesoscale disturbances. And this just depends on what you set as tracking thresholds. So they were a bit weaker than we defined it has to be for a TPV or a bit shorter, but this is just something we were the first to use this algorithm for TPV. So it's still a bit, we still have to adapt the, the tracking a bit. And then we also looked um, basically at the composite of these event and could show that during um, these extreme events, um, we have a stronger uh, northward moisture transport into the Sichuan Basin which you can, can see here. So this is the anomaly, so the event composite minus the climatology. And we also have a stronger transport towards the edge of the Tibetan plateau. And this is a region where you're basically pushing a lot of moisture against orography, where you also have very good conditions for um, convection. And then you get this um, extreme event started. Um, and the same is true. We also looked at the jet connection again. And during these extreme events, the jet is positioned further south than during the climatology. And coming back to the um, convection permitting runs for this, um, we also found that a larger domain size resulted in improved skill um, due to boundary interactions with the jet stream. So the first um, D1 small domain and also D2 were basically cutting through the northern part of the jet stream, which um, caused a problem. And this is again, highlighting um, that you have to include these large scale features if you want to, to simulate these regional um, events. And with that, I leave the key points. Thank you, Julia. We have a question for one quick, uh, we have time for one quick question, please. At, online? No. Okay. But okay. We move to the next uh, speaker, it's Christian Stassen from uh, Australia. Thank you, Christian.
thank you very much for having me. Um, so I will be talking about our convective or kilometer scale climate modeling development over Australia. And that is mostly work done by Emma, um, but I will be presenting on Emma's behalf. And I would also like to acknowledge all our other co-authors of this work, because as you know, it's a lot of work to get kilometer scale modeling up. And a lot of people have contributed to this. Um, and to get us started a little bit, um, just a bit of a motivation. So Australia's climate is highly variable with lots of extreme weather events ranging from extreme rain, tropical cyclones to drought and bushfires. And many types of these extreme events are predicted to become more extreme with climate change. And there's an increasing need for robust fine scale um, projections in uh, the present and the future climate. Um, a little bit about the talk itself. So what is BARPA? It stands for the Bureau of Meteorology Atmospheric Regional Projections for Australia. And it's a convective scale experimental design. And I'm also going to show, oh, sorry, I'm going to talk about the experimental design and I'm going to show some early trial results of our convective modeling as well. Um, I also have a poster that basically talks about similar things, but in a bit more detail. So our model specifications, BAPA comes in two flavors. First, we have our regional model that has a resolution of 17 kilometers. It's, that's what we call BAPA R. And it, it runs over the Cortex Austral Asia domain, which is the, this red domain here. And BAPA R is this black one that just is kind of on the outside of this. And we have downscaled with BAPA R seven different GCMs for four experiments the ERA 5 evaluation run and then different CMIM-6 models for historical SSP-126 and SSP-370. And we've done that for the period um, covering 1960s to 2100. Um, for the atmosphere model, we use the UM version 11.9 with the GA7 um, science configuration plus fountain buster and GA8 convection scheme. And for the land, we use Jules version six. And then after the model gives us all this data, and then we have a post-processing and quality control workflow to make sure that our data meets Cortex standards. And then the second flavor is BAPA-C, or the convective permitting scale, which we run 4.4 kilometers, and the domain for BAPA-C is this blue one that is more focused on Australia. And at this stage, our plan is to downscale three GCMs with BAPA-C, and that will be nested inside of BAPA R. And we're doing that for three experiments, a 10 year era five evaluation run, and then the historical and SSP 370 scenario. And that will cover a period from 1995 to 2060. And how that looks like in comparison to BAPA R is, is shown here. So BAPA R is the whole time series here. And then the, the solid lines in, in the middle is, is the convective scale runs. And so far we have a one year trial that is focused around 2013, and that's the results that I will be showing today. And then again, we have a post-processing and quality control after we have all this model data to make sure that we're meeting Cortex data standards. We're also using some updated land surface ancillaries, and our model has been co-developed with the XSA uh, numerical weather prediction model um, that we use at the Bureau for our forecasting itself, for, for uh, NWP, and also with the BERRA C2 reanalysis. And it's intended to form a much, or it's, it's intended to be part of a much bigger ensemble um, together with the CCAM ACS uh, model and complemented by NARCLIM and Cortex FPS. And then for BAPA C, we're using as atmospheric model the UM at version 13 with the latest science configuration. And for land, we use Jules version 7. Let's look at some of the early results of our one-year trial. So here I'm showing BAPA C cyclones. That one shows you the winds in, in, the, in the convective scale model compared to the regional model. And you can see that there's much more structure in there and you can see the eye wall. And similar, if we look at vorticity, you can actually see the vorticity rings of this tropical cyclone, but in the regional model, there's, there's just nothing there. So convective scale model doing much better in that regard. And also cyclones in Barpasi are getting to much higher intensities and wind speeds than they did in um, our regional model. So that, that's what we've shown here. So Barpasi is those red dots and you can see it goes to much higher wind speeds and compares better to observations. 
And the cyclone paths in Barpasi can be quite different to the regional model, but I guess that's expected as we have a quite large domain and it has freedom to develop its own weather patterns. Um, in our regional model, we use nudging because we initially found some issues at the boundary where we had a cyclone trying to leave and it couldn't leave and interacted with the boundary. Um, but in Barpasi, we have not seen any of those artificial interactions. So we, we, we don't intend of using nudging in these runs. Um, some more evaluations. So we're looking at wind, wind gusts as well compared to station data. And we compared um, the 2013 distributions of model, uh, modeled to station-based hourly maximum wind gusts at the station location only. And we generally found that the BARPA C is doing much better than BARPA R, also saying that the stations have been quality controlled before we, we, we decided which ones to use. And in general, both BARPA C, the, um, BARPA C is doing better than BARPA R. There were two different wind gust parameterizations. There's a scale aware one and one that's not aware of the scale. Um, but we found that the scale aware one is doing slightly better than the non scale aware one, which is why we will use that one going forward. And here we plot how the wind gusts compare to observations and just showing two different regions here. But generally, like I said, we can see that BARPA C is, is staying closer to observations than um, BARPA R. But I also want to highlight that this is only just one year. So there's a lot of room for internal variability. Looking at rainfall distributions, so we compared BARPA C also to GPM hourly rainfall for, for lots of different um, regions. And again, you can see that BARPA C is doing better in all but one of those regions. Um, but again, it's just a one year trial. So we, we compared it to lots of one year slices of our regional model to account for a bit of um, internal variability. But yeah, like, like I said, we, we're seeing improvements in, in our convective scale run. Um, there were also some issues that we had while we were developing our convective scale model. So there were some high soil moisture levels in urban areas due to issues with the, the soil physics. And it, it's evident as a slower drying down after um, rainfall events. So here in orange, you can see the urban area in. Um, BAPA R and in adjacent areas. And you can see that after rainfall events, it has a hard time trying to, to dry down again. And it basically comes down to an issue where in the urban fraction, there's the leaf area index is set to zero, which affects evapotranspiration. And basically once the moisture is at the urban tile, it has a hard time to leave and it cannot dry down. So we fixed it by first using a different um, um, data set to define the urban fraction in the model. We're using now world cover data set instead of the default CCI data set. And we also in, uh, improved on the leaf area index, which was set to zero before. Um, and that addressed the issue and that we fixed the issue. You can see on the bottom four plots here, where we now see that the moisture is not trapped anymore in the urban tile as it was before. And that, that is work that we have done that is work that we have done in collaboration with Matthew Lipson and, and Christoph Rudiger, who also both work at the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, for that, I'm happy to summarize um, the results. So we have CPM projections provide an important line of evidence to provide more reliable assessment of projected changes in the frequencies and intensities of uh, hazardous weather events across Australia. And we're currently developing convection permitting climate projections for the Australian Climate Service. And early trial results that have shown showed that show promising results for, for hazardous relevant variables, such as wind gusts, tropical cyclones, and extreme rainfall. And the next steps for us are to run and evaluate a, a longer, a 10 year trial era five run going from 2013 to 2022. And then with this time period, that will also enable us to use other additional high resolution data sets for evaluations such, such as radar data and Himarari satellite. And then based on that um, analysis, we also decide which of those GCMs that we've downscaled with BARPA R, we're downscaling further. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay.
We have time for questions. One question from uh, Ponya's side. Uh, okay, I... one question from Pune. Yeah, yeah. Then... Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, the nice talk and uh, excellent efforts. Um, it is quite evident that uh, CPM simulations always produce excess rain and also more number of extremes. Uh, can you comment on it, why th that is happening in the CPM scale simulations and how to be fixed? I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the full question. But so I he's asking so why repeat? you have uh, overestimation precipitation. The extreme precipitation. Yeah. Yes, so we, we do see extreme precipitation. I think a lot of convective scale models struggle with excessive precipitation. Um, we, we have no fix for it, unfortunately, but I think that convective scale models improve in other parts, such as, for example, we've seen in the last talk, the timing of the extreme precipitation and the excessive absolute value of precipitation, I think is easier fixed with things like bias correction, but the timing of the extreme precipitation is not as easy to fix. So we think that in general, it, it is doing better, even though the extreme precipitation is excessive. Yeah, just to follow up, uh, the more number of extremes, uh, no, more number of extreme episodes also quite evident, quite noticeable in CPM simulations. In such case, uh, is, uh, do you think uh, the future projections of these extreme events uh, are they robust? Um, I think the question was related to the robustness of the climate change projections for precipitation. Um, I think I think we've seen it in maybe not the talked before, but maybe one or two talks before, that in general, the convective models seem to agree more in the climate change response of extreme precipitation. I think it goes back to them not using a parametrization, but actually modeling the, the extreme precipitation or precipitation processes. So yeah, I think that, I think the re results with the climate change response get getting more robust with convective scale models. Okay, so Is there something, uh, something relevant to non-hydrostatic core? That needs to be fixed well. Or, or okay. Uh, so, so it's sometimes hard to understand the question. Okay, we have to go to another uh, question. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. More than a question is a command. So uh, due to the fact that you said it's very expensive to run uh, this uh, high resolution, and then I see that in your uh, strategy, you are planning also to run two different SSP for 10 years uh, time slices. So I was wondering, did you think about to optimize the effort and maybe just run a single scenario and more focus on around global warming levels so that you can have, for example, 20 year time slice around uh, one, two, or even three global warming level instead of reproducing three times, 10, 10 years time slice for two scenario. This could optimize a bit. So you mean why, why we use a continuous run over maybe using time slices instead? No, instead of using two scenarios, just use one and just choose the global warming level that you are in that are relevant for your policymaker climate service. I, I think our priority is the SSP three seventy run, um, but I think we we would like to run another scenario as well to make the ensemble bigger. Okay, maybe we can iterate after. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We, we, we don't have uh, any time. Sorry, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Manuela Piccelli.
So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in this presentation, we show you some methods that we built for the detection of disasters like storm in the Great Alpine uh, region and their sensitivity to the global warming. So as a first step, uh, let's recap the concept of, concept of uh, EV precipitation. This is meant to be an episode of uh, abnormally high uh, precipitation, usually above the 95th percentile of the precipitation distribution. Uh, but of course, this definition is a lot depending on the location we are considering, the season, the length of the database that you are using, and also the mechanism behind this kind of events can be very different among different regions, as well also their impact at ground in terms of floods, for example. We know that the convection permitting models uh, uh, working at a kilometer scale allow us to represent the most extreme precipitation laying at the very um, um, end of detail of the distribution of precipitation, which are usually uh, underestimated or underrepresented by cumulus para parameterized models. That's why we, for this study, we decided to use uh, the simulation produced within the Cordex F flagship pilot study dedicated to the convection, which um, and, uh, has available a lot of simulation um, uh, over the domain uh, so-called Great Alpine Area, which is the one in the red square here. We have simulation covering decades, and for example, for the evaluation run, we uh, have simulation going from 2000-2009. And among all the EV precipitation event uh, across this area, we, we of course are interested mainly to the ones that are causing severe impact at ground in terms of, in terms of damages to the ecosystem, human losses or uh, um, uh, economical losses. So given these constraints, we have selected a bunch of uh, EV precipitation events occurring in the area. Uh, some of these are summer cases uh, in the northern flank of the uh, alpine uh, topography, and some other is uh, um, uh, fall cases uh, uh, over the alpine region. And to show the method that we built, I will use uh, this uh, case of November 2002 over Italy. And um, this case was uh, actually due to the evolution of an upper river trough entering the Western Mediterranean and uh, inducing a wet, stable southwesterly flow over the Alps. A characteristic of this event was its persistence for many days over the area, which um, uh, made the ground uh, to be saturated by the precipitation and uh, finally turned into uh, floods, especially uh, around the area of northeast of Italy. In terms of precipitation, you see here the total precipitation of the event between 22 and 30 of November. And you see that uh, over the northeast of Italy, um, uh, around 700 millimeter were finally observed. And uh, uh, the maximum daily precipitation recording during this event is laying uh, well far above the 99.9 percentile of the precipitation distribution across 10 years for this area. So uh, how an ensemble of convection permitting model represent an event like this? For uh, evaluating uh, this, we have used the 15 models uh, belonging to the Cordex um, FPS Conv experiment. And uh, this is how these models are representing the event. Here you see the observation and the single model that are participating to this ensemble. And you see that uh, on average, the model are uh, uh, producing a mean total precipitation over the Northeast of Italy, which is quite close to the observed one. And uh, every model represents their maximum daily precipitation observed during the week uh, um, characterized this event uh, in, the, in the detail of the distribution that they produce for, over this area. So uh, for uh, detecting the, this kind of event, we have built uh, two methods. One is based on the daily precipitation. And um, for this, we build the uh, um, probability distribution function of the daily precipitation for each grid cell of uh, the data set we are considering. And then we go and, uh, to see how many uh, grid cells reach or go above this, the threshold of the P99.9 of this distribution. 
um, uh, com um, compared to the total uh, grid cell uh, of the area we are interested to. The, the fraction uh, of uh, this uh, um, counting is reported in this plot here. And you see we are so able to represent a set of dates. Among these, you see represented the event. These are, these are, uh, this plot is made from the observation. This is uh, the event that we were dealing with just before, the one of November 2002. And uh, all the other uh, indicated with the green arrow are uh, smaller event, but uh, documented uh, with uh, some impact ground in terms of flooding, inundation, or uh, windstorm, hailstorms that uh, are uh, documenting, documented in literature. The second method is similar, but based on the um, probability distribution function of the uh, precipitation volume of a storm as tracked by a tracking algorithm. In this case, this is the anchor uh, uh, tracking algorithm. You see that in both, uh, with both methods, we are able to uh, detect uh, EV precipitation event across the season. The two uh, sample of extreme uh, events are not the same, but they share a lot of uh, events between the two, the two methods. So now applying the first method, to uh, convection permitting models uh, uh, driven by GCM projection. Uh, here, namely, are using four of the available uh, uh, models, namely CNRM, ETH, uh, uh, HCLIN community, and ICT1. Uh, you see that uh, looking at the plot of the fraction of uh, uh, grid cell interested by EV precipitation, that um, comparing present and the end of century, present is between 96 and 2005, and end of century is the last decade of the century. You see that uh, all the models see an increase of the number of, um, of uh, events detected uh, in, in uh, full season in particular, but this is true in uh, all the season, and also uh, larger areas uh, eaten by this kind of events. So. Now we are interested to uh, learn something about the dynamical signature which is associated to these extreme events. Here you see the average of the large scale condition associated to the dates that were uh, sampled from the observation through our method. And you see that on average, these extremes in uh, fall season are associated to uh, North Atlantic trough entering the Mediterranean with the high pressure sitting on the east side of the domain. And uh, on the right, you see the same uh, fields, uh, the geopotential at 500 atmospheric and mean sea level pressure, but for the four models driving the convection permitting ones. And on average, you see that for the evaluation run, uh, the ensemble uh, is quite well comparing with the ERA-5 in terms of structure. So also in this case, we see that this kind of event in the model are also seen uh, associated to uh, North Atlantic trough and blocking on the eastern side of the domain. And the same pattern is seen in the historical run. Now, if we go looking uh, how this will change in the future, you see same kind of uh, field represented for the historical period, the end of century and the, in the change at the end of the century. So you see that uh, uh, at the end of the century, the pattern remain almost the same, but the events are related to a shallower unstable flow uh, flowing upstream the Alps and higher um, anticyclones uh, associated on the eastern side, which may suggest a uh, um, condition more favorable to the blocking of uh, the evolution of this, this system towards uh, the, the east. And also the extreme events are associated to a larger availability of vapor across the Mediterranean area. Um, which is also favored by a slightly slowing of the air mass uh, uh, wind uh, close to the surface, which allow the air mass um, to uh, upload more vapor while crossing uh, the Mediterranean Sea before reaching uh, uh, the Alpine area. So I leave here a summary of our conclusion. I want just to um, highlight uh, the last point. 
by doing this study, we have seen that our ensemble of a convection permitting model are usually able to represent these EV precipitation events, mainly when these are driven by the forcing well set, like for example, orographic lift or front lift. Uh, they are less able or tend to fail when these are uh, uh, driven by more complex interaction, like for example, uh, prefrontal precipitation or the formation of some mesoscale system. And I want to acknowledge the, uh, the FPS convection team for the great work and collaboration during these years. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. We have time for a couple of questions. Emanuela, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question concerning this um, analysis of uh, composite of uh, large scale patterns related with the events. Mm -hmm. you, you showed a composite. And how do you know that the, um, there may, may be a variety of uh, synoptic patterns related with the occurrence of these uh, events uh, if you only look at the composite I mean? Um, uh, first of all, well, let's say a uh, first filter to this is uh, to make the analysis on a seasonal base. And uh, um, of course, uh, uh, this might mean uh, you have a, a certain uh, um, variability around that uh, main feature, but that's what we see on average for most of, uh, of uh, the dates that we detect uh, with our method. Thank you. Well, we will go ahead with the next. I, I have one question, if I may, please quickly. Yes, uh, so this is from Pune. Um, the, in your summary, also, you show that uh, your extreme uh, events in terms of disaster like situation, it's in get, getting better, if that's the understanding I am getting. But um, how is this information that you have now uh, is communicated to different stakeholders? in terms of uh, the events that are likely in the future? Because this is kind of important for the overall stakeholders. Uh, well, um, this is something we need to think uh, about. And uh, of course, the main message is, is the, uh, to take into account that the frequency and also the intensity of this kind of event is increasing, as well also the the area which will be interested uh, uh, from such kind of, of events. So also uh, this will somehow enhance the risk associated uh, with the impact of uh, uh, correlated with such kind of uh, events. But it's something we, we have to deal with more deeply. Thank you, Manuela. Yeah, we will go ahead with the next speaker, Francesca Raffaele. Thank you. Okay. Good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Francesca Raffaele, and uh, today I'm going to show you a brand new convection permitting uh, ensemble over South America. Uh, when uh, we uh, have uh, the availability of such uh, an ensemble of high resolution, um, we uh, are able, we can, we can um, investigate uh, more in depth uh, the daily and the hourly uh, time scale. Uh, but uh, um, uh, if we want to uh, validate such an ensemble, um, we need a lot of observations at these uh, very high resolution uh, scales. So uh, this is this remains a key issue to um, to to have to be that, that has to be noticed. Uh, so the multimodal ensemble was developed as part of the Cord Cordex flagship pilot study on extreme precipitation events in Southeastern South America. 
This ensemble consists of four coordinated simulations produced by convection permitting regional climate models at uh, four kilometer resolution plus one uncoordinated simulation covering the entire South America um, run by the anchor South America affinity group. Uh, each simulation covers a three year period from June uh, 2018 to June 2021. So we have a five member ensemble that includes two different models, uh, WARF and REXCM, with five different configurations. Um, this is um, two, um, uh, two favorite, the, um, uh, the comparison and the exchange of data. Um, a common regular grid has been uh, decided, and uh, this is uh, the common grid that uh, we use uh, at the resolution, the spatial resolution of 0 0.04 degree, and the minimum domain. Um, that all the simulation covers is uh, uh, this in red. Uh, for the validation of uh, the results that I will present, I used uh, um, the, these uh, data sets, the daily grid data set, three different, um, uh, with three different resolution, MSWEP at 0 0.1 degree resolution, CMORF at 0 0.25 degree, CPC Global at 0 0.5 uh, degree. Um, hourly satellite data and hourly stations. We know that uh, the uncertainties grow when going to sub-daily time scales. That's the reason why we need to use uh, um, as many as, as observations we have. Um, for, um, regarding the stations I used, um, there are 100 stations from, um, uh, from Brazil and 71 from Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. And, uh, oops, sorry. And I want to thank for this, uh, this data, the University of Sao Paulo and the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, first of all, I want to show you some daily analysis. This is a special distribution of DJF daily mean precipitation and the comparison with uh, the three grid data set at three different resolution. Uh, we can see that, first of all, these three grid data set um, for the mean precipitation are not really exactly the same. And uh, um, so we have uh, a certain uh, discrepancy um, uh, among the data sets. And uh, here we have uh, um, on the right, uh, the five members of the ensemble and the ensemble mean. So we have that uh, all the members uh, um, quite uh, overestimate uh, the mean precipitation, especially in the um, region with, with um, complex orography. Uh, for uh, the um, spatial distribution of intensity, um, we have um, um, quite a large agreement among the members of the ensemble, and here is the ensemble mean, but we have a disagreement um, between the data sets. So now uh, we are wondering uh, with, at which data set we can trust for uh, this validation. And the same results um, we have uh, if we, uh, we look at the frequency of precipitation. In fact, we have the three data sets that are quite different. And uh, the only thing that uh, um, they have in common is the northern part of the domain, northern eastern part of the domain, for which we can say that the ensemble mean um, underestimate the frequency of precipitation. Let's have a look at the hourly intensity, the spatial distribution of hourly intensity. This time we can um, use the stations to validate our models. And we can see that all the models have uh, quite a large um, spread. Um, and a large difference uh, from uh, among each other, and uh, but uh, all of them uh, can uh, um, represent quite well the gradient uh, from the center of the domain um, towards the coast, um, the, the, the eastern coast, and uh, this, uh, this gradient is correctly kept uh, in the ensemble mean. 
uh, for regarding the hourly frequency, uh, we have um, a quite good uh, representation of what the stations uh, reported. In fact, uh, here in the ensemble, but also in uh, all, uh, almost all the members of the ensemble, we have a good representation of uh, the frequency that is low in the uh, center part of the domain and uh, is higher in the eastern coast. Uh, mm, uh, we um, investigate also the diurnal cycle, and to do this, uh, we choose uh, four boxes um, in this do domain, and we choose those bo boxes uh, on the base of, uh, um, to of topography, and we wanted to, to use uh, uh, regions where topography were uh, more or less uh, homogeneous. Uh, these are the results, and uh, we uh, compute the diurnal cycle for the mean precipitation and for extreme precipitation like intensity, uh, 99 percentile, 99.1, and the wet frequency. We can uh, see that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, here we have uh, the, uh, the dashed lines, the black dashed lines are the uh, stations, the uh, gray line also here is the satellite hourly station and the, uh, the um, line, the black line continues uh, is uh, the ensemble mean. We can see that we have, except the, for the uh, mean uh, precipitation for the other extreme indexes, we have that the satellite, a big discrepancy between satellite, between the, the uh, two observations that we are using uh, between satellite and in the in stations, um, and uh, we uh, we can notice that the ensemble uh, mean follows more tend to follow more the stations instead of uh, the satellite. So uh, we can say that uh, in this case, if uh, we had uh, used the uh, only the satellite data to validate our ensemble, we uh, would uh, um, have had. Uh, um, a wrong message probably in the interpretation of the results. So this is uh, for box two. Uh, in this case, we have a good agreement both uh, among the models and uh, um, among observation. There's also the, um, uh, the ensemble mean is quite in agreement in terms of the urinal cycle with uh, the stations. For box three, uh, uh, instead, we have a completely different uh, uh, situation. We have a large spread among the models and uh, also among the observations. Uh, this is uh, probably due to the fact that this box um, um, is uh, a box uh, that is on complex orography. Also for box four, uh, there is quite a big discrepancy and spread uh, between models and also between the two sets of observations. Probably in this case uh, is due to the fact that the box is too uh, wide and uh, uh, it, it is homogeneous, but it's probably too wide to be considered for the urinal cycle. In summary, uh, so the, av the available satellite and gridded observational data set show a clear uncertainty, both at daily and, sorry, and hourly time scale. A station-based observational data set is needed to assess the model uncertainty within the context of the observational uncertainty. An additional important source of uncertainty linked with the representation of subgrid scale are the different configuration of the models. In fact, we saw that uh, how the uh, how, how our ensemble, even if uh, um, even if uh, uh, done with uh, only two models, we have five different configurations. Um, and a further analysis is needed to go uh, through a deep understanding of local characteristics to investigate why models, <laughs> to investigate why models are uh, behaving so different depending from the chosen regions. Thank you for listening. Okay, any questions? Uh, just one question. This is from Pune. Uh, if, uh, Excuse me. First, this is from Pune. May I ask a question? Uh, yes, ask but we have a question in the room, and then I I let you. Uh, I, 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation. I have a question to all of are you presenting results on convective permitting uh, uh, models. And that is that you are looking at very traditional um, aspects like the rainfall amount. But what we have found is that the rainfall patterns are changing so that each event is shrinking. So the rainfall on Earth, both from satellite data and era five, is actually concentrating on into smaller uh, area. And that is actually extremely uh, interesting, interesting to look at because what really matters is the volume of water that falls on the Earth on the surface. So it would be interesting to see like an analysis of the systems, are they becoming like, uh, does the area shrink? Are they get becoming more concentrated as we've seen in the real world? Or uh, in addition to what you all, all already show, because then we can start to understand what is actually going on uh, because the uh, extreme rainfall is both due to more falling down, but also because of the dynamic uh, effect that is becoming more, more concentrated. Yes, for sure, uh, it can be a way to analyze uh, the results and these uh, these um, simulations that uh, we have uh, that are new, so we can uh, do for sure uh, um, this kind of analysis as well. In uh, this uh, particular study, we just want to have a look uh, um, to the uncertainty, you know, so uh, to the just a, a more simple analysis analysis, but done at the subgrid time scales, and uh, uh, just to uh, to see what we get uh, uh, at the beginning. Thank you. Um, yes, may I ask the question now from Pune? Because you just addressed, sorry, I, I just want to finish the answer because you addressed all the other speakers. So I just want to highlight that we also have different kind of analysis that we have shown maybe very fast, but both in my talk, but also in the talk of the third pole region, we are using this tracking algorithm exactly to investigate this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of change. So how the system are changing in terms of uh, uh, sites, uh, how deep they become, how fast, uh, how long they travel. So this is also in place, not yet in the South America region. We, we are not yet there, but soon we'll be. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, yes, um, the online question, go ahead, yes, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, this is from Pune. Uh, thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, I see that you have used the CMORPH uh, data sets uh, for your validation. So I was wondering, um, whether you have also tried to use some other data sets, uh, satellite-based data sets, for instance, the iMERGE data sets that, that for your validation, and also whether uh, you have also considered to use merged gauge as well as satellite-based data products, because you say that the satellite-based observation data sets is needed. So if you have a merged product, maybe that would be also useful for your validation purposes. Thank you. Yes, we used uh, three data sets, three grid observational data sets, th those that uh, we uh, we have, we had, so CMORPH, MS Web, and the CBC, CPC Global data set, so all the three data sets. And uh, regarding uh, GAUCH uh, stations, uh, we uh, we had that, uh, uh, that uh, 171 stations, uh, and uh, that was the, the were the stations that were available, uh, the hourly station, because I know that there are other stations, uh, um, more uh, like uh, almost 200, no? and, uh, but uh, we need only hourly, we want to use only the hourly stations to to do this uh, this kind of study so we we had only those for this region okay yeah. thank you francesca and well we move to our next speaker foxine hi foxine
Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Fu Xing Wang. Uh, I'm from uh, SMHI in Sweden. Uh, today, I will present our work on a new method for dynamical downscaling of heat waves by convection permitting models, event based downscaling. Before I get into the details, I would like to express my gratitude to the co authors for their valuable contributions to this work. Um, uh, so there was, uh, it was a very long, uh, warm summer uh, in Sweden uh, in 2018. Uh, this uh, this, this GTB event uh, has significant consequences, uh, including a notable increase uh, in mortality rates. Um, for instance, uh, the Public Health Agency of Sweden reported uh, about 750 excess deaths during this uh, hot summer in 2018. Uh, this has raised the awareness of heat wave impacts uh, even in high latitude, latitude regions. Uh, for simulating a couple of such events for a significant computational challenge, a traditional initial, initialization approach for convection permitting models require months or even years of simulations to spin up. Uh, this uh, traditional approach is not feasible for simulating a couple of uh, Heat wave events. Uh, this study aims to address the following questions. First, what will heat wave events in the present climate resemble in the future, such as in world with uh, two Kelvin or three Kelvin warming? The second, how to optimize the initialization process uh, for computationally demanding convention permitting models when simulating a couple of extreme events. We first selected uh, three summers in southern Sweden represent, representing different climate conditions. Uh, specifically, uh, 2017 representing average summer, 2022 representing average heat wave, and, uh, and 2018 representing extreme heat wave. Uh, the maps uh, shows uh, the um, Deviation of average uh, summer temperature uh, for this selected, selected summers uh, when compared to the normal period uh, from 1991 to 2020. Uh, in this study, we will focus on the analysis of the Stockholm domain, which is highlighted in the red box in the maps. Then each event were downscaled under three specific warming levels. Uh, 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 specific warming level 0 0.9, warming level two, and warming level three. These represent uh, temperature increases uh, of 0 point degree, two degree, and three degrees uh, compared to the pre-industrial period. Uh, instead of looking Instead of looking at uh, temperature increases uh, at a specific point in time, the specific warming levels uh, correspond um, cares about uh, the climate conditions associated with, associate with specific temperature increase, regardless of when this point is reached. In this study, we also integrated the pseudo global warming approach, which imposes the large scale GCM based climate change signal on the boundary conditions of a regional climate simulation. Um, in this study, we used the uh, HCLIM 43 ROM uh, convention permitting model with the uh, surfix as the uh, land component. To address the spin up challenge, we proposed a new method for running HCLIM convention permitting model. Uh, the idea is to use the less expensive surface model to accelerate the initialization processes of HCLIM convention permitting model. Uh, specifically, we start by running surface in offline mode uh, by looping over the same year multiple times, uh, about four years prior to the uh, target event. Uh, this is to get the climatology of the soil variables, including soil moisture and soil temperature. Uh, then we continue this uh, offline surface simulation at 12 kilometer uh, uh, from about three years to three months prior to the uh, target event to adjust the soil variables 
uh, to align with the real climate conditions. Uh, after that, we run each claim a room uh, at a 12 kilometer resolution uh, by initializing with the uh, soil conditions from the offline surface output. Uh, we further downscale from 12 kilometer to three kilometer uh, using um, surface and uh, um, H, H claim a room. Uh, we follow, uh, we adopt the a similar principle uh, for downscaling to three kilometer. After that, we further downscale uh, to 300 meter by using surface offline mode with uh, the forcing data from H claim around three kilometer. Uh, it should be mentioned that uh, here in this step, the offline surface at three kilometer, uh, this is in our test case, this is especially for uh, this domain with a lot of lakes around Stockholm area. It, this uh, steps may not be needed if you, uh, the method is applied for other regions. Uh, this, uh, this method uh, has, has significantly reduced the computational time by limiting the initialization uh, to uh, weeks or months uh, simulation period. Uh, in contrast, the traditional initialization approach requires one year, uh, or about one year uh, for each uh, event. And for example, in our case, uh, we run with uh, uh, about uh, 600 CPUs and the simulation time for each claim to be up reduce, reduced uh, from about seven hours uh, to about two hours for each event. Uh, here we compare the uh, simulation results with other data sets uh, over the Stockholm area for the three different summers uh, over the historical period. Uh, in this comparison, we excluded the water grease uh, to avoid the influences from water bodies like a sea and uh, uh, lakes. Uh, we, we used two observation based data sites, uh, including EOPS uh, in black line, black solid line, and uh, Nordic graded uh, climate data sites in uh, black dashed line. And uh, the simulation results are represented in different color lines, red for H claim 12 kilometer and blue for H claim three kilometer and green for surface 300 meter. Uh, in general, uh, the model simulations capture the time variation of T2, T2 meter uh, for all the three summers. Uh, and uh, H claim three kilometer and surface 300 meter compounds um, better than H claim 12 kilometer. Here we further look at the spatial distribution of uh, uh, T2M uh, for the uh, 2018 extreme heat, heat, heat wave event. Uh, in general, the first, okay, here the, the top row shows the uh, ERA5 data, EOPS, and NGCD data set, and the second row show the model simulations. In general, we see a warmer temperature over the urban area comparing to the rural areas. Here we look at the, temp the temperature change uh, under different uh, uh, warming levels uh, over the Stockholm area uh, for 2018 events. Uh, the top row show the difference, the different simulated temperature between uh, warming level two and warming level uh, 0 0.9. 0 0.9 here means the his used as historical. Mm. And uh, it should be mentioned that the, the warming levels are here are global values. And uh, when compare the, compare the uh, warming levels between two and uh, nine, they are, um, they, they, the uh, warming level two degree is compared to uh, 0, 0 0.9 degree global uh, warming is uh, is not comparing to the pre-industrial period. For specifically here, we see, for example, in the top row, we see the global uh, average temperature increase about 1.1 Kelvin, but uh, we see the local temperature increases by about 1.5 to 1.6 degree, which is not surprising over the this high latitude domains. Uh, 
Okay, conclusion. Here we proposed a new um, method for oscillator spin up uh, of convention per million models. And it worked well when simulating uh, heat wave events. And uh, then we checked uh, how heat wave events change in the future and there are different uh, warming levels. Uh, next step, we will further improve this event based dance scaling method, for example, test it over other regions. And uh, because here we only look at the heat wave temperature. Uh, it may be uh, we need a different, um, uh, for example, uh, period of simulation for when we look at the precipitation, and we need more in-depth analysis, for example, urban heat island or Daniel cycles. And then this study is uh, supported by a great project uh, funded by FOMAS in Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fuji. We have time for one question. Stefan. Thanks, very nice talk, Fuxing. It's a really nice approach. Um, Stefan Sobolowski, Norris Bjorkney Center for Climate Research in Bergen, Norway. Um, so a question though about your about your approach. Um, there's there an assumption baked into this that basically the heat waves will in the future will look quite similar to the heat waves from the past, given the choice of a um, uh, perturbed global warming approach so that the dynamics will be the same, the large scale circulation will be the same as well. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand quite well. Is there an assumption in your approach that the heat waves for the future will look quite similar to the those from the past? Because all you're doing is, is putting on a per perturbation, if I understand correctly, using a pseudo global warming approach. Uh, in this uh, global warming approach, we we, add, uh, we first uh, calculate the the delta uh, from easy Earth simulations. Uh, for example, we calculate uh, uh, delta for temperature, humidity, and uh, wind surface pressure, like this one. And then we add this to the RE five data set. Uh, and then we run, yeah, we run with this uh, RE five plus the delta as forcing as the boundary conditions. For, right. So, yeah. so if the heat yeah. waves change, so if the heat wave patterns change, or if they're more, if the persistence in the blocking patterns change in the future, there's no way to assess that with this kind of an approach. So, yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, we, we need to, uh, yeah, check okay. this. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for, for this new approach. Uh, just a technical detail in the surface simulation, uh, did you activate the CT module, the TEB, the TEB uh, CT model? Yes. And does it relate to the result you are showing over the Stockholm uh, area? Yeah, we activated the TEB in surface for all the simulations, including 12 meters, 3 kilometers, and 300 meters. And then for the comparison, we just look at the T2M average, not T2M. Like we use a T2M average over the different tiles. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Fushin. Yeah. Uh, well, thank we you. are done for this session. Thank you, everyone, and an applause for our speakers. Thank you so much. We have uh, one announcement of the uh, committee. Everyone that uh, needs to sign up for the event of Thursday night, please do it now because we need in the table outside. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much. And see you for the next session in 30 minutes. 30 minutes, the next session. Yeah. Yeah, again, quick announcements, same thing. I will repeat again. So for TA claims, uh, the forms can be submitted tomorrow at Varamir Hall reception.
two, three, but whenever you don't use it, please. Welcome back, everybody. If we could get you to take your seats, we'll start the next session. That's the last minute call. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Okay, welcome back everyone. So for the last oral session today, we're fo going to focus on statistical methods, machine learning techniques in regional climate modeling and downscaling. 
this session will be chaired by myself, Jason Evans, and Douglas Maron. And we have our first speaker, who is in, an invited speaker, Jose Manuel Gutierrez, who's going to give us an overview uh, talk to start us off. Jose. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really good to see so many familiar faces after a while. And um, my, my intention in this uh, talk is to provide a bit overview to warm up. It was not on purpose, this warming up with the heat that we are feeling inside. So the idea is just to provide some context uh, for the talks and the posters of this session, which is a special one, because we received so many applications from the machine learning community. So it's very, very much uh, biased. So the idea is that uh, I'd introduce uh, a number of activities that uh, we've been working on during the last couple of years in the Cortex community. There are a couple of white papers. One of them is for statistical downscaling. Uh, so you can get further information here. This is the QR. And uh, in this, uh, this document is a community driven document. It's open for uh, ideas. And uh, so the idea is to identify challenges and problems to guide the work in this particular statistical downscaling branch in the future. So in the document, you can find the ideas uh, and the work on current state and achievements within Cordex for statistical downscaling, empirical statistical downscaling, and a number of uh, items regarding the future challenges that are part of the contributions that you will uh, uh, listen afterwards. So there are a couple of methodological advances, things like multivariate stuff, but also machine learning for ESD, which uh, is, is becoming very, very trendy, as you will see in the talks. Uh, in the document, you also find uh, ideas uh, on intercomparison and validation experiments, which are now crucial to be able to make some sense of these new techniques coming from the machine learning, as we will see in a minute, but also regarding data and infrastructure, uh, the idea of uh, publishing data uh, following standard conventions, so everyone can read the data and uh, make comparisons, stuff, metadata, and so on. So there is another ongoing uh, document in which we are trying to draft uh, a Cortex experimental design for statistical downscaling of CMIP6, aligning with the existing one for uh, dynamical downscaling for RCMs. So I invite you to go here and put your comments so we can see particularly now the machine learning community is so wide and they can join. We'll see whether or not we can make a, like a plan, like a experimental design to have some intercomparison for statistical downscaling. Stuff is hard, it's limited, it's a wide topic, but uh, we can do our best to have this done and they be in equal uh, footing as the RCM community, providing for at least intercomparing staff at a continental or subcontinental wide level, which was a very successful story coming from Cortex. And then uh, finally, in the document, there are also information on distillation of actionable information to bridge uh, climate science with society needs. And you will hear a lot of, of that in, in sessions B and C, not, not here, but it's all connected. So, uh, I'll focus on uh, machine learning and new development uh, because that's the, the main issue in the, in the, in the talks uh, that we'll have now. So the idea is that uh, uh, we have a, a well-consolidated and solid downscaling ecosystem uh, developed uh, in many, many years with the clear ideas with the clear ideas on uh, what to do with the dynamical downscaling, 
a number of approaches for statistical long skilling, perfect prognosis, most whether you need or many of you are familiar with that for many years, and also hybrid combinations of them. So this is an active research topic. There are not so many publications, but every year we have some. So all, all those uh, methods work either deterministically or in distributions, stochastically. And there are, uh, just to mention a single one, there are papers out there where you can uh, get new advances in the field. So this is a paper combining bias correction with stochastic uh, perfect proc downscaling in a way that you can get a multivariate, spatially consistent, multi-site uh, downscale results, which is, uh, as in other papers not mentioned here, advancing the, let's say, main body, main block of statistical downscaling activities. So we have uh, a new uh, topic of research, very active, uh, uh, started uh, recently, which is emulators. There are a variety of stuff here, but basically it's emulating the performance of RCMs by using the driving GCM. So basically emulating the functioning of the whole RCM or a parameterization, particular param parameterization. This is very recent. There is a paper introducing the, this is the, the concept, the first concept and evaluation results. It's just this year published, uh, but it's opening a new branch of research, which is followed in different, uh, different uh, projects. And the, the point is that uh, all these new uh, ideas and methods build heavily on machine learning. Machine learning is not new in our community. We had uh, applications of random forest kernels and supported for machines, neural networks, standard ones for many years. So we know that stuff. But the, the, the game changer was the eruption of deep, deep learning a couple of years ago in the statistical non scaling community. It's, it's been out there for many years in the big ITs to uh, find the patterns in images, in voice. Uh, you all know the, the, the groundbreaking applications achieved with, the, with the deep learning. So the deep learning is very active topic. So we have many presentations here in Cortex. The community is here, came uh, with us. So we have new members, fresh air, and we need to take advantage of that. And uh, it's uh, taking advantage of the rapid developments made by the big IT. So it's amazing how the software changed, evolved, how quick and fast you can do calculations. All that is very, uh, very uh, fancy. And uh, the number of publications for uh, uh, deep downscaling is increasing exponentially. So last year, 22, there were over 100 publications, but the problem is that the, the community, the, all, the, all those publications are not well aligned with the statistical downscaling terminology, concepts, ideas. So for instance, you can find half of the publications, almost half, 44, are super resolution, which is just increasing resolution by artificial uh, uh, statistical artifacts. So this is not uh, well suited for climate uh, statistical long scaling. So what we need, uh, and I think that's the challenge uh, for the future, we need to, uh, to get this momentum consolidated somehow. And somehow to me means three things. One is strengthening the collaboration with the ESD community. So we align both uh, research topics and we work together hand by hand. And this conference could, could help in that. So there are me, uh, some of us which uh, know each other through papers and through uh, intermittent conf uh, uh, meetings that uh, came together and we can sit and, uh, and talk uh, for a while. And also uh, coordinating uh, the deep stuff with ESD protocols and also gaining trust because now those methods are seen as black boxes uh, by the community and I don't wonder why. So I'll just uh, give a couple of examples uh, on how the statistical non scaling community and the deep learning community can benefit together uh, from this, uh, this uh, consolidation. So for many years, statistical downscaling standard, statistical downscaling was done uh, 
with many problems to select predictors. So for specific regions, small regions, the predictors should be selected uh, using some expert knowledge in a way. And uh, most of the applications of statistical non scaling in the past were on, on small domains. So this is what, uh, what uh, deep learning uh, can, can just basically avoid because uh, uh, deep learning learn uh, patterns, full patterns from uh, convolutions, for instance, in an automatic fashion. So it uh, just works automatically detecting what is relevant for the different uh, regions, the different points. That was successful in many, in many disciplines. And this, this has uh, one big advantage that you can run those models on big domains, continental wide, wide domains. And we have the first experiences in providing data, which is comparable to the RCM. So it follows the experimental framework. In this case, there's a contribution, uh, the generating and publishing in ESDF following the, the protocol, uh, simulations for the EU, uh, year 44 domain, for the whole domain using deep learning. So this is uh, one uh, recent publication. So uh, deep learning can, can help in that particular issue. And the second and very quick, we need to gain uh, trust in these models, because this is what you uh, typically have as a deep learning method. So you have the predictors here, a number of layers with convolutions trying to get uh, useful information to predict, uh, in this case, precipitation, the parameters of the distribution at the, at the end, and uh, with a number of layers doing uh, nonlinear operations, uh, spatiotemporal nonlinear operations, a uh, lot of stuff. And so it's really difficult to say uh, what, what is this doing? So uh, there are a couple of talks uh, introducing the idea of explainable artificial intelligence. And I think this is the way to move forward and gain interpretability, gain trustness in this, in this uh, particular method. So um, that, that's it. So because this is already uh, a recap on what I already said. So did I make it in time? OK, OK. Thank you, Jose. Um, any questions for Jose? And I just like to mention to people online that you can drop questions in the Q&A online as well. No? Okay, I guess it's very clearly explained, Jose. Well done. All right. Well, thank you, Jose. Then we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, Andressa, where are you? And she's going to talk to us about using a storyline approach to select CMIP6 model ensemble to be downscaled. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Andresa, and today I am present this work. Uh, the objective is to select the CMIP6 models to be tall scaled for the South America domain using the storyline approach. So the, the obje objective to this work is to define our objective method to select the global climate models for the South America domain. Uh, to do that, you need to, the methodology requires to shape of the physical process you are interested in the physical process in, in South America. So we know South America is a large uh, continent, uh, a lot of large, large scale circulations. Uh, and together with geographicals and local process, and this interaction defines the climate in the continent. In this work, we use two uh, large circulation, large scale circulations, 
The first was South American monsoon system. And the second was a tropical cyclones. We use these two lar large scale circulation in their main drivers. For example, for South American monsoon system, we use two main drivers. The first one was the South Atlantic Convergence Zone. In the second, the low level jet. So the methodology of Foxon, the accurate representation for the climate and also the uncertainty uh, in the future response uh, for these uh, circulations. Uh, the motivation to use the Starline approach is because a lot of models uh, has a, a spread. In this uh, graph, we show the annual cycle, the different annual cycle for the, pre the future and the present. And we can see some models has the wettest in the future and others the driest. So we are interested in to, to choose a range of models to show uh, uh, diverse uh, Storyline conditions to wettest and driest for each region you are we are interested. So as an example to the storyline approach, to build the storyline approach, we need to to know the large drivers uh, we are interested, and uh, the uncertainty of these these large drivers. For example, for the tropical cyclones in in South Atlantic, we um, um, we analyze the ad driving jet because in the future uh, uh, some works show that the 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 change of the position in the stream. An example for this the South uh, America monsoon system is that the South Atlantic convergence zone. Uh, some works show that. We have the shift, a uh, soft R shift, and also the strength of the South America low level jet. So for the Starline approach, we focus on on this uh, type of main drivers to see the plausible futures, uh, the several pro diverse uh, possible futures. So for the evaluation part, the, this devaluation the in the historic period, we define nine indicators. Here is the summarize of these nine indicators. Uh, the first, the first, the second, the third, it's only related in precipitation for the South America. The first and second, it's a special correlation for the precipitation. The first one, we use the Hoff Muller field, uh, is the first uh, feature. The second is the, the special correlation for DGF for these three boxes here, the second feature. And the third is the temporal correlation for the precipitation in the annual cycle in these also three uh, boxes. For the four, the, in four, five, six, we use the circulation pattern. So the index four is a special correlation for mean sea level pressure. These contours here in the first picture, who indicate the South Atlantic, uh, uh, the South Atlantic high and South Pacific uh, subtropical high. The index five is a special correlation at low levels. 850 hectopascals. This is the wind speed, the shaded in this picture, who indicates the low level South America low level jet and the trade winds. And the index six is the wind speed in upper levels, 200 hectopascal, who represent the jet stream, the Bolivia high, and the northwest flow. The index seven to nine is the same as the previous slides, but using the JJA in some boxes change the. Some boxes change the position. So here is the result for the evaluation part for the indices. 
Now we want to select a range of models for the driest and wettest in the plausible futures using the storyline approach. So we used uh, these main drivers, the response of these main drivers in the uncertain future in the precipitation fields. Here is the result for the first star line we use. It is the S-tropical uh, cyclone star line for DJF. And the, the response in the precipitation in La Plata Basin in southwestern Brazil. Here is also the S-tropical 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 cyclone, but JJA in the far plausible uh, uh, plausible future in the response for these two main drivers, polar jet and South America low level jet, used as a main driver to see these possible changes in the in the in the in the main drivers and the response in the precipitation in, in La Plata Basin. And here is the South America monsoon storm line. We use the South Atlantic Convergence Zone and low-level jet intensity uh, as our main drivers to build these possible changes in the precipitation field in the Amazon Basin. And here we have the possible uh, range of the wettest and driest models for the first star line. So the NRSM and the F goals show uh, in the future in using the, the first star line for acid tropical cyclones, you'll be wet, wettest and PCC and MCC will be driest. So with this and with with the evaluation part and these three star lines we uh, analyzed, we the idea is to select the the models using this uh, maximize this uh, range of the GCM models for the wettest and driest con conditions, and also evaluating the historical period. Uh, so in summary, the star line have been shown to be useful too to select the CMIP-6 for the dynamic dose scaling. The star lines can answer one specific research question or a set of correlated questions. It is important to consider who are the stakeholders that use this dose scaling product and which are the relevant needs uh, to, to, to use. Uh, this is a, a work in progress. So if you have some questions, here is the my email and uh, Uli Mayo, who uh, is a collaborator for this work. And thank you. Thanks, Andressa. Any questions? Thanks very much, Andressa. Um, so as we know, the storyline story line approach is now used in many different contexts. Um, and maybe you could make it a little clearer. Um, how different it would be if you hadn't used the storyline approach. So in the beginning, we want to use the climate sensitivity whose only temperature for the this to range these possible futures. But we uh, thought to use the star line approach because he used the circulation patterns. For for example, for us, uh, we used the so South America low level jet and South Atlantic uh, convergence zone, it's very important. So the star line approach use these circulations which is important for the precipitation in South America. And with these main drivers, we build these, the, we know these uh, possible changes considering these main drivers. It's different if you use only the temperature 
Okay, thanks. We have time for one more question, if there's another. Yep. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering, uh, because in our selection for downscaling in Australia, we had the same problem that we look mm -hmm. at the, the two outlier models, the very, very wettest and driest, and they are so far away from other models. So maybe we wonder, are they outliers for wrong reason? Can we trust this model? How we actually make sure that we're not selecting outliers and they are not really realistic? That's probably a broader question. But... Uh, can you repeat, please? Because the sound was very low. Okay, so so when you use you, you, you storyline approach and you say that you want to select outliers, the wettest and driest model as a sort of a worst case scenario, uh, how do we know that these outliers which are sometimes quite far away from other models in terms of, let's say, rainfall uh, trend signal, are they realistic? Can we trust them? Or are they outliers for wrong reason because they are not physical enough or they have some systematic errors and they the future projections, they are just far away from other models. Uh, I think we that's why we use uh, the star line to see the multiple uh, futures for each. Yeah, so the, the method is based on the star line approach that is not just simply a selection of the GCM signal but it's based on a regression of the uh, GCM large driver against uh, these uh, two forcing that Andresa was describing. When we select the model, we make sure that uh, when the model are selected, they score a good in the present day. So the circulation is good. So among those models that are trustable for the circulation that we uh, we want to represent, then we select uh, the two opposite storyline that we want to uh, cover in the future. So the model are, it's make, we make sure that the model are performing well in the present and then we use the storyline approach in the future. Okay, thanks Andressa. So our, our next speaker is uh, Maria. And she's going to tell us about using a convolutional neural network for local climate downscaling, giving us example over South America. Hi, well, good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Maria Laura Bedoli from uh, University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. And well, I'm going to show you some results from uh, that are part of the flagship pilot study in Southeastern South America that is focused on extreme precipitation events um, where we have uh, two phases. The, this result corresponds to the phase uh, number two of the flagship pilot, uh, where uh, convection permitting simulations were performed uh, together with ESD simulations in this period from uh, 2018 to 2021. And these simulations are used uh, for um, to force uh, two uh, impact models, one a hydrological model and um, a, an, an agricultural model. Uh, but well, I'm going to show you just uh, some results from the statistical downscaling simulations. The objective of this work is analyzability of the convolutional neural networks uh, downscaling model in simulating daily precipitation in CESA with a special focus on extreme 
uh, precipitation. Uh, we use um, um, this um, um, for this study, we uh, conducted uh, it uh, from the perfect prognosis approach. We use daily precipitation at station data. The daily precipitation that we use is uh, the, um, the station data that we use for these simulations are in this box, the inner box. Um, we also consider um, for um, comparison purposes, AFI precipitation and CPC precipitation, daily precipitation. And as predictors, we use era five reanalysis. We use a, a subset of 10 variables that we already use in the, fir in the first phase. So we can compare with both models, uh, with both phases, with the models of both, both phases. Uh, and the uh, predictors are considered in this, uh, in the other domain, domain, this box over here. Um, well, the, the reason why, why we choose this uh, season, this, we choose uh, three years, these three years that are here, these are the anomalies of precipitation of these three years, is because they are, especially the, the, the the, the last one, this one and this one, are very dry and are, are uh, exceptionally dry for Southeastern South America. Uh, but even if they are very dry, uh, they have, this is the time series for extreme precipitation, the, the number of extreme precipitation events. This is, these are the three years that we chose for the simulations. And um, you can see that we have a, a, an important number of uh, extreme events. Uh, it is very different from this season, for instance, here, that is this year here, that was a, a very dry year, but the number of extreme events was very low. So we had a, a good number of extreme events in a very dry season that was very challenging for our models. So, well, Ah, okay. So, if for the statistical and scaling models, we train and train uh, the, the the models in this period, in a longer period from 1979 to 2014, and we tested them in um, in an dependent period from 2015 to 2021. This period was independent, so it was unseen for the models. So we wanted to know how they work because they were trained in a, a period that was very wet. And we wanted to know how they work in a, in a dry period with extreme events. Uh, this is, these are the last three years that we consider for the CPM simulations, but we, for the statistical downscaling down simulations, we added uh, four four years more to test the method. Well, we use the this um, architecture the, the, for the convolutional neural networks, the, the architecture and the configuration of the model is quite challenging because we can uh, change many uh, parameters and hyperparameters of the of the network and also the architecture. So it's very difficult to compare the, the simulations. So we use this architecture that uh, Jose already showed you that was tested by uh, Baño Medina uh, in Europe. And it was also tested by Balmaceda in Southeast, in Southern South America for maximum and minimum temperature. So we wanted to know how they work uh, for precipitation. The only thing that we changed in our models were the um, loss functions, where the, 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 the one that used uh, Baño Medina was uh, the Bernoulli gamma, but we added uh, different uh, loss functions um, and we simulated the precipitation stochastically uh, and deterministically. That, mean, uh, uh, that means um, simulating or estimating the expected value. Uh, well, some results. Uh, here I'm showing you the 95th percentile of precipitation during uh, the seven years in the, in the, in the independent uh, period. Uh, these are the, the station, the observations, the percentile in the stations. This is the CPC, this is, which is another observational data set. And this is RFI. 
um, and the models are all, all here. Uh, we can see that uh, the spatial variability and the structure of the, of the um, percentile field is very well captured by all models. Um, we wanna, sorry, <laughs> we see that uh, um, there are a lot uh, large underestimations by the uh, deterministic models that we expected that, but we wanted to use uh, to, to, to analyze if the models are working well. So this is expected. Uh, they uh, underestimate the, the, the percentile. And we see a clear added value when we compare our results with era five. This is uh, something that is very important because um, era five is, is, is used as uh, uh, Francesca already showed that um, we have a lot of observational uncertainty and uh, there is a lack of observ observations in South America. So era five is, is used as an observational data set to evaluate models or to run or to feed uh, uh, impact models. And this is very important to show that uh, at least for extremes is not working well. Um, well, here we focus on the location of extremes and the interannual variability. Southeastern South America, <laughs> Southeastern South America is not an homogeneous region in terms of, of extremes. So we selected two boxes that, that are these boxes to uh, analyze how the streams occur. So this is the monthly precipitation uh, accumulation. And in, in each of these boxes, we have in black the station data, in red the spread of the CNN simulations, and in blue the era five. And as you can see first, you can see here that these two time series are very different. So this is a small region, but the time series are, are very different. The models are able to capture the interannual variability and also the uh, intra-annual variability. Uh, and, the, and, and also to capture the distinctive, distinctive nature of precipitation in, those, in these two subregions. If we uh, look at the extremes, this is the frequency, the monthly frequency of the extremes. We can see that uh, there is a larger spread in, in, in the simulations, but the models are still capturing the interannual variability and the, um, the intraannual variability and the different time series that we found in these two regions. Uh, and with a clear added value when we compare with era five um, reanalysis. Uh, now, if we analyze the, the opposite uh, um, um, part of the, of the precipitation extremes is uh, the dry spell length. This, this is the 90 percentile of the dry spell length uh, distribution. Um, we can see that uh, the models capture the structure, uh, the, the structure, the spatial structure, but they overestimate a lot the longest uh, dry spell. Well, thank you. <laughs> this is a, a... Thanks, Maria. Um, we could take a quick question. So thanks, Maria Laura, very nice uh, presentation. I, I was just wondering if you had a look to the wall uh, um, distribution of the precipitation because you showed the daily uh, 95 percentile, but we know that in the very extreme events, the 95th percentile is not the one that uh, is uh, the most extreme one. So, and also because this kind of method uh, usually suffer by the problem of underestimation of the tail as for example our so i was wondering if you had a look to that and yes we take a look at the 98 percentile uh and and they work very well but as they are only seven years we don't we didn't want it because it's very um, it's it's very um, variable so we prefer to show the 95 percentile but they they work well in 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 other percentiles Okay, thank you, Maria. So our next speaker is um, Anton Dari. Come on up.
and he's going to talk to us about an RCM emulator and the study of applicability to large GCM ensembles. Okay. Hi, everybody. So I'm Antoine Dury. I'm postdoc at uh, CNRM in Toulouse. And um, I will talk to you about RCM emulators that uh, Jose mentioned in his, uh, in his talk. Uh, I will try to give you, at the end of this talk, I would like let you, I would be happy if you are able to say what is what we call RCM emulators and um, try to describe the one we use and also give some insight about how we could use them for uh, GC to downscale GCM ensembles. So first of all, RCM emulators, we consider them as hybrid downscaling approach. So in the sense that we want to apply a statistical downscaling framework inside RCM simulations. And the aim is to emulate the downscaling function of the RCM, which is uh, for us, like the, the, the relationship inside the RCM simulation between large scale atmospheric conditions and high, res high resolution variable of interest. So it, there have been published, there have been several papers now talking about RCM emulators, even if it's quite new. The main advantage of this, uh, this framework is that we can train and calibrate the statistical model everywhere around the world and for any variable, as we don't need any more long record of good quality observational data. Uh, we can use several runs of RCMs, which allows to better explore the internal variability. But the key aspect is that, is that we can also train the model in different climates, colder, warmer climates, by using scenario RCM simulation. And in the other end, it allows to downscale, it when, if it works, large GCM ensembles, thanks to the efficiency of the statistical model. And then, so we can better explore the different source of uncertainties. So now we, I will dig a bit into the, the emulator we use and I will present here. So it's an emulator for the Aladdin 63 uh, RCM, which is a 12 kilometer resolution. And uh, it has been driven by semi five uh, simulations. So we will focus on daily temperature over this small domain centered on the Pyrenees, southwest of France. Um, we took this small domain because it allows to play around and uh, to make several emulators. So now some technical aspects. First, about the training of the emulator, which, which is the key, key aspect here. We will try, we will train the, the, the emulator in perfect model framework, meaning that we take input and outputs, so predictant and predict, predictors and predictant from the same RCM simulation. For the inputs, we take them from the, we select them in the RCM simulation. We upscale them and make them looking as a GCM output and we give them to the emulator. And on the other side, we choose the corresponding target variable. So here, daily temperature for the same uh, RCM simulation. And we try to, that the emulator learns the relationship. In the evaluation uh, part, we stay in this perfect model framework, which has the big advantage of, um, oh, sorry, of uh, word. When, we, when we will give the input to the emulator, it will, it will produce something which should be, when if it's well-trained, exactly like the, um, like the RCM target variable. So the inputs we give to the emulator, there are daily description of the atmospheric condition for, for this given day. So we take only altitude variables, the geopotential, temperature, wind components, and humidity at different levels, plus external forcing. So we really try to learn the relationship between uh, the, what is happening up in the atmosphere and the surface. There is a tricky part here, te really technical. We can discuss it later on uh, about the st standardization, which makes that we give the temporal and the spatial information separately to the, to the neural network because the statistical model we use is a neural network based on the UNET architecture. Um, 
neural networks and especially fully convolutional network have shown really good skills to in with to handle climate data. So just quick uh, efficient quick uh, numbers on efficiency. It takes about one hour to train the emulator over 150 years on the, on a standard GPU, and the, the prediction to make a new simulation is almost instantaneous. So here is the our playground. So the Aladdin 63 Eurocodex matrix. So we have several simulation. We have four simulation driven by the CNRM model, CNRM CM5 model. So the historical plus three scenario. And then we have historical and RCP85 for three other GCM. So we will train, I'll train, train the emulator in the CNRM historical and RCP85 scenarios. So kind of the coldest and the warmest simulation. And then we can evaluate it in the other simulation. Somehow the closest simulation, and especially in present climate, is the RCP45 simulation uh, with CNRM CM5. And uh, I will use it to try to convince you that uh, the downscaling is, uh, is well captured. So just to remember, all the results I will show now are again in the perfect model world. So on this, uh, I want it to be quick here. I just want to, 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 to try to convince you with two figures that it works. And to me, the one who speak, which speaks the most is the, or the time series. So you can see in green the, the emulator and the, in red the, the original RCM series. And we can see that uh, it sticks perfectly. Uh, on the right side, you have the temperature mean over the climate prep, uh, present climate, sorry. So on the left, the, the RCM truth and then the emulator, and we can see that the both map are really similar. And on the right, the bias map shows that there is almost no bias. So just to summarize, we have we show that we have shown in a paper that the um, RCM has a good ability to reproduce the emulator has a good ability to reproduce RCM downscaling, like the spatial structure, the daily variance, but also the response to climate change. There are some little limitations regarding extreme events or or, or more difficult or mountain regions but uh, that are really limited so now we'll go on the key the key message of this presentation so the, the transferability of this function that we learned and to do that i will use this kind of uh, of figure here on the right i know they they might be might be a bit strange but they aim to summarize these three maps here on the left so up on the upper part we have the um, the, the raw maps, so the two first maps, right? And uh, the upper bound of the bar is the, the highest, the warmest point of the, of the, of the map, the lower bound, the, low, the coldest point, and in the middle, is, the point is the mean, okay? We have in red the RCM and in green, the emulator. What we want here is that the green bar looks like the red bar. Then we have two numbers, the the, the the spatial correlation and spatial RMSE between the emulator and the RCM truth. And then finally, we have the same kind of bar, but for the Myers map. And we want that this one is centered on zero and the smallest possible. And then, then we can dive into all uh, simulation we have. So the first one is the CNRM85 simulation. It is the one we used for training. And if we focus only on the CNRM simulation, we can see that in both present climate or future climate, the emulator is doing very good job. Like all the special correlation are equal to one. We have and we have really small biases. If we move now to on the right part of the figure to the GCM transferability, we can see first the first remark is that so the the the, the plane line or present climate and the dotted line of future climate, we can see that all those three simulations are warmer in present and future than the training simulation. And um, which, sorry, uh, and the emulator is well able to reproduce that. Uh, we have, and we have a very good special correlation everywhere, but we can see that we have a slight cold bias on these three simulations. If we look like now and at 99th quantile, we can see that uh, this cold bias in the GCM part uh, is, is even stronger, and especially in the future climate, where you can see that we have really strong bias for the MPI for all simulations. 
So then the question is maybe that the emulator has difficulties to extrapolate too far from, from its training domain. Like we can see that the future simulate the future 99 quantile map from the MPI, for example, is way higher than the than the GCM one, than the uh, CNRM one used for training. So if we add now the MPI simulation in the training, we, we train a new emulator using both CNRM 8.5 plus MPI 8.5, we can see, and these are the, the, the bars in purple, we can see on the lower panel that all biases are well, largely reduced. So I know that these bars are not really talkative or not really, uh, or might be complicated to read. So I just show you the maps for the uh, NORASM and HGM 99 quantile bias for the emulator, the first emulator on the left and the second emulator, in, including the MPI simulation on the right. And we can see, we can clearly see the, the strong cold bias uh, on the first emulator, which is largely corrected on the right. So we have a clear improvement. And actually I didn't, yeah. It was also for the, for the other, for the, all the, the senior MCMs. Simulation. So as we showed here that uh, RCM emulators are able to capture and reproduce the RCM downscaling function, that the perfect model framework is useful to properly evaluate the transferability uh, inside the, the Eurocodex matrix. But the big lesson from this, uh, from this presentation was that it's not designed to extrapolate too far from its training set. So like our conclusion is we think, we believe that RCM emulators are powerful tools to create large ensemble of high resolution simulations. But we have to be careful to the RCM GCM scenario matrix design in order to ex explore the best the, and give the best training set to the emulator. Thanks a lot, um, Antoine. <laughs> yes. Time for one question. Okay, Stefan. No. Okay. Thanks very much, Antoine. Really nice. Uh, really nice talk. So, if if I take the pessimistic view on uh, this transferability issue, then it means that I'm maybe on the hook for training my emulator on many, many, many different GCMs, which then obviates the whole purpose of the exercise, right? Which is to get some transferability. Can you think of um, what are some possibilities to get around that problem? Could it be trained on a present day and future, far future simulation for a single GCM and then explore the transferability so that you give a broader range for the emulator to um, explore? Yeah. The, the, the first point is, for the first point of the question is that still the emulator is doing good job, just as stronger bias. So it's not to swear away because you don't have the right training set. Second, yeah, I think the best way is like to train the emulator on the on the widest uh, on the widest training set possible, like warmest, coldest parts. Like you can you give all different uh, the, the biggest space possible. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, then let's continue with our next speaker. Just switching rows now. Um, Jason will tell us about. Um, or answer the question whether we should buy suggest our boundary conditions. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to explore this idea that we can bias correct boundary conditions. You can see my question there. Um, just quietly, my answer is going to be yes, in case you were wondering. Um, so why might we care about this? So I'm sure many people are familiar with this idea that, you know, this garbage in, garbage out idea, right? So if the GCM we're using to produce boundary conditions is rubbish, then what we're going to get out of our downscaling model is slightly sparkly or rubbish, yeah? So what I'm talking about here 
it is not that we can turn rubbish into something spectacular. If the GCM really is rubbish, then just throw it away and forget about it. But in reality, even for good GCMs, the boundary conditions contain errors. And we're putting those errors into our regional model. And what comes out of our regional model then includes errors that are some kind of nonlinear function of both the errors that came from the GCM and the errors that the regional model itself produces. So if we can minimize those errors coming from the GCM, that's going to help us decrease the errors we're getting out of our regional model. So I'm going to show you some results of a number of experiments that we've done to explore this idea. Um, we're going to downscale a few GCMs to do that. We're going to use WARF as our regional model, and we're using reanalysis as our perfect boundary conditions. And so the downscaled reanalysis is our target truth, if you like. And we're going to test a number of different possible bias corrections from a very simple mean correction to slightly more complicated mean plus standard deviation correction to a then more complicated uh, mean standard deviation and lag one autocorrelation correction. So this is now correcting some persistence characteristics of the distribution. And then finally, we're going to add to that correcting the multivariate um, covariation in the data set as well. Okay. Now, first, when we think about this for these limited area models, we have to keep in mind that around this edge of our domain, we have these relaxation zones. Okay, so what's coming from the GCM is only true on the very outer most row and column in the relaxation zone. And then through that relaxation zone, there's some compromise between what the regional model wants to do and these sort of smooth boundary conditions coming from the low resolution global model. And that balance is a, is a non-physical balance that's happening in that relaxation zone. So the first question really is how much information, if we're gonna do corrections on the boundary, how much of that correction actually is gonna make it through into our domain, because that's where we want the impact to be, right? If it doesn't make it through, then we're not gonna to expect to see any difference. So we explored that in a number of ways. So here we're looking at the correction just for using a mean bias correction at the boundary. and we're comparing what's happening on the outer zone where we've applied our correction to the zone just inside the relaxation zone. So how much made it through, right? And if all of it made it through exactly without change, you'd have exactly a 45 degree line here. And what you see is that actually a lot of it does make it through. It is basically a 45 degree line, but there is a spread. There's a width here. So some of what we're putting in as corrections at the boundary does get changed in that relaxation zone. But most of the signal is making it through. So now we can look at the additional correction for um, the more complicated bias corrections. So you can see here, if we use the um, standard deviation correction again, it's mostly along this line, but you can see there's some cases where the relaxation has really changed the small correction that we put in, the small additional correction, I should say, that we put in for the standard deviation correction. And then if we do the lag one correlation um, as well, again, you can see there's cases where we have quite strong um, deviations away from that. So, and in this case here, you can see that it, a lot of the correction we're adding in really doesn't make it through the relaxation zone. So some of that is because um, we're looking at the small additional correction for these extra complications here. So those, the small corrections find it harder to make it through the boundary zone than a larger correction. But some of it is also the fact that all of those methods are correcting each variable independently of each other. And so you can end up with these non-physical relationships that we're trying to then force into a model that wants them all to be physically consistent. Um, and here's just a quick example of that. So here we're just comparing the covariation of different pairs of variables and doing a statistical test to see how, for instance, the GCM, how many of the boundary grid cells differed significantly in terms of this covariation between these pairs from what we had in our truth downscaling ENC is about 90%. And you can see these corrections, the mean correction, the nested bias correction, which are univariate corrections, they really don't change that. You basically always have 90% of this covariation not looking like it should. And so one of the reasons um, I am going to suggest is that some of that um, corrections aren't making it through the boundary layer is because the regional model has to make changes to it to get it back into a physically consistent state. So if we can make the corrections physically consistent from the beginning, 
more of the correction we put in will make it through the relaxation zone. So now let's have a look at some um, results from inside the domain. When we put in corrections for, um, so just show these figures, this is for different variables inside the domain. And you can see the columns are the GCM, downscaled, the mean bias correction, mean and standard deviation, nested and multivariate. And you can see that basically what we see is we generally see a, a, an improvement in the model. So lower is better. We see an improvement as we're correcting more aspects of the distribution, um, including the multivariate aspects. But interestingly, for some variables, the multivariate is actually slightly worse than the nested, whereas in others, you get a clear benefit from going to multivariate as well. So it's not always 100% that multivariate is just better than nested, but it's pretty clear that the more complicated, the correcting more aspects of the distribution does in fact improve the result we're getting inside the domain. And that was for the mean of those variables. And here we're looking at the 99th percentiles of those variables. And you kind of see a similar conclusion, but you see now that in some cases, we're getting a really big improvement just with the mean bias correction and just small additional improvements by going to these more complicated um, corrections. So, but in the end, the overall story is still pretty similar that you get tend to get better results inside your domain by correcting more of these aspects of the boundary conditions. So we then looked at what, how this impacts other things. So if we're able to correct the relationship between variables, what impact would that have on produce, the way the model produces compound events? So here's just one example where we're looking at high temperature and high precipitation simultaneously in the model. In this case, um, you can see the black line, I hope you can see down here, that's the observations. The blue is what the GCM produces, and you can see it deviates quite a lot across a wide range of return periods um, for this, these compound events. Um, and then we have our orange and our green being the multivariate one. And you can see the green does a really good job following essentially the observations there. We tested this against a number of different types of compound events, and you see quite similar results. That The multivariate does give you an advantage to reproduce compound events. So far, all of those corrections I've been talking about are corrections at the daily scale. Um, and so there's an implicit assumption there that the errors from the GCM are the same at every, any time of day. And um, of course, when you look at it, it turns out that is not the case. It does matter what time of day, the errors are different. Um, and so we went in and said, okay, let's correct the sub daily as well. And in this figure, what we're seeing is the blue includes the sub daily and if you're to the left of the black dotted line, which might be a bit hard to see, it's right on the edge there, then the corrected model is in agreement with our truth. And if you're to the right, it's, in, it's disagreeing. So you can see we start with a GCM, which basically disagrees everywhere at the boundary all the time. And um, we get a bit better with the daily correction, but a lot better when we do a sub explicit sub daily correction. And that translates um, to um, improvements um, in places where the diurnal cycle plays an important role. And Northern Australia is monsoonal um, in the summertime and it has quite a strong diurnal cycle to its rainfall regime there. And so you can see, um, we see um, significant improvements to our rainfall um, magnitude or range of magnitudes there, um, but not so much in terms of the timing of the maximum that we were able to get that already. The model did a pretty good job already. Um, so we, it's not always easy to perform these kind of bias corrections. We've built it, some software that'll do it for you. Um, credit to Young or Kim, who's a PhD student of mine, who did most of that um, work. Um, and so here's my conclusions. And uh, obviously, yes, my answer is, you know, if you want to minimize your RCM errors, then yeah, you, you should really should bias correct your boundary conditions. Um, so if you're interested in trying it out, uh, you could contact me, get hold of the software package and give it a go yourself. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jason. There should be many questions. Um, one is down there. So, so thanks. Uh, so I think that's a really compelling case. Uh, um, 
why we should do it. I, I was just interested in that, about what that means for future projections. Uh, are there assumptions about how invariant biases are in present day? And I, I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, so the, the assumption into the future is that the biases remain similar to what we see in the present day. Um, and that is an untested and unproven assumption. Um, nevertheless, I think there's good reason to believe that even though I wouldn't expect it to be perfect, it would be better than what we would get without any correction. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, we saw that uh, trying to pass a physical inconsistent state to the RCM through the boundary can lead to less information passing through. But the physical consistency or realism of a state is not really absolute, but model dependent, depending on the RCM physics. Does this mean that when you try to pass um, information at the boundaries through, uh, from a GCM, which has a very different atmospheric physics than the RCM, less information will pass through? And if this is true, does it mean that we should try to consider the consistency of the physics between the GCM and the RCM? when making a selection of the GCM-RCM matrix. Thank you. So, sorry, I, I, I don't mean that the physics parameterizations are the same when I say physically consistent. I mean that the state of the atmosphere is in a physically consistent state. So the, the geopotential and the temperature and the moisture and the winds are in a state that is consistent with each other in the, in the, in the atmosphere. So the parameterization that got you to that state isn't really important, but the boundary conditions don't know anything about the parameterization that created the state that the boundary condition is in. Yeah. But if you make a correction that then changes the geopotential in a way that doesn't match the change in the winds, then the regional model will notice that and say, well, no, if my, you know, if my gradient geopotential is this strong, my winds need to be weaker or stronger. Right? And they'll try and make a physically, physical change to that to be physically consistent. Yeah. So, okay. So, Th thanks a lot. Um, I, I'm afraid we have to move on um, to the next talk. Um, so now Jose Gonzalez um, Abad will tell us about using explainable artificial intelligence in statistical downscaling. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jose, and um, today I will introduce explainable artificial intelligence to assess deep learning models for statistical loss scaling. As we are seeing in this session, uh, deep learning models has emerged as a powerful technique for perfect prognosis, statistical loss scaling. Here we can see again um, a typical deep learning model for statistical loss scaling. And as Jorge, Jose Manuel said in his talk, these models are composed of several components. They have non-linearities and they have a huge number of parameters. So they are considered black boxes because given this complexity, we cannot, um, we cannot know what they are doing underneath. We cannot know what relationship they are learning. However, in, in Dow scaling, it is important to, to to unbox this black box model because we are going to extrapolate to different scenarios and different climate models. So we need to, to build trust in these models. So the question is, can we, can we trust these models? Well, a way to, to build trust in these models is by applying interpretability techniques. These techniques emerge in the computer vision field as a way of explaining the functioning of, of deep learning models. These techniques um, compute saliency maps, which um, give us information about the relevance, the relevance of the different predictors in the, in the predictor space. Um, in the case of images, for instance, we, we can, here we can see some saliency maps and they are giving us information of what parts, what pixels are important for the models to compute certain predictions. 
in the case of images, this relevance is computed over pixels, but in the case of DAO scaling, they are computed over grid points and variables in the predictor space. There are uh, a wide spectrum of, of techniques to compute these aliasing maps. The most simple one just involves computing the, the gradient of the prediction uh, of the model with respect to the input, thus giving us a sense of the sensitivity of the model to, to the predictors. So in order to test these interpretability techniques, uh, we are going to develop an experimental use case we are going to downscale temperature over, north, over the continental area of North America using three different deep learning models, the DPSD, PAN, and UNET. The DPSD and PAN are models composed of convolutions and dense or fully connected layers. And the UNET is a fully convolutional model. Actually, this model, this unit, is inspired by the model trained by Antoine in his uh, work on, on emulators. We are going to train these models in, and, and evaluate these models in the observational space. And once we have these models trained and evaluated, we're going to apply them to a GCM as we normally do in a perfect prognosis approach. So here I saw the results of the evaluation process for the three deep learning models in the observational space. I'm not going into the, the details, but the main message is that all three models seem to be performing well they don't show any signal of of that they don't show any signal giving us the, an information that they are not going to be able to extrapolate it seems that they are working well on the observational space so we are going to be able to extrapolate with them so that's what we do we downscale the temperature for a climate model uh, here we can see the the climate change signal for the climate model we downscale and the 3d brownie models we see that the, the climate change signal of the unit model is similar to that of the, of the climate model we are now scaling. However, for the DPSD and PAN, we can see that there are deviations from the climate change signal of the, of, the, of the climate model, especially for these two regions of North America, which are these ones over here. So it seems that the DPSD and PAN models are not able to extrapolate, although we didn't see any signal of this in the in the evaluation metrics over the observational space. So it seems that underneath these models, there are something failing that we are not able to detect with classical standard evaluation metrics. That's why we need to, to, to rely on interpretability techniques to gain information on what is going, going wrong inside these deep learning models. So in order to do that, uh, in our latest work, we have developed two, two new metrics based on interpretability techniques. The accumulated saliency map just give us information of the relevance of the grid points and variables used as predictors in the, in the model. And the saliency dispersion give us information about the degree of locality of the relationship learned by the deep learning models for each grid point in the, in the predictor space. Why locality may be important? Well, uh, it seems that based on previous studies, previous work, that for downscaling temperature in a specific grid point, the most relevant uh, predictors tend to be close to the to the spatial location of that of that grid point. That's why it is worth it to explore the degree of locality of the deep learning model. So here I saw the, the accumulated saliency map, the first metric for the three deep learning models for three variables. And I also saw the sum of this uh, metric for the remaining variables used as predictors in the deep learning models. Uh, high values mean that that specific grid point in the predictor space is relevant for the model. And as we can see, the most relevant variable is air temperature at 1000 hectopascals. And this makes sense as, again, based on previous studies, it seems that overall, the most important variable to downscale surface temperature is the temperature closest to the surface temperature. In this case, the air temperature at 1000 hectopascals. So in terms of feature selection, the three deep learning models seem to be working as expected. Here, I saw the, the saliency dispersion metric. How do we interpret this? Well, for the unit model, for instance, if we get low values, it means that the relationship learned for that specific grid point is local. 
whereas the opposite means that the relationship is not local. In the unit, we can see that overall, the, we, we have low values for this metric. So it's, it, it means that the model is mostly local. Um, for instance, to see this, I plot for this grid point over here, one of the saliency maps used to compute the, the metric. And we can see that the relevance is concentrated on a local area um, over this, over the, the evaluated grid point. And the same occurs for the south. The relevance is located over um, a local area. However, of course, in the south, we can see some higher values, but this makes sense because we can also see here some relevant grid points outside the local area of influence, but still we, we can tell that, that this is a local pattern. In the DPSD and PAN models for the northern and mid regions, we could see that we have relatively low values, although we can find some high values, but this is because Although the pattern is still local, the relationship learned by the model is still local for the points around these areas, the pattern is wider. So it has a, a wider local area of influence, but still we can say that the pattern is local. However, in the south, especially for the southern region over here, we can see that we have high values of this metric and the relevant maps uh, are a bit weird because in the DPSD, for instance, we have um, a high relevance in a local area to this specific point, uh, so as an example, but we also saw relevance in points far away from the predicted grid point. The same occurred for, for the PAM model. So it seems that uh, for these southern regions, the model are not learning a local pattern. And it is curious because for this region, we had the highest deviation for from the climate change signal of the climate model. So it seems that something is happening here for these two models that is not going, it's not happening for the unit. And why is that? Well, um, if we recall, the unit is a fully convolutional model. So it's exclusively composed of convolutional layers. And by definition, convolutional layers have the inductive bias of locality. So they are going to learn local patterns. That makes the unit model local uh, by definition. That's why we are always learning local patterns because the model is local. However, in the DPSD and PAN models, we have convolutions, but we also have dense layers. So they can learn non-local patterns. And the reason they are learning non-local patterns in the South is because the variability in the South is pretty low. So the model is overfitting and they can overfit because they have dense layers. So here we, can, we are seeing that these techniques, these interpretability-based techniques are important to, to disentangle the internal structure of deep learning models. So we encourage uh, researchers in DAO scaling to, to incorporate these interpretability techniques into their workflows because they can, we see that especially for, for, for extrapolating into the future, they can be pretty relevant. Uh, so answering the, my question on the first slide, can we trust these models well? Yes, but we need to, 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 to add these interpret interpretability techniques into, into our workflow. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Jose. <clears throat> we have time for, I don't know, two questions maybe? Oh, <laughs> your job. Maybe first a question closer here. Yes, okay. Hi, Jose. Nice talk. Um, I really agree that machine learning interpretability can really help. Um, one question about you talked about overfitting in your um, your dense layers. Have you looked at controlling that overfitting? So I, I agree that um, convolutional layers are less prone to overf overfitting. Sorry. And but could you use something like dropout regularization or learning rate? Uh, controlling your learning rate would that maybe help that spurious aspect that you're seeing, or have you looked into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we are we are researching that. We are trying to incorporate uh, L1 regularization and dropout and see what what these metric tell us. And it seems that the models are still overfitting, are still overfitting. And I think that the main issue with with these models is that when you are working on a region with a lot of grid points in the predicted space, there are a lot of parameters. There are millions of parameters, so it's easy for the models to 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 overfit. Um, um okay thank you you said um temperature at um, 1000 
ectopascal is the is one of the most important variable, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how do you incorporate elevations that are not at 1,000 ectopascal? Uh, so you are asking if we are also working with uh, more height levels as predictors, right? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's it, actually the 1,000 hectopascal height is the lowest one. So for the Lauskalian of temperature, is the most important one, uh, at least in based of our results. So yeah, we're incorporating more heights, but the most important relevance are the the 1,000 hectopascal heights. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have to proceed with um, Nilesh Rampal. He will, or he, yes, will talk about um, how deep learning models can be used to extrapolate um, rainfall in future climates and whether that works. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's been really hot in here, so thank you for opening the windows. Um, so the first thing I wanna say is I've just, I found, I, it was really hard to find a map with New Zealand, which is where I'm from, centered on it. So I thought that was an achievement itself. Um, but yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge my um, people who've supervised me on this project, but the talk is about extrapolation. We've heard a lot today about some, you know, RCM emulators, and um, today I want to talk a bit about more about that tr transferability aspect um, for emulators. So now we've heard why, why emulators are useful, right? We know dynamical models are really expensive and that limits our abil ability to downscale lots of GCMs or a large ensemble, right? So the, the point being is we risk undersampling the, the distribution of possible outcomes. So, my talk is about developing a surrogate model that speeds that process up. So hopefully I'll convince you that we've made progress on an emulator that is of the order of about 10,000 times faster than an RCM. But what, what I wanna draw your attention to is that basically we need to comprehensively evaluate um, our RCM emulator. We can't just trust it alone. Um, so the first thing is, how do you, what is an art emulator? So basically what you do is you feed in, oh, there's a laser pointer. Um, you feed in sort of the boundary conditions to the GCM. Um, so think, I'm not sure if I'm nailing that laser pointer, but anyway, so you feed an X, which you can be boundary conditions to your GCM. That's then fed into a deep learning model um, and that predicts why. And so the deep learning model will extrapolate, sorry, ex extract information like pressure gradients and it will link them to precipitation. In this case, we're looking at precipitation from a dynamical model, CCAM. We've heard about that today. That's then compared with the ground truth, right? And we effectively compute a loss, right? An objective, fun objective function. And that loss goes back into the model, which makes it better and better and better. So that's like a traditional kind of deep learning model. It's like a regression model on steroids. So, um, now, one challenge with these regression models, right? So let's take in a low resolution input. These are some cyclone composites. What we do is we feed that into a regression model. Um, so it's a mapping from X to Y. And the regression model is trying to predict high resolution composites, the technique that uh, Jose introduced as image super resolution. But one challenge with this is that even the state of the art models, deep learning models, will smear out the prediction. So what you can see on the screen is that high frequency variability is not captured even by state-of-the-art deep learning models. So long story short is they underestimate these extreme events, um, even the state-of-the-art models. So the paper that uh, Bosfer et al, uh, they weren't the first, but they introduced a technique called generative models. So basically they generate um, precipitation. They effectively overcome this underestimation of extremes. And as Jose said, that this is not the right approach. It's image super resolution. It's not necessarily well suited for climate. So what we do is we adapt that approach. 
We feed in X, which again is the CMIP6 GCM field. So we feed in uh, two, four variables, two pressure levels. We feed in some noise and noise is the key element of this generative ability of the model. So they think of these as perturbations, random perturbations as of the boundary conditions. We feed that into a deep learning model. We call it the generator and that generates some synthetic precipitation, right? Now here's the part where it gets complicated, right? This is called a GAN, the generative adversarial network. We have a discriminator, a separate model, right? And if, if this is all confusing to you, it is. Um, basically the long story short is here, we're adding a constraint to our model that penalizes its ability to generate realistic looking projections. So, these, so this data, so both the synthetic precipitation, my prediction, and the true precipitation are fed into this discriminator. And the goal of the generator is to fool the discriminator so that my downscaling model is able to, or my emulator is able to generate such realistic data that it fools the discriminator. So it's training two models that are competing against each other. Um, and so, um, so again, it's a realism constraint. The point being is that lambda equals to zero when those, those the, the penalization of the realism is zero, we get a regression model. Now you can sort of view this as if you take an X, uh, the simple linear model would, would predict Y. And as you can see on the bottom, it really smears out the precipitation. Whereas a generative approach, Think of it as like a weather generator where you're sampling from a conditional distribution of outcomes and you generate realizations, right? And each realization is slightly different and might position precipitation in a slightly different location. Now, we've heard a bit about the perfect and imperfect model framework, right? Long story short is the perfect model framework, it's slightly easier to train, right? We coarsen the RCM to the GCM resolution, right? The, but that means that the RCM and GCM fields are sort of well aligned temporarily and spatially, right? But that's not how an emulator works in practice, right? We feed in the GCM and then responds to those boundary conditions. So long story short is the perfect model framework, it's easier to train, but the imperfect framework where we go directly from the GCM to the RCM is more how a regional client model actually works. So just to clarify, I use 85 years of training data from XSCM2, it's a warm um, GCM, but I won't talk into too much of the detail, but just keep in mind there's two training frameworks. Now, think of the imperfect framework as a really challenging problem. You might think that machine learning is so good that it can learn everything, but it can't. It really struggles with challenging problems. So it's a big hurdle to, to cross, right? And basically what we do in our, in, in our research is think of that, that person trying to climb over that step as the imperfect framework. And it's a real hard problem to scale. What we do is we divide that into smaller steps. So what we do is we pre-train in the perfect framework, which is what Antoine introduced. And then we introduce a fine tuning step in the imperfect framework. The idea is you're breaking a challenging problem down into two smaller steps, right? We do this all the time in our everyday life. Um, you know, you want to tackle a hard problem, divide it up into smaller problems. And that's exactly what you need to do. Um, long story short, and I don't have too much time. Um, GANs, so the, the top, top left is my, my model. The unit, which um, is on the right, it smears out precipitation. It really underestimates those extremes. My approach really resolves that high frequency extreme events that occur um, in, in CCAM. So we, we, um, we, uh, when you apply this model to one, um, to one GCM, it takes about five minutes on an A100. It does take about five days to train, so quite long. Um, but we can also capture the sub daily variation. So I've trained my model in a slightly larger domain. I feed in daily averages of, of my boundary conditions. And from that daily averages, I can reconstruct hour by hour or six hourly time steps of precipitation. So machine learning or GANs have the potential to tackle really challenging problems. Now, with the, with the constraint of time, basically long story short is that I plotted the power spectral density as a function of wavelength. What this means is that, so the black curve is, which you can't see, is the CCAM. 
the reed curve is my GAN. The long story short is it perfectly captures the spatial you know, frequencies of rainfall all the way down to the Nyquist frequency. So whereas the UNET tends to underestimate that high frequency extreme events. And if you look at the frequency precipitation plot on the right, you'll see that the black and red curves really align all the way out to the extremes, including the most extreme event. Um, the last part is what about out of sample, right? And this is the probably the key message here. The, so this is RX1 day uh, relative to 1986 to 25 climatology. Long story short is that the black curve is CCAM. The blue curve, which is the is the unit and the like the light red dash curve is the perfect framework. If we do not train our models in two stages, we actually don't get good extrapolated performance. So if there's one take back message here, and I know I've really briefly talked about it, is that our method is able to basically account for extrapolation issues because it's able to better learn a more challenging problem. So that's the summary here. Again, I, long story short is GANs are able to better capture that spatio-temporal variability that other machine learning models are, are not able to, and they extrapolate better for future climates. So, uh, but anyway, we're really excited about looking at other domains to apply our approach to. New Zealand's a small region, but let's go global. Thank you. Thank you, Nilesh. We're gonna have time. All speakers have been on time, actually. Um, time for two questions. There. Another one. Thank you, Jason. In the back. Thank you, um, Douglas. Um, I have a question maybe just for you or for other speakers as well. Um, based on the emulators, which is a fantastic idea uh, because of all the, the limitations, you know, there are in many parts of the world, mainly for producing um, many simulations. But the, the issue is uh, when you when you make this relationship be between the global and the regional climate model, you assume that the regional climate model is properly working. And that is not the case always. There is no single regional climate model that fits well to observe the climate. So how do you deal with the uh, model bias? Basically, that's not, we're trying to perfectly mimic an RCM. So whatever issues the RCM has, hope for, it's actually a good sign if our emulator has those same issues because it's learned from that same data. So the goal is not, not necessarily to mitigate those biases at all, right? It's just to train an emulator to be consistent with the RCM, right? And it has the advantage of being complementary to the RCM because you're, many institutes do dynamical downscaling, right? And statistical downscaling is often inconsistent with that, right? But with emulation, we could potentially combine the two streams together. You could then supplement that with bias correction after. So there are some benefits to that. But yeah, we do not. That's not yeah, what we consider. Thank you. It's a nice approach. Um, do you need to fine tune your model for each new GCM? Or do you think there could be a way to tackle this issue? It's a really good question. Um, Basically, we found, I mean, I haven't showed this today, but basically we found that training on GCMs in a lot warmer climates is actually a necessary, that actually means you can extrapolate well to many GCMs. If you train on a GCM in a colder climate, it doesn't seem to do well at all. So we found relatively good agreement across other GCMs. I've showed RX one day, you look at climate change signal, it does seem to do well, but there could be an argument that fine tuning improves that agreement more but it's not perfect agreement. As you can see, if I go back one slide, towards the end of the century, there's a slight disagreement. So we're not gonna ever get perfect agreement, um, but that's a good question. I think fine tuning could help, but I don't know how much, bye. Okay, thank you. So let's go for our final talk today um, by Kala Vivakwa. She will talk about um, um, the design of experiments um, for better exploring uncertainties in future projections.
So good afternoon. So I'm going to present some ongoing projects. So I'm present some of the current results that you have so far. So we are in an era of big data. So we're all always talking about all the information that you have, and you are. I have been heard that there are some efforts to expand the computational efforts capacity so we can be able to generate even more data. But the idea of this project that we are working on is to stop. And before generating more data, to think, do you already have all the information that you can get from the data that we currently have? Do you have the right data? If you are generating new data, what data should we generate? So those are the type of questions that we are working on on this project. And a little about my background. I'm a statistician with also a background in engineering. So the approach that I'm going to present, it, this approach involves both of those concepts of the engineering and the, the statistics. I work with applied statistics and with this idea of cost reduction, how can we generate less data and get more information? And I got involved in the applications in weather and climate through a Fulbright scholarship. And since then, I'm trying to understand the language of the climate researchers and try to collaborate statisticians and weather and climate researchers. So I'm talking about briefly one part of our project that's called the Frontier Project. And the main talk that I'm going to talk is a framework that involves experimental design and machine learning. So my passion in statistics, although I work in different uh, applied methods, my passion in experimental design. So that's why I'm talking about experimental design and try to apply statistical experimental designs in weather and climate models. So the, the project is led by Priscilla Mooning. I'm from Brazil, but I'm currently working this project in Norway. So Priscilla is for the Norwegian Research Council. So I'm working there. Our patterns are the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Bjerknes Center and my university, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in the Northeast part of Brazil. So the objective of the project, the general objective is to mitigate future challenges associated with the exponential increase in climate data. And we want to focus on using efficient design process and big data methods to ensure effectiveness in data production and data analysis. So there are three main parts of this project. I will concentrate in the third part that's concerned about the example of opportunity. Are we doing a good job in, in that approach? Can we do better? So that's trying to evaluate this approach. But for the other parts of the project, there is a, on Thursday afternoon, Priscilla has a poster session and she will explain the other parts of our project. So what's the difference of the framework that I'm going to present? I want to explore the statistical design of experiment and the analysis. I've seen some use of statistical design of experiments, but I think you can explore more of the type of analysis that the statistician do. The main benefits that I can see is not only we can identify which characteristics that are important for model performance, for understanding uncertainty, but the main point is you can identify why. That's the big question. You can understand why those 
sources of uncertainty are important. So I will use here an example. So what we have done so far is to try to get a, a proof of concept. We have been in previous presentations talking about trust. So the first step of our approach is to try to build this trust in design of experiment. So the usual approach, for example, here we have like 24 possible combinations. And the focus is to understand different physical parameter parameterizations. These are inputs of outputs for temperature, maximum temperature in, in June, July, and August in this part of the Americas. And here we have 24 possible combinations that are changing some physical parameterization like radiation, cumulus, microphysics, and planetary boundary layer. So from those sources of uncertainty, we have like 24 combinations. So one approach that can be used to identify which combination would perform best is like here showing the plots, or also we can compute some metric and rank the models according to those metrics. So what I'm going to, our proof of concept is using DOE, can we reach that same conclusion? And how is this approach? And what you can gain in using the design of experiments approach. So we developed this framework to summarize our proposal. We have these eight steps that's important to have a, a, an overall concept. Okay. So we, this, can, this approach can be applied for different types of applications. We can use for, as the example that I'm going to talk about, physical parameterization can be used for model tuning. And in the Eurocordex context, we are trying to use this to understand different combinations of GSG, global climate models and regional climate models when you don't have the completed matrix. How can we benefit from this approach? So we have called this CSI idea and have like four steps, eight steps. The first five steps is like the planning, the framework. The sixth step is the design. And the eight is the analysis where we can get the statistical approach more explicit. So what's the idea? Instead of looking at the plots, instead of looking at or ranking some metric, we compute a statistic that you can reflect the contribution of each source of variation and also the interaction. We not only see what's the impact, for example, here have like, okay, I have to learn how to handle this. So instead of radiation, cumulus, microphysics, PBL, we can see the impact of them independently and also the interaction among all of them. So we can calculate this statistic and we can calculate in a way that they are all comparable. So instead of comparing maps, we use this statistic and we compare through this plot, what is the contribution? So we can understand here that the radiation is the contribution. And with some box plots, we can identify which is the best Option. So we can reach the same conclusion that you use in the maps and rank, ranking, but you can understand why. So don't, if you have a lot, a huge number of plots, 
we can do with one plot, we can identify those impacts. And we have tried this approach in different examples. So we're trying to reduce the main gain is instead of using all combinations, we can use just parts. We have been decreasing this approach. So we had from 50 until 98% of reduction in the combination, for example, instead of having 2,000, can just 32 and get the conclusions. And the idea now that we are working now is to combine this with machine learning. I've just shown like the peer DOE approach, but we are trying to combine this with machine learning to try since the focus on DOE is to explain the why, is try to give some light on the black, black box that is talked about in the machine learning approach. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We've got time for a quick question. Okay, so we And then is it, you want to do some announcements or? Yeah. So I, I hope I understood everything, but um, for the design of experiments, if I understood well, it's mostly, I mean, up to now at least, it's mostly related to the what we call the tuning of the model. So the choice of the real, of the right parametrization with respect to scores. But could you also extend your design of experiments to reduce the number of scenario simulation we have to perform? Yes, yes, that's the idea too can reduce the number of scenarios and get a better understanding of a, a huge number of scenarios. That's the idea. And the, the main point is that this design needs to be done up front, not after we start getting the results, because it's not like a random choice. You have a specific choice to see which points are critical so that you can reduce as a large percentage, the number of simulation that you need to get to have a, a broader understanding of a, a much higher possible number possible of combinations. Okay, thank you. And let's thank all the speakers of the session again. And I will hand over to Silvina. <laughs> thank you, Douglas. Uh, we are running late, as you know, so we are right now going to the poster session and the icebreaker is going to start at 6.30 instead of 6. So that is the announcement. And the SAT members, please, we are going to meet at 6 at the Leonardo building. 6. Thank you.